Chapter 34. Some of the Evil Effects of Flogging There are incidental considerations touching this matter of flogging, which exaggerate the evil into a great enormity. Many illustrations might be given, but let us be content with a few. One of the arguments advanced by officers of the Navy in favor of corporal punishment is this. It can be inflicted in a moment, it consumes no valuable time, and when the prisoner's shirt is put on, that is the last of it. Whereas, if another punishment were substituted, it would probably occasion a great waste of time and trouble, besides, thereby begetting in the sailor an undue idea of his importance. Absurd, or worse than absurd as it may appear, all this is true, and if you start from the same premises with these officers, you must admit that they advance an irresistible argument. But in accordance with this principle, captains in the navy, to a certain extent, inflict the scourge which is ever at hand for nearly all degrees of transgression. In offenses not cognizable by a court-martial, little, if any, discrimination is shown. It is of a piece with the penal laws that prevailed in England some sixty years ago, when one hundred and sixty different offenses were declared by the statute book to be capital, and the servant maid who but pilfered a watch was hung beside the murderer of a family. It is one of the most common punishments for very trivial offenses in the Navy to stop a seaman's grog for a day or a week, and as most seamen so cling to their grog, the loss of it is generally deemed by them a very serious penalty. You will sometimes hear them say, I would rather have my wind stopped than my grog. But there are some sober seamen that would much rather draw the money for it instead of the grog itself, as provided by law. But they are too often deterred from this by the thought of receiving a scourging for some inconsiderable offense, as a substitute for the stopping of their spirits. This is a most serious obstacle to the cause of temperance in the navy, but in many cases even the reluctant drawing of his grog cannot exempt a prudent seaman from ignominy. For besides the formal administering of the cat at the gangway for petty offenses, he is liable to the colt or rope's end, a bit of rattling stuff, indiscriminately applied, without stripping the victim, at any time, and in any part of the ship at the merest wink from the captain. By an express order of that officer, most boatswain mates carry the colt coiled in their hats, in readiness to be administered at a minute's warning upon any offender. This was the custom in the Neversink, and until so recent a period as the administration of the President Polk when the historian Bancroft, Secretary of the Navy, officially interposed, it was an almost universal thing for the officers of the watch at their own discretion to inflict chastisement upon a sailor, and this too in the face of the ordinance restricting the power of flogging solely to the captains and court-martial. Nor was it a thing unknown for a lieutenant in a sudden outburst of passion, perhaps inflamed by brandy or smarting under the sense of being disliked or hated by the seamen, to order a whole watch of 250 men at dead of night to undergo the indignity of the cult. It is believed that even at the present day there are instances of commanders still violating the law by delegating the power of the cult to subordinates. At all events, it is certain that almost to a man the lieutenants in the navy bitterly rail against the officiousness of the Bancroft, and so materially abridging their usurped functions by snatching the colt from their hands. At the time, they predicted that this rash and most ill-judged interference of the secretary would end in the breaking up of all discipline in the navy. But it has not so proved. These officers now predict that if the cat be abolished, the same unfulfilled prediction would be verified. Concerning the license with which many captains violate the express laws laid down by Congress for the government of the navy, a glaring instance may be quoted. For upward of 40 years, there has been on the American statute book a law prohibiting a captain from inflicting, on his own authority, more than 12 lashes at one time. If more are to be given, the sentence must be passed by a court-martial. Yet, for nearly half a century, this law has been frequently, and with almost perfect impunity, set at naught, though of late, through the exertions of Bancroft and others, it has been much better observed than formerly. Indeed, at the present day, it is generally respected. Still, while the Neversink was lying in a South American port, on the cruise now written of, the seamen belonging to another American frigate informed us that their captains sometimes inflicted, upon his own authority, eighteen and twenty lashes. It is worthwhile to state that this frigate was vastly admired by the shore ladies for her wonderfully neat appearance. 
one of her forecastle men told me that he used up to three jack knives, charged to him on the books of the purser, and scraping the blind pins and the combings of the hatchways. It is singular that while the lieutenants of the watch and American men of war so long usurped the power of inflicting corporal punishment with the cult, few or no similar abuses were known in the English navy. And though the captain of an English armed ship is authorized to inflict, at his own discretion, more than a dozen lashes, I think three dozen, yet it is to be doubted whether upon the whole there is as much flogging at present in the English navy as in the American. The chivalric Virginian, John Randolph of Roanoke, declared in his place in Congress that on board of the American man of war that carried him out ambassador to Russia, he had witnessed more flogging than had taken place on his own plantation of 500 African slaves in 10 years. Certain it is, from what I have personally seen, that the English officers, as a general thing, seem to be less disliked by their crews than the American officers by theirs. The reason probably is that many of them, from their station in life, have been more accustomed to social command, hence quarter-deck authority sits more naturally on them. A coarse, vulgar man who happens to rise to high naval rank by the exhibition of talents not incompatible with vulgarity invariably proves a tyrant to his crew. It is a thing that American men-of-war's men have often observed, that the lieutenants from the southern states, the descendants of the old Virginians, are much less severe and much more gentle and gentlemanly in command than that of the northern officers as a class. According to the present laws and usages of the Navy, a seaman, for the most trivial alleged offenses of which he may be entirely innocent, must without a trial undergo a penalty the traces whereof he carries to the grave. For to a man of war's man, experienced eye, the marks of the naval scourging with the cat are through life discernible. And with these marks on his back, the image of his creator must rise at the last day. Yet so untouchable is true dignity that there are cases wherein to be flogged at the gangway in no dishonor. Though to abase and hurl down the last pride of some sailor who has piqued him be sometimes the secret motive, with some malicious officer, in procuring him to be condemned to the lash. But this feeling of the innate dignity remaining untouched, though outwardly the body may be scarred for the whole term of the natural life, is one of the hushed things buried among the holiest privacies of the soul, a thing between a man's God and himself, and forever undiscernible by our fellow men, who account that a degradation which seems so to the corporal eye. But what torments must that seaman undergo, who, while his back bleeds at the gangway, bleeds agonized drops of shame from his soul? Are we not justified in immeasurably denouncing this thing? Join hands with me, then, and, in the name of that being in whose image the flogged sailor is made, let us demand of legislators, by what right they dare profane what God himself accounts sacred? Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman? Asked the intrepid apostle, well knowing as a Roman citizen that it was not. And now, eighteen hundred years after, is it lawful for you, my countrymen, to scourge a man that is an American, to scourge him round the world in your frigates? It is to no purpose that you apologetically appeal to the general depravity of a man of war's man, Depravity in the oppressed is no apology for the oppressor, but rather an additional stigma to him, as being in a large degree the effect and not the cause and justification of oppression. Chapter 35. Flogging Not Lawful It is next to idle at the present day merely to denounce an iniquity. Be ours, then a different task? If there are any three things opposed to the genius of the American Constitution, they are these. Irresponsibility in a judge, unlimited discretionary authority in an executive, and the union of an irresponsible judge and an unlimited executive in one person. Yet by virtue of an enactment of Congress, all the Commodores in the American Navy are obnoxious to these three charges. So far as concerns the punishment of the sailor for alleged misdemeanors not particularly set forth in the Articles of War, here is the enactment in question. 32 of the Articles of War, all crimes committed by persons belonging to the Navy, which are not specified in the foregoing Articles, shall be punished according to the laws and customs in such cases at sea. 
This is the article that, above all others, puts the scourge into the hands of the captain, calls him to no account for its exercise, and furnishes him with an ample warrant for inflictions of cruelty upon the common sailor, hardly credible to landsmen. By this article, the captain is made a legislator, as well as a judge and an executive. So far as it goes, it absolutely leaves to his discretion to decide what things shall be considered crimes and what shall be the penalty. Whether an accused person has been guilty of actions by him declared to be crimes, and how, when, and where the penalty shall be inflicted. In the American Navy, there is an everlasting suspension in the habeas corpus. Upon the bare allegation of misconduct, there is no law to restrain the captain from imprisoning a seaman, and keeping him confined at his pleasure. While I was in the Neversink, the captain of an American sloop of war, from undoubted motives of personal pique, kept a seaman confined in the brig for upward of a month. Certainly the necessities of navies warrant a code for their government more stringent than the law that governs the land. But that code should conform to the spirit of the political institutions of the country that ordains it. It should not convert into slaves some of the citizens of a nation of free men. Such objections cannot be urged against the laws of the Russian navy not essentially different from our own, because the laws of that navy, creating the absolute one-man power in the captain, investing in him the authority to scourge, conform in spirit to the territorial laws of Russia, which is ruled by an autocrat, and whose courts inflict the knout upon the subjects of the land. But with us it is different. Our institutions claim to be based upon broad principles of political liberty and equality whereas it would hardly affect one iota the condition of shipboard of American man-of-war's man, where he transferred to the Russian navy and made a subject of the Tsar. As a sailor, he shares none of our civil immunities. The law of our soil in no respect accompanies the national floating timbers grown thereon, and to which he clings as his home. For him our revolution was in vain. To him our declaration of independence is a lie. It is not sufficiently borne in mind, perhaps, that though the naval code comes under the head of the martial law, yet in time of peace and in the thousand questions arising between man and man on board ship, this code, to a certain extent, may not improperly be deemed municipal. With its crew of eight hundred or a thousand men, a three-decker is a city on the sea. But in most of these matters, between man and man, the captain, instead of being a magistrate, dispensing what the law promulgates, is an absolute ruler making and unmaking law as he pleases. It will be seen that the twentieth of the Articles of War provides that if any person in the Navy negligently performs the duties assigned him, he shall suffer such punishment as a court-martial shall adjudge. But if the offender be a private, common sailor, he may, at the discretion of the captain, be put in irons or flogged. It is needless to say that in cases where an officer commits a trivial violation of this law, a court-martial is seldom or never called to sit upon his trial, but in the sailor's case he is at once condemned to the lash. Thus one set of sea citizens is exempted from a law that is hung in terror over others. What would landsmen think, were the state of New York to pass a law against some offense of fixing a fine as a penalty, and then add to that law a section restricting its penal operation to mechanics and day laborers, exempting all gentlemen with an income of $1,000? Yet thus, in the spirit of its practical operation, even thus, stands a good part of the naval laws wherein naval flogging is involved. But a law should be universal, and include in its possible penal operations the very judge himself who gives decisions upon it, nay, the very judge who expounds it. Had Sir William Blackstone violated the laws of England, he would have been brought before the bar over which he had presided and would have there been tried with the counsel for the crown reading to him, perhaps from a copy of his own commentaries. And should he have been found guilty, he would have suffered like the meanest subject according to law. How is it in an American frigate? Let one example suffice. By the Articles of War, and especially by Article 1, an American captain may, and frequently does, inflict a severe and degrading punishment upon a sailor while he himself is forever removed from the possibility of undergoing the like disgrace, and in all probability from undergoing any punishment whatever, even if guilty of the same thing, contention with his equals, for instance, for which he punishes another. Yet both sailor and captain are American citizens. Now, in the language of Blackstone, again, there is a law, coval with mankind. 
dictated by God himself, superior in obligation to any other, and no human laws are of any validity in contrary to this. That law is the law of nature. Among the three great principles of which Justinian includes that to every man should be rendered his due. But we have seen that the laws involving flogging in the navy do not render to every man his due, since in some cases they indirectly exclude the officers from any punishment whatever, and in all cases protect them from the scourge, which is inflicted upon the sailor. Therefore, according to Blackstone and Justinian, those laws have no binding force, and every American man of war's man would be morally justified in resisting the scourge to the other most and in so resisting would be religiously justified in what would be judiciously styled the act of mutiny itself. If, then, these scourging laws be for any reason necessary, make them binding upon all who of right come under their sway, and let us see an honest commodore, duly authorized by Congress, condemning to the lash a transgressing captain by the side of a transgressing sailor, And if the Commodore himself prove a transgressor, let us see one of his brother Commodores take up the lash against him, even as the boatswain's mates, the Navy executioners, are often called upon to scourge each other. Or will you say that a Navy officer is a man, but that an American-born citizen, whose grandsire may have ennobled him by pouring out his blood at Bunker Hill, will you say that by entering the service of his country as a common seaman and standing ready to fight her foes, he thereby loses his manhood at the very time he most asserts it? Will you say that by doing so he degrades himself to the liability of the scourge, but if he tarries ashore in time of danger he is safe from that indignity? All our linked states, all four continents of mankind, unite in denouncing such a thought. We plant the question then, on the topmost argument of all, irrespective of incidental considerations, we assert that flogging in the navy is opposed to the essential dignity of man, which no legislator has a right to violate. That it is oppressive and glaringly unequal in its operations, that it is utterly repugnant to the spirit of our democratic institutions. Indeed, that it involves a lingering trait of the worst times of a barbarous feudal aristocracy. In a word, we denounce it as religiously, morally, and immutably wrong. No matter, then, what may be the consequences of its abolition, no matter if we have to dismantle our fleets and our unprotected commerce should fall prey to the spoiler, the awful admonitions of justice and humanity demand that abolition without procrastination. In a voice that is not to be mistaken, demand that abolition today. It is not a dollar and cent question of expediency. It is a matter of right and wrong. And if any man can lay his hand on his heart and solemnly say that this scourging is right, let that man but once feel the lash on his own back, and in his agony you will hear the apostate call the seventh heavens to witness that it is wrong. And in the name of immortal manhood, would to God that every man who upholds this thing were scourged at the gangway till he recanted. Chapter 36 Flogging Not Necessary But White Jacket is ready to come down from the lofty masthead of an eternal principle and fight you, commodores and captains of the navy, on your own quarterdeck, with your own weapons at your own paces. Exempt yourselves from the lash. You take Bible oaths to it that it is indispensable for others. You swear that without the lash no armed ship can be kept in suitable discipline. Be it proved to you officers and stamped upon your foreheads that herein you are utterly wrong. Send them to Collingwood, said Lord Nelson and he will bring them to order. This was the language of that renowned admiral when his officers reported to him certain seamen of the fleet as wholly ungovernable. Send them to Collingwood. And who was Collingwood that, after these navy rebels had been imprisoned and scourged without being brought to order, Collingwood would convert them to docility? Who Admiral Collingwood was, as a historical hero, history herself will tell you nor in whatever triumphal hall they may be hanging will the captured flags of Trafalgar fail to rustle at the mention of that name. But what Collingwood was as a disciplinarian on board the ships he commanded perhaps needs to be said. He was an officer, then, who held in abhorrence all corporal punishment, who, though seeing more active service than any sea officer of his time, yet for years together governed his men without inflicting the lash. But these seamen of his must have been most exemplary saints to have proved docile under so lenient a sway. Were they saints? 
and see ye jails and almshouses throughout the length and breadth of Great Britain, which, in Collingwood's time, were swept clean of the last lingering villain and pauper to man his majesty's fleets. Still more, that was a period when the uttermost resources of England were taxed to the quick, when the masts of her multiplied fleets almost transplanted her forests, all standing to the sea. When British press gangs not only boarded foreign ships on the high seas and boarded foreign pierheads, but boarded their own merchantmen at the mouth of the Thames, and boarded the very fireside along its banks. When Englishmen were knocked down and dragged into the navy, like cattle into the slaughterhouse, with every mortal provocation to a mad desperation against the service that thus ran their unwilling heads into the muzzles of the enemy's cannon. This was the time, and these the men that Collingwood governed without the lash. I know it has been said that Lord Collingwood began by inflicting severe punishments, and afterward ruling his sailors by the mere memory of a bygone terror which he could at pleasure revive, and that his sailors knew this, and hence their good behavior under a lenient sway, but granting the quoted assertion to be true, how comes it that many American captains, who after inflicting as severe punishment as ever Collingwood could have authorized, how comes it that they also have not been able to maintain good order with subsequent floggings, after once showing to the crew with what terrible attributes they were invested. But it is notorious, and a thing that I myself in several instances know to have been the case, that in the American Navy, where corporal punishment has been most severe, it has also been most frequent. But it is incredible that with such crews as Lord Collingwood's, composed in part of the most desperate characters, the rakings of the jails, it is incredible that such a set of men could be governed by the mere memory of the lash, some other influence must have been brought to bear, mainly, no doubt, the influence wrought by a powerful brain and a determined, intrepid spirit over a miscellaneous rabble. It is well known that Lord Nelson himself in points of policy was averse to flogging, and that too, when he had witnessed the mutinous effects of government abuses in the Navy, unknown in our times, and which, to the terror of all England, developed themselves at the great mutiny of the Nore an outbreak that for several weeks jeopardized the very existence of the British Navy. But we may press this thing nearly two centuries further back, for it is a matter of historical doubt whether in Robert Blake's time, Cromwell's great admiral, such a thing as flogging was known at the gangways of his victorious fleets. And as in this matter, we cannot go further back than to Blake, so we cannot advance further than to our own time, which shows Commodore Stockton during the recent war with Mexico governing the American squadron in the Pacific without employing the scourge. But if of three famous English admirals, one has abhorred flogging, another almost governed his ships without it, and to the third it may be supposed to have been unknown, while an American commander has within the present year almost been enabled to sustain that good discipline of an entire squadron in time of war without having an instrument of scourging on board. What inevitable inferences must be drawn and how disastrous to the mental character of all advocates of Navy flogging who may happen to be Navy officers themselves. It cannot have escaped the discernment of any observer of mankind that, in the presence of its conventional inferiors, conscience imbecility in power often seeks to carry off that imbecility by assumptions of lordly severity. The amount of flogging on board an American man of war is, in many cases, in exact proportion to the professional and intellectual incapacity of her officers to command. Thus, in these cases, the law that authorizes flogging does put a scourge into the hand of a fool. In most calamitous instances, this has been shown. It is a matter of record that some English ships of war have fallen a prey to the enemy through the insubordination of the crew induced by the witless cruelty of their officers, officers so armed by the law that they could inflict that cruelty without restraint. Nor have there been wanting instances where the seamen have ran away with their ships, as in the case of the Hermione and the Danae, and forever rid themselves of the outrageous inflictions of their officers by sacrificing their lives to their fury. Events like these aroused the attention of the British public at the time, but it was a tender theme, the public agitation of which the government was anxious to suppress. Nevertheless, whenever the thing was privately discussed, these terrific mutinies, together with the then prevailing insubordination of the men in the navy, were almost universally attributed to the exasperating system of flogging, and the necessity for flogging was generally believed to be directly referable to the impressment of such crowds of dissatisfied men, 
and in high quarters it was held that if by any mode the English fleet could be manned without resource to coercive measures, then the necessity of flogging would cease. If we abolish either impressment or flogging, the abolition of the other will follow as a matter of course. This was the language of the Edinburgh Review at a later period, 1824. If then the necessity of flogging in the British armed marine was solely attributed to the impressment of the seamen, what faintest shadow of reason is there for the continuance of this barbarity in the American service, which is wholly freed from the reproach of impressment? It is true that during a long period of non-impressment, and even down to the present day, flogging has been, and still is, the law of the English navy. But in things of this kind, England should be nothing to us, except an example to be shunned. Nor should wise legislators wholly govern themselves by precedence, and conclude that since scourging has so long prevailed, some virtue must reside in it. Not so. The world has arrived at a period which renders it the part of wisdom to pay homage to the prospective precedents of the future, in preference to those of the past. The past is dead and has no resurrection, but the future is endowed with such a life that it lives to us even in anticipation. The past is, in many things, the foe of mankind. The future is, in all things, our friend, but in the past is no hope. The future is both hope and fruition. The past is the textbooks of tyrants. The future is the Bible of the free. Those who are solely governed by the past stand like Lot's wife, crystallized in the act of looking backward and forever incapable of looking before. Let us leave the past, then, to dictate laws to immovable China, let us abandon it to the Chinese legitimists of Europe. But for us, we will have another captain to rule over us. That captain, whoever marches at the head of his troop and beckons them forward, not lingering in the rear and impeding their march with lumbering baggage wagons of old precedents, this is the past. But in many things, we Americans are driven to a rejection of the maxims of the past, seeing that ere long the van of the nations must of right belong to ourselves. There are occasions when it is for America to make precedents and not to obey them. We should, if possible, prove a teacher to posterity instead of being a pupil of bygone generations. More shall come after us than have gone before. The world is not yet middle-aged. Escaped from the house of bondage, Israel of old did not follow after the ways of the Egyptians. To her was given an express dispensation. To her were given new things under the sun. And we Americans are the peculiar, chosen people, the Israel of our time. We bear the ark of the liberties of the world. Seventy years ago we escaped from thrall, and besides our first birthright, embracing one continent of earth, God has given to us, for a future inheritance, the broad domains of the political pagans, that shall yet come and lie down under the shade of our ark, without bloody hands being lifted. God has predestinated, mankind expects, great things from our race and great things we feel in our souls. The rest of the nations must soon be in our rear. We are the pioneers of the world, the advance guard sent on through the wilderness of untried things, to break a new path in the new world that is ours. In our youth is our strength, in our inexperience our wisdom. At a period when other nations have but lisped, our deep voice is heard afar. Long enough have we been skeptics with regard to ourselves and doubted whether indeed the political Messiah had come. But he has come in us, if we would but give utterance to his promptings. And let us always remember that within ourselves, almost for the first time in the history of earth, national selfishness is unbounded philanthropy, for we cannot do a good to America, but we give alms to the world. Chapter 37. Some Superior Old London Dock from the Wine Coolers of Neptune We had just slid into pleasant weather, drawing near to the tropics when all hands were thrown into a wonderful excitement by an event that eloquently appealed to many palates. A man at the foretop sail yard sung out that there were eight or ten dark objects floating on the sea, some three points off our lee bow. Keep her off three points, cried Captain Claret to the quartermaster at the Cun. And thus, with all our batteries, storerooms, and five hundred men with their baggage and beds and provisions, at one move of a round bit of mahogany, our great embattled ark edged away for the strangers as easily as a boy turns to the right or left in pursuit of insects in the field. 
Directly, the man at the topsail yard reported the dark objects to be hogsheads. Instantly, all the top men were straining their eyes in delirious expectations of having their long grog fast broken at last, and that too by what seemed an almost miraculous intervention. It was a curious circumstance that without knowing the contents of the hogshead, they yet seemed certain that the staves encompassed the thing they longed for. Sail was now shortened, our headway was stopped, and a cutter was lowered, with orders to tow the fleet of strangers alongside. The men sprang to their oars with a will, and soon five goodly puncheons lay wallowing in the sea, just under the main chains. We got overboard the slings and hoisted them out of the water. It was a sight that Bacchus and his Bacchanals would have gloated over. Each puncheon was of a deep green color, so covered with minute barnacles and shellfish and streaming with seaweed that it needed long searching to find out their bungholes. They looked like venerable old loggerhead turtles. How long had they been tossing about and making voyages for the benefit of the flavor of their contents, no one could tell. In trying to raft them ashore or on board of some merchant ship, they must have drifted off to sea. This we inferred from the rinks that lengthwise united them, and which, from one point of view, made them resemble a long sea serpent. They were struck into the gun deck, where the eager crowd being kept off by sentries, the cooper was called in with his tools. Bung up and bilge free, he cried in an ecstasy, flourishing his driver and hammer. Upon clearing away the barnacles and moss, a flat sort of shellfish was found closely adhering like a California shell right over one of the bungs. Doubtless this shellfish had there taken up his quarters and thrown his body into the breach in order to better preserve the precious contents of the cask. The bystanders were breathless. When at last this puncheon was canted over and a tin pot held to the orifice, what was to come forth, salt water or wine? But a rich purple tide soon settled the question and the lieutenant assigned to taste it, with a loud and satisfactory smack of his lips, pronounced it port. Oh, Porto, cried Mount Jack, there's no mistake. But to the surprise, grief and consternation of the sailors, an order now came from the quarterdeck to strike the strangers down into the main hold. This proceeding occasioned all sorts of censorious observations upon the captain, who of course had authorized it. It must be related here that, on the passage out from home, the Neversink had touched at Madeira, and there, as is often the case with men of war, the commodore and captain had laid in a goodly stock of wines for their own private tables, and the benefit of their foreign visitors. And although the commodore was a small, spare man, who evidently emptied but few glasses, yet Captain Claret was a portly gentleman with a crimson face whose father had fought at the Battle of the Brandywine, and whose brother had commanded the well-known frigate named in honor of that engagement." and his whole appearance evinced that Captain Claret himself had fought many brandywine battles ashore in honor of his sire's memory, and commanded in many bloodless brandywine actions at sea. It was therefore with some savor of provocation that the sailors held forth on the ungenerous conduct of Captain Claret, and stepping in between them and Providence, as it were, which by this lucky windfall they held, seemed bent upon relieving their necessities, while Captain Claret himself, with an inexhaustible cellar, emptied his Madeira decanters at his leisure. But next day all hands were electrified by the old familiar sound, so long hushed, of the drum rolling to grog. After that the port was served out twice a day till all was expended. Chapter 38 The Chaplain and Chapel in a Man of War The next day was Sunday, a fact set down in the almanac. Spite of Merchant Seaman's maxim, there are no Sundays of soundings. No Sundays off soundings, indeed. No Sundays on shipboard. You may as well say there be no Sundays in churches. For is not a ship modeled after a church? Has it not three spires, three steeples? Yeah, and on the gun deck, a bell and a belfry. And does that not bell merrily peal every Sunday morning to summon the crew to devotions? At any rate... There were Sundays on board this particular frigate of ours, and a clergyman also. He was a slender, middle-aged man, of an amiable deportment, and an irreproachable conversation. But I must say that his sermons were but ill-calculated to benefit the crew. He had drank at the mystic fountain of Plato. His head had been turned by the Germans, and this I will say, that White Jacket himself saw him with Coleridge's Biographia Literaria in his hand. 
Fancy now this transcendental divine standing behind a gun carriage on the main deck and addressing 500 salt sea sinners upon the psychological phenomena of the soul, and the ontological necessity of every sailor saving it at all hazards. He enlarged upon the follies of the ancient philosophers, learnedly alluded to the Phaedon of Plato, exposed the follies of Simplicius's commentary on Aristotle's Decolo, by arraying against that clever pagan author the admired tract of Tertullian, De Prescriptionibus Hereticorum, and concluded by a Sanskrit invocation. He was particularly hard upon the Gnostics and Marcionites of the second century of the Christian era, but he never in the remotest manner attacked the everyday vices of the 19th century, as eminently illustrated in our man-of-war world. Concerning drunkenness, fighting, flogging, and oppression, things expressly or implied prohibited by Christianity, he never said aught, but the most mighty commodore and captain sat before him, and in general, if in a monarchy the state form the audience of the church, little evangelical piety will be preached. Hence the harmless, non-committal abstrusities of our chaplain were not to be wondered at. He was no Massillon to thunder forth his ecclesiastical rhetoric, even when a Louise Le Grand was enthroned among his congregation, nor did the chaplains who preached on the quarterdeck of Lord Nelson ever allude to the guilty Felix, nor to Delilah, nor practically reason of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, when that renowned admiral sat sword-belted before them. During these Sunday discourses, the officers always sat in a circle around the chaplain, and with a business-like air steadily preserved the utmost propriety. In particular, our old Commodore himself made a point of looking intensely edified, and not a sailor on board but believed that the Commodore, being the greatest man present, must alone comprehend the mystic sentences that fell from our parson's lips. Of all the noble lords in the wardroom, this lord spiritual, with the exception of the purser, was in the highest favor with the Commodore, who frequently conversed with him in a close and confidential manner. Nor upon reflection was this to be marveled at, seeing how efficacious in all despotic governments it is for throne and altar to go hand in hand. The accommodations of our chapel were very poor. We had nothing to sit on but the great gun rammers and capstan bars placed horizontally upon shot boxes. These seats were exceedingly uncomfortable, wearing out our trousers and our tempers, and no doubt impeded on conversation of many valuable souls. To say the truth, men of war's men in general make but poor auditors upon these occasions and adopt every possible means to elude them. Often the boatswain's mates were obliged to drive the men to service, violently swearing upon these occasions as upon every other. Go to prayers, damn you! To prayers, you rascals! To prayers! And this clerical invitation Captain Claret would frequently unite. At this, Jack Chase would sometimes make merry. Come, boys, don't hang back, he would say. Come, let us go hear the parson talk about his Lord High Admiral Plato and Commodore Socrates. But in one instance, grave exception was taken to the summons. A remarkable serious but bigoted seaman, a sheet-anchor man, whose private devotions may hereafter be alluded to, once touched his hat to the captain and respectfully said, Sir, I'm a Baptist. The chaplain is an Episcopalian. His form of worship is not mine. I do not believe with him, and it is against my conscience to be under his ministry. May I be allowed, sir, not to attend service on the half-deck? You will be allowed, sir, said the captain haughtily, to obey the laws of the ship. If you absent yourself from prayers on Sunday mornings, you know the penalty. According to the Articles of War, the captain was perfectly right. But if any law requiring an American to attend divine service against his will be a law respecting the establishment of religion then the Articles of War are, in this one particular, opposed to the American Constitution, which expressly says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, or the free exercise thereof. But this is only one of several things in which the Articles of War are repugnant to that instrument. They will be glanced at in another part of the narrative. The motive which prompts the introduction of chaplains into the Navy cannot but be warmly responded to by every Christian. But it does not follow that because chaplains are to be found in men of war, that under the present system they achieve much good, or that under any other they ever will. How can it be expected that the religion of peace should flourish in an oaken castle of war? How can it be expected that the clergyman, whose pulpit is a 42-pounder, should convert sinners to a faith and enjoins them to turn the right cheek when the left is smitten? How is it to be expected that when according to the 42nd of the Articles of War, as they now stand unrepealed on the statute book, 
a bounty shall be paid to the officers and crew by the United States government of $20 for each person on board any ship of an enemy which shall be sunk or destroyed by any United States ship. And when by a subsequent section, 7, it is provided, among other apportionings, that the chaplain shall receive two twentieths of this price paid for sinking and destroying ships full of human beings. I, how is it to be expected that a clergyman thus provided for should prove efficacious in enlarging upon the criminality of Judas, who for thirty pieces of silver betrayed his master? Although by the regulations of the navy each seaman's mess on board that never sink was furnished with a Bible, these Bibles were seldom or never to be seen except on Sunday mornings, when usage demands that they shall be exhibited by the cooks of the messes, when the master-at-arms goes his rounds on the berth deck, at such times they usually surmounted a highly polished tin pot placed on the lid of the chest. Yet for all this, the Christianity of men-of-war's men and their disposition to contribute to pious enterprises are often relied upon. Several times subscription papers were circulated among the crew of the Neversink, while in harbor, under the direct patronage of the chaplain. One was for the purpose of building a seaman's chapel in China, another to pay the salary of a tract distributor in Greece, a third to raise a fund for the benefit of an African colonization society. Where the captain himself is a moral man, he makes a far better chaplain for his crew than any clergyman can be. This is sometimes illustrated in the case of sloops of war and armed brigs, which are not allowed a regular chaplain. I have known one crew who were warmly attached to a naval commander worthy of their love, who have mustered even with alacrity to the call to prayer. And when their captain would read the Church of England service to them, would present a congregation not to be passed for earnestness and devotion by any Scottish kirk. It seemed like family devotions, where the head of the house is foremost in confessing himself before his maker. But our own hearts are our best prayer rooms, and the chaplains who can most help us are ourselves. Chapter 39. The Frigate and Harbor. The Boats. Grand State Reception of the Commodore. In good time we were up with the parallel of Rio de Janeiro, and standing in for the land the mist soon cleared, and high aloft the famed Sugarloaf Pinnacle was seen, our bowsprit pointing for it straight as a die. As we glided on toward our anchorage, the bands of the various men of war and harbor saluted us with national airs, and gallantly lowered their ensigns. Nothing can exceed the courteous etiquette of these ships, of all nations, in greeting their brethren. Of all men, your accomplished duelist is generally the most polite. We lay in Rio some weeks, lazily taking in stores and otherwise preparing for the passage home, but though Rio is one of the most magnificent bays in the world, though the city itself contains many striking objects, and though much might be said of the Sugarloaf and Signal Hill Heights, and the little islet of Lucia, and the fortified Isla dos Cobras, or Isle of the Snakes, though the only anacondas and adders now found in the arsenals are the great guns and pistols, and Lord Wood's nose, a lofty eminence said by seamen to resemble his lordship's conch shell, and the Prez do Flamingo, a noble tract of beach so called from its having been the resort, in olden times, of those gorgeous birds, and the charming bay of Botofogo, which, spite of its name, is fragrant of the neighboring Larangieros, or Valley of the Oranges, and the green Gloria Hill surmounted by the belfries of the queenly church of Nossa Signora de Gloria, and the iron-gray Benedictine convent nearby, and the fine drive and promenade Paseo Publico, and the massive arch-over-arch -arch aqueduct Arcos de Carico, and the Emperor's Palace, and the Empress's Gardens, and the fine church de Candelaria, and the gilded throne on wheels drawn by eight silken silver-belled mules, in which of pleasant evenings his imperial majesty is driven out of town to his Moorish villa of St. Cristova. I, though much be said of all this, yet must I forbear, if I may, and adhere to my one proper object, the world in a man of war. Behold now the never sink under a new aspect. With all her batteries she is tranquilly lying in harbor, surrounded by English, French, Dutch, Portuguese, and Brazilian 74s, moored in deep green water, close under the lee of that oblong, castellated mass of rock, Ile dos Cobres, which, with its portholes and lofty flagstaffs, looks like another man of war, fast anchored in the way. 
But what is an insular fortress indeed but an embattled landslide into the sea from the world of Gibraltars and Quebecs? And what a mainland fortress but a few decks of a line of battleship transplanted ashore? They are all one, all as King David, men of war from their youth. Ay, behold now the never sink at her anchors, in many respects presenting a different appearance from what she presented at sea, nor is the routine of life on board the same. At sea there is more to employ the sailors and less temptation to violations of the law, whereas in port, unless some particular service engages them, they lead the laziest of lives, beset by all the allurements of the shore, though perhaps that shore they may never touch. Unless you happen to belong to one of the numerous boats, which in a man of war and harbor are continually plying to and from the land, you are mostly thrown upon your own resources to while away the time. Whole days frequently pass without your being individually called upon to lift a finger. For though in the merchant service they make a point of keeping the men always busy about something or other, yet to employ 500 sailors when there is nothing definite to be done wholly surpasses the ingenuity of any first lieutenant in the navy. A mention has just been made of the numerous boats employed in harbor. Something more may as well be put down concerning them. Our frigate carried a very large boat, as big as a small sloop, called a launch, which was generally used for getting off food, water, and other bulky articles. Besides this, she carried four boats of an arithmetical progression in point of size, the largest being known as the first cutter, the next largest the second cutter, then the third and fourth cutters, she also carried a commodore's barge, a captain's gig, and a dinghy, a small yawl with a crew of apprentice boys. All these boats, except the dinghy, had their regular crews, who were subordinate to their coxswains, petty officers, receiving pay in addition to their seamen's wages. The launch was manned by the old tritons of the forecastle, who were no ways particular about their dress, while the other boats, commissioned for genteeler duties, were rowed by young fellows, mostly who had a dandy eye to their personal appearance. Above all, the officers see to it that the Commodore's barge and the Captain's gig are manned by gentlemanly youths, who may do credit to their country, and form agreeable objects for the eyes of the Commodore or Captain to repose upon as he tranquilly sits in the stern. Then pulled ashore by his bargemen or gigmen, as the case may be, some sailors are very fond of belonging to the boats, and deem it a great honor to be a Commodore's bargeman but others, perceiving no particular distinction in that office, do not court it so much. On the second day after arriving at Rio, one of the gigmen fell sick, and to my no small concern, I found myself temporarily appointed to his place. Come, white jacket, rig yourself in white, that's the gig's uniform today, you're a gig man, my boy, give you joy. This was the first announcement of the fact that I heard, but soon after it was officially ratified. I was about to seek the first lieutenant and plead the scantiness of my wardrobe, which wholly disqualified me to fill so distinguished a station, when I heard the bugler call away the gig, and without more ado I slipped into a clean frock, which a messmate doffed for my benefit, and soon after found myself pulling off his high mightiness, the captain, to an English 74. As we were bounding along, the coxswain suddenly cried, oars! At the word, every oar was suspended in the air while our commodore's barge floated by, bearing that dignitary himself. At the sight, Captain Claret removed his chapeau and saluted profoundly, our boat lying motionless on the water. But the barge never stopped, and the commodore made but a slight return to the obsequious salute he had received. We then resumed rowing, and presently I heard oars again, but from another boat, the second cutter, which turned out to be carrying a lieutenant ashore. It was now Captain Claret's turn to be honored. The cutter lay still and the lieutenant off hat while the captain only nodded and we kept on our way. This naval etiquette is very much like the etiquette at the grand port of Constantinople, where after washing the sublime sultan's feet, the grand vizier avenges himself on an emir who does the same office for him. When we arrived aboard the English 74, the captain was received with the usual honors and the gig's crew were conducted below and hospitably regaled with some spirits served out by order of the officer of the deck. Soon after, the English crew went to quarters, and as they stood up to their guns, all along the main deck, a row of beef-fed Britons, stalwart-looking fellows, I was struck with the contrast they afforded to similar sights on board of the Neversink. For on board of us, our quarters showed an array of rather slender, lean-checked chaps, 
but then I made no doubt that in a sea tussle, these lantern-jawed varlets would have approved themselves as slender Damascus blades, nimble and flexible, whereas these Britons would have been perhaps as sturdy broadswords. Yet everyone remembers that story of Saladin and Richard trying their respective blades, how gallant Richard clove an anvil in twain, or something quite as ponderous, and Saladin elegantly severed a cushion, so that the two monarchs were even, each excelling in his way. Though unfortunately for my simile, in a patriotic point of view, Richard whipped Saladin's armies in the end. There happened to be a lord on board of this ship, the younger son of an earl, they told me. He was a fine-looking fellow, a chance to stand by when he put a question to an Irish captain of a gum, upon the seamen's inadvertently saying sir to him, his lordship looked daggers at the slight, and the sailor, touching his hat a thousand times, said, pardon, your honor, I meant to say my lord, sir. I was much pleased with an old white-headed musician, who stood at the main hatchway with his enormous bass drum full before him, and thumping it sturdily to the tune of God Save the King, though small mercy did he have on his drum heads. Two little boys were clashing cymbals, and another was blowing a fife, with his cheeks puffed out like the plumpest of his country plum puddings. When we returned from this trip, there again took place that ceremonious reception of our captain on board the vessel he commanded, which always had struck me as exceedingly diverting. In the first place, while in port, one of the quartermasters is always stationed on the poop with a spyglass, to look out for all boats approaching, and report the same to the officer of the deck, also, who it is that may be coming in them, so that preparations may be made accordingly. As soon then as the gig touched the side, a mighty shrill piping was heard, as if some boys were celebrating the 4th of July with penny whistles. This proceeded from a boatswain's mate, who, standing at the gangway, was thus honoring the captain's return, after his long and perilous absence. The captain then slowly mounted the ladder, and gravely marching through a lane of side boys, so-called, all in their best bibs and tuckers, and who stood making sly faces behind his back, was received by all the lieutenants in a body, their hats in their hands, and making a prodigious scraping and bowing, as if they had just graduated at a French dancing school. Meanwhile, preserving an erect and flexible and ramrod carriage and slightly touching his chapeau, the captain made his ceremonious way to the cabin, disappearing behind the scenes like the pasteboard ghost in Hamlet. But these ceremonies are nothing to those in homage of the Commodore's arrival, even should he depart and arrive twenty times a day. Upon such occasions, the whole Marine Guard, except the sentries on duty, are marshaled on the quarter deck, presenting arms as the Commodore passes them, while their commanding officer gives the military salute with his sword, as if making Masonic signs. Meanwhile, the boatswain himself, not a boatswain's mate, is keeping up a preserving whistling with his silver pipe. For the Commodore is never greeted with the rude whistle of a boatswain's subaltern. That would be positively insulting. All the lieutenants and midshipmen, besides the captain himself, are drawn up in a phalanx, an off-hat together. And the side boys, whose number is now increased to ten or twelve, make an imposing display at the gangway, while the whole brass band, elevated upon the poop, strike up, see the conquering hero comes. At least, this was the tune that our captain always hinted by a gesture to the captain of the band whenever the Commodore arrived from shore. It conveyed a complimentary appreciation on the captain's part of the Commodore's heroism during the late war. To return to the gig, as I did not relish the idea of being a sort of body servant to Captain Claret, since his gig men were often called upon to scrub his cabin floor and perform other duties for him, I made it my particular business to get rid of my appointment in his boat as soon as possible, and the next day after receiving it, succeeded in procuring a substitute, who was glad of the chance to fill the position I so much undervalued. And thus, with our counter-likes and dislikes, most of us men-of-war's men harmoniously dovetail into each other, and by our very points of opposition unite in a clever whole, like the parts of a Chinese puzzle. But as, in a Chinese puzzle, many pieces are hard to place, so there are some unfortunate fellows who can never slip into their proper angles, and thus the whole puzzle becomes a puzzle indeed, which is the precise condition of the greatest puzzle in the world, this man-of-war world itself. Chapter 40 Some of the Ceremonies in a Man-of-War Unnecessary and Injurious the ceremonials of a man of war, some of which have been described in the preceding chapter, may merit a reflection or two. 
The general usages of the American Navy are founded upon the usages that prevailed in the Navy of monarchical England more than a century ago. Nor have they been materially altered since, and while both England and America have become greatly liberalized in the interval, while shore pomp in high places has come to be regarded by the more intelligent masses of men as belonging to the absurd, ridiculous, and mock heroic, while that most truly august of all the majesties of earth, the President of the United States, may be seen entering his residence with an umbrella under his arm and no brass band or military guard at his heels, and unostentatiously taking his seat by the side of the meanest citizen in a public conveyance. While this is the case, there still lingers in American men of war all the stilted etiquette and childish parade of the old-fashioned Spanish court of Madrid. Indeed, so far as the things that meet the eye are concerned, an American Commodore is by far a greater man than the President of twenty millions of free men. But we plain people ashore might very willingly be content to leave these Commodores in the unmolested possession of their gilded penny whistles, rattles, and gewgaws, since they seem to take so much pleasure in them, were it not that all this is attended by consequences to their subordinates in the last degree to be deplored. While hardly anyone will question that a naval officer should be surrounded by circumstances calculated to impart a requisite dignity to his position, it is not the less certain that, by the excessive pomp he at present maintains, there is naturally and unavoidably generated a feeling of servility and debasement in the hearts of most of the seamen who continually behold a fellow mortal flourishing over their heads like the archangel Michael with a thousand wings. And as, in degree, the same pomp is observed, towards their inferiors by all the grades of commissioned officers, even down to a midshipman, the evil is proportionately multiplied. It would not at all diminish a proper respect for the officers and subordination to their authority among the seamen, were all this idle parade, only ministering to the arrogance of the officers, without at all benefiting the state, completely done away. But to do so, we voters and lawgivers ourselves must be no respecters of persons. That saying about leveling upward and not downward may seem very fine to those who cannot see its self-involved absurdity. But the truth is that to gain the true level in some things we must cut downward. For how can you make every sailor a commodore, or how raise the valleys, without filling them up with the superfluous tops of the hills? Some discreet but democratic legislation in this matter is much to be desired. And by bringing down naval officers in these things at least without affecting their legitimate dignity and authority— we shall correspondingly elevate the common sailor without relaxing the subordination in which he should by all means be retained. Chapter 41. A Man of War Library Nowhere does time pass more heavily than with most men of war's men on board their craft and harbor. One of my principal anecdotes against Inui in Rio was reading. There was a public library on board, paid for by the government, and entrusted to the custody of one of the marine corporals, a little dried-up man of a somewhat literary turn. He had once been a clerk in a post office ashore, and having been long accustomed to hand over letters when called for, he was now just the man to hand over books. He kept them in a large cask on the berth deck, and when seeking a particular volume, had to capsize it like barrel of potatoes. This made him very cross and irritable, as most librarians are. Who had the selection of these books, I do not know, but some of them must have been selected by our chaplain, who so prances on Coleridge's high German horse. Mason Good's Books of Nature, a very good book to be sure, but not precisely adapted to Terry Tastes, was one of these volumes, and Machiavel's Art of War, which was very dry fighting, and a folio of Tillotson's sermons, the best of reading for divines indeed, but with little relish for a main top man. And Locke's essays, incomparable essays, everybody knows, but miserable reading at sea. And Plutarch's lives, super excellent biographies, which pit Greek against Roman in beautiful style, but then in a sailor's estimation not to be mentioned with the lies of the admirals. And Blair's lectures, university edition, a fine treatise on rhetoric, but having nothing to say about nautical phrases, such as splicing the main brace, passing a gammoning, puddinging the dolphin, and making a carrick bend. Besides numerous invaluable but unreadable tomes that might have been purchased cheap at the auction of some college professor's library, but I found ample entertainment in a few choice old authors whom I stumbled upon in various parts of the ship, 
among the inferior officers. One was Morgan's History of Algiers, a famous old quarto abounding in picturesque narratives of corsairs, captives, dungeons, and sea fights, and making mention of a cruel old day, who toward the latter part of his life was so filled with remorse for his cruelties and crimes that he could not stay in bed after four o'clock in the morning, but had to rise in great trepidation and walk off his bad feelings till breakfast came. And another venerable octavo, containing a certificate from Sir Christopher Wren to its authenticity, entitled Knox's Captivity in Salem, 1681, abounding in stories about the devil who was superstitiously supposed to tyrannize over that unfortunate land. To mollify him, the priests offered up buttermilk, red cocks, and sausages, and the devil ran roaring about in the woods, frightening travelers out of their wits, and so much that the islanders bitterly lamented to Knox that their country was full of devils, and consequently, there was no hope for their eventual well-being. Knox swears that he himself heard the devil roar, though he did not see his horns, It was a terrible noise, he says, like the baying of a hungry mastiff. Then there was Walpole's letters, very witty, pert and polite, and some odd volumes of plays, each of which was a precious casket of jewels of good things. Shaming the trash nowadays passed off for dramas containing the Jew of Malta, Old Fortunatus, the City Madame, Volpone, the Alchemist, and other glorious old dramas of the age of Marlowe and Johnson, and that literary Damon and Pythias, the magnificent, mellow old Beaumont and Fletcher, who have sent the long shadow of their reputation side by side with Shakespeare's, far down the endless veil of posterity. And may that shadow never be less, but as for St. Shakespeare, may his never be more, lest the commentators arise, and settling upon his sacred text like unto locusts, devour it clean up, never leaving a dot over an eye. I diversified this reading of mine by borrowing Moore's Loves of the Angels from Rosewater, who recommended it as De Charming Dest of Volumes, and a Negro songbook containing Sittin' on a Rail, Gumbo Squash, and Jim Along Josie from Broadbit, a sheet anchor man. The sad taste of this old tar in admiring such vulgar stuff was much denounced by Rosewater, whose own predilections were of a more elegant nature, as evinced by his exalted opinion of the literary merits of the loves of angels. I was by no means the only reader of books on board the Neversink. Several other sailors were diligent readers, though their studies did not lie in the way of Bellas Lettres. Their favorite authors were such as you may find at the bookstalls around Fulton Market. They were slightly physiological in their nature. My book experiences on board of the frigate proved an example of a fact which every book lover must have experienced before me, namely, that though public libraries have an imposing air and doubtless contain invaluable volumes, yet somehow the books that prove most agreeable, grateful, and companionable are those that we pick up by chance here and there, those which seem put into our hands by providence, those which pretend to little but abound in much. Chapter 42. Killing Time in a Man of War and Harbor Reading was by no means the only method adopted by my shipmates in whiling away the long, tedious hours in harbor. In truth, many of them could not even read, and they wanted to ever so much. In early youth, their primers had been sadly neglected. Still, they had other pursuits. Some were experts at the needle, and employed their time in making elaborate shirts, stitching picturesque eagles and anchors, and all the stars of the federated states in the collars thereof, so that when they at last completed and put on these shirts, they may be said to have hoisted the American colors. Others excelled in tattooing or pricking, as it is called in a man of war. Of these prickers, two had long been celebrated, in their way, as consummate masters of the art. Each had a small box full of tools and coloring matter, and they charged so high for their services that at the end of the cruise they were supposed to have cleared upward of $400. They would prick you to order a palm tree, or an anchor, a crucifix, a lady, a lion, an eagle, or anything else you might want. The Roman Catholic sailors on board had at least the crucifix pricked on their arms, and for this reason, if they chanced to die in a Catholic land, they would be sure of a decent burial in consecrated ground, as the priest would be sure to observe the symbol of Mother Church on their persons, They would not fare as Protestant sailors, dying in Calau, who are shoved under the sands of St. Lorenzo, 
a solitary volcanic island in the harbor, overrun with reptiles, their heretical bodies not being permitted to repose in the more genial loam of Lima. And many sailors, not Catholics, were anxious to have the crucifix painted on them, owing to a curious superstition of theirs. They affirm, some of them, that if you have that mark tattooed upon all four limbs, you might fall overboard among 775,000 white sharks, all dinnerless, and not one of them would so much as dare to smell at your finger. We had one foretop man on board who, during the entire cruise, was having an endless cable pricked round and round his waist, so that when his frock was off he looked like a capstan with a hawser coiled round about it. This foretop man paid 18 pence per link for the cable, besides being on the smart the whole cruise, suffering the effects of his repeated puncturings, so he paid very dear for his cable. One other mode of passing time while in port was cleaning and polishing your bright work, for it must be known that in men of war, every sailor has some brass or steel of one kind or other to keep in high order, like housemaids, whose business it is to keep well polished the knobs on the front door railing and the parlor gates. Excepting the ring bolts, eye bolts, and belaying pins scattered about the decks, this bright work, as it is called, is principally about the guns, embracing the monkey tails of the carronades, the screws, prickers, little irons, and other things. The portion that fell to my own share I kept in superior order, quite equal in polish to Roger's best cutlery. I received the most extravagant encomiums from the officers, one of whom offered to match me against any brazier or brass polisher in the British Majesty's Navy. Indeed, I devoted myself to the work body and soul, and thought no pains too painful, and no labor too laborious to achieve the highest attainable polish possible for us poor lost sons of Adam's reach. Upon one occasion, even, when woolen rags were scarce, and no burned brick was to be had from the ship's yeoman, I sacrificed the corners of my woolen shirt and used some dentrifus I had, as substitutes for the rag and burned brick. The dentrifus operated delightfully, and made the threading of my carronade screw shine and grin again, like a set of false teeth in an eager heiress hunter's mouth. Still, another mode of passing time was arraying yourself in your best togs and promenading up and down the gun deck, admiring the shore scenery from the portholes, which, in an amphitheatrical bay like Rio, belted about by the most varied and charming scenery of hill, dale, moss, meadow, court, castle, tower, grove, vine, vineyard, aqueduct, palace, square, island, fort, is very much like lounging round a circular cosmorama, and ever and anon lazily peeping through the glasses here and there. Oh, there is something worth living for, even in our man-of-war world. And one glimpse of a bower of grapes through a cable's length off is almost satisfaction for dining off a shank bone salted down. This promenading was chiefly patronized by the Marines, and particularly by Colbrook, a remarkably handsome and very gentlemanly corporal among them. He was a complete ladies' man, with fine black eyes, bright red cheeks, glossy jet whiskers, and a refined organization of the whole man. He used to array himself in his regimentals and saunter about like an officer of the Coldstream Guards, strolling down to his club in St. James. Every time he passed me, he would leave a sentimental sigh and hum to himself, the girl I left behind me. This fine corporal afterward became a representative of the legislator of the state of New Jersey, for I saw his name returned about a year after my return home. But after all, there was not much room while in port, for promenading at least on the gun deck for the whole larboard side is kept clear for the benefit of the officers, who appreciate the advantages of having a clear stroll fore and aft, and they well know that the sailors had much better be crowded together on the other side than the set of their own coattails should be impaired by brushing against their terry trousers. One other way of killing time while in port is playing checkers, that is, when it is permitted, for it is not every navy captain who will allow such a scandalous proceeding. But as for Captain Claret, though he did like his glass of Madeira uncommonly well, and was an undoubted descendant from the hero of the Battle of the Brandywine, and though he sometimes showed a suspiciously flushed face when superintending in person the flogging of a sailor for getting intoxicated against his particular orders, yet I will say for Captain Claret that, Upon the whole, he was rather indulgent to his crew, so long as they were perfectly docile. He allowed them to play checkers as much as they pleased. More than once I have known him, when going forward to the forecastle, pick his way carefully among scores of canvas checker cloths spread upon the deck, 
so as not to tread upon the men, the checker men and men of war's men included. But in a certain sense, they were both one. For as the sailors used their checker men, so at quarters their officers used these men of war's men. But Captain Claret's leniency in permitting checkers on board his ship might have arisen from the following little circumstance, confidentially communicated to me. Soon after the ship had sailed from home, checkers were prohibited, whereupon the sailors were exasperated against the captain, and one night while he was walking round the forecastle, bim, came an iron belaying pin past his ears, and while he was dodging that, bim, came another from the other side, so that it being a very dark night, and nobody to be seen, and it being impossible to find out the trespassers, he thought it best to get back into his cabin as soon as possible. Some time after, just as if the belaying pins had nothing to do with it, it was indirectly rumored that the checkerboards might be brought out again, which, as a philosophical shipmate observed, showed that Captain Claret was a man of a ready understanding, and could understand a hint as well as any other man, even when conveyed by several pounds of iron. Some of the sailors were very precise about their checker cloths, and even went so far as they would not let you play with them unless you washed your hands first, especially so if you had just come from tarring down the rigging. Another way of beguiling the tedious hours is to get a cozy seat somewhere and fall into as snug a little reverie as you can, or if a seat is not to be had, which is frequently the case, then get a tolerably comfortable stand up against the bulwarks and begin to think about home and bread and butter, always inseparably connected to a wanderer, which will very soon bring delicious tears into your eyes, for everyone knows what a luxury is grief when you can get a private closet to enjoy it in, and no Paul Prees intrude. Several of my shore friends indeed, when suddenly overwhelmed by some disaster, always make a point of flying to the first oyster cellar and shutting themselves up in a box with nothing but a plate of stewed oysters, some crackers, the caster, and a decanter of old port. Still another way of killing time in harbor is to lean over the bulwarks and speculate upon where under the sun you are going to be that day next year, which is a subject full of interest to every living soul, so much so that there is a particular day of the month of the year, which from my earliest recollections I have always kept the run of, so that I can tell even now just where I was on that identical day of every year past since I was twelve years old, and when I am all alone, to run over this almanac in my mind is almost as entertaining as to read your own diary, and far more interesting than to peruse a table of logarithms on a rainy afternoon. I always keep the anniversary of that day with lamb and peas and a pint of sherry, for it comes in spring, but when it came round in the never sink, I could neither get lamb, peas, nor sherry. But perhaps the best way to drive the hours before you four in hand is to select a soft plank on the gun deck and go to sleep. A fine specific which seldom fails unless to be sure you have been sleeping all the 24 hours beforehand. Whenever employed in killing time in harbor, I have lifted myself up on my elbow and looked around me, and seen so many of my shipmates all employed at the same common business, all under lock and key, all hopeless prisoners like myself, all under martial law, all dieting on salt beef and biscuit, all in one uniform, all yawning, gaping, and stretching in concert— it was then that I used to feel certain love and affection for them, grounded doubtless on a fellow feeling. And though in a previous part of this narrative, I have mentioned that I used to hold myself somewhat aloof from the mass of seamen on board the Never Sink, and though this was true, and my real acquaintances were comparatively few, and my intimates still fewer, yet to tell the truth it is quite impossible to live so long with five hundred of your fellow beings, even if not of the best families in the land, and with morals that would not be spoiled by further cultivation. It is quite impossible, I say, to live with five hundred of your fellow beings, be they who they may, without feeling a common sympathy with them at the time, and ever after cherishing some sort of interest in their welfare. The truth of this was curiously corroborated by a rather equivocal acquaintance of mine who, among the men, went by the name of Shakings. He belonged to the forehold, whence of a dark night he would sometimes emerge to chat with the sailors on deck. I never liked the man's look. I protest it was a mere accident that gave me the honor of his acquaintance, and generally I did my best to avoid him when he would come skulking like a jailbird out of his den into the liberal open air of the sky. Nevertheless, the anecdote this holder told me is well worth preserving, more especially the extraordinary frankness evinced in his narrating such a thing to a comparative stranger. The substance of his story was as follows. Shakings, it seems, had once been a convict of the New York State's prison at Sing Sing, where he had been for years confined for a crime, which he gave me his solemn word of honor he was wholly innocent of. 
He told me that after his term had expired and he went out into the world again, he never could stumble upon any of his old Sing Sing associates without dripping into a public house and talking over old times. And when fortune would go hard with him and he felt out of sorts and incensed at matters and things in general, he told me that at such times he almost wished he was back again in Sing Sing, where he was relieved from all anxieties about what he should eat and drink, and was supported like the President of the United States and Prince Albert at the public charge. He used to have such a snug little cell, he said, all to himself, and never felt afraid of housebreakers, for the walls were uncommonly thick and his door was securely bolted for him, and a watchman was all the time walking up and down in the passage while he himself was fast asleep and dreaming. To this, in substance, the holder added that he narrated this anecdote because he thought it applicable to a man of war, which he scandalously asserted to be a sort of state prison afloat. Concerning the curious disposition to fraternize and be sociable, which this shakings mentioned as characteristic of the convicts liberated from his old homestead at Sing Sing, it may well be asked whether it may not prove to be some feeling, somehow akin to the reminiscent impulses which influence them, that shall hereafter fraternally reunite us all as mortals, when we shall have exchanged this state's prison man-of-war world of ours for another and a better. From the foregoing account of the great difficulty we had in killing time while in port, it must not be inferred that on board of the Never Sink in Rio there was literally no work to be done. At long intervals, the launch would come alongside with water casks to be emptied into iron tanks in the hold. In this way, nearly 50,000 gallons, as chronicled in the books of the master's mate, were decanted into the ship's bowels, a 90 days allowance. With this huge Lake Ontario in us, the mighty Never Sink might be said to resemble the united continent of the Eastern Hemisphere, floating in a vast ocean herself, and having a Mediterranean floating in her. Chapter 43 Smuggling in a Man of War it is in a good degree owing to the idleness just described that while lying in harbor, the man of war's man is exposed to the most temptations and gets into his saddest scrapes. For though his vessel be anchored a mile from the shore and her sides are patrolled by sentries night and day, yet these things cannot entirely prevent the seductions of the land from reaching him. The prime agent in working his calamities in port is his old arch enemy, the ever devilish god of Grog. Immured as the man of war's man is serving out his three weary years in a sort of sea Newgate from which he cannot escape, either by the roof or burying underground, he too often flies to the bottle to seek relief from the intolerable ennui of nothing to do and nowhere to go. His ordinary government allowance of spirits, one gill per diem, is not enough to give a sufficient to his listless senses. He pronounces his grog basely watered, he scouts at it as thinner than muslin, he craves a more vigorous nip at the cable, a more sturdy swig at the halyards, and if opium were to be had, many would steep themselves a thousand fathoms down in the densest fumes of that oblivious drug. Tell him that the delirium tremens and the mania a pateau lie in ambush for drunkards, he will say to you, let them bear down upon me then before the wind, anything that smacks off life is better than to feel Davy Jones' chest lid on your nose. He is reckless as an avalanche, and although his fall destroy himself and others, yet a ruinous commotion is better than being frozen fast in unendurable solitudes. No wonder, then, that he goes all lengths to procure the thing he craves. No wonder that he pays the most exorbitant prices, breaks through all law, and braves the ignominious lash itself, rather than be deprived of his stimulus. Now concerning no one thing in a man of war are the regulations more severe than respecting the smuggling of grog and being found intoxicated. For either offense there is but one penalty, invariably enforced, and that is the degradation of the gangway. All conceivable precautions are taken by most frigid executives to guard against the secret admission of spirits into the vessel. In the first place, no shore boat whatever is allowed to approach a man of war in a foreign harbor without permission from the officer of the deck. Even the bum boats, the small craft licensed by the officers to bring off fruit for the sailors, to be bought out of their own money, these are invariably inspected before permitted to hold intercourse with the ship's company. And not only this, but every one of the numerous ship's boats, kept almost continually plying to and from the shore, are similarly inspected, sometimes each boat twenty times in the day. This inspection is thus performed, the boat being descried by the quartermaster from the poop. She is reported to the deck officer, who thereupon summons the master-at-arms, the ship's chief of police. 
This functionary now stations himself at the gangway, and as the boat's crew one by one come up the side, he personally overhauls them, making them take off their hats, and then placing both hands upon their heads, drawing his palms slowly down to their feet, carefully feeling all unusual protuberances. If nothing suspicious is felt, the man is let pass, and so on, till the whole boat's crew, averaging about sixteen men, are examined. The chief of police then descends into the boat and walks from stern to stern, eyeing it all over, and poking his long ratten into every nook and cranny. This operation concluded, and nothing found, he mounts the ladder, touches his hat to the deck officer, and reports the boat clean, whereupon she is hauled out to the booms. Thus it will be seen that not a man of the ship's company ever enters the vessel from shore without it being rendered next to impossible, apparently that he should have succeeded in smuggling anything. Those individuals who are permitted to board the ship without undergoing this ordeal are only persons whom it would be preposterous to search, such as the Commodore himself, the captain, lieutenants, etc., and gentlemen and ladies coming as visitors. For anything to be clandestinely thrust through the lower portholes at night is rendered very difficult, from the watchfulness of the quartermaster inhaling all boats that approach, long before they draw alongside, and the vigilance of the sentries, posted on platforms overhanging the water, whose orders are to fire into a strange boat, which after being warned to withdraw, should still persist in drawing nigh. Moreover, thirty-two pound shots are slung to ropes, and suspended, over the bows, to drop a hole into and sink any small craft, which, spite of all precaution by strategy, should succeed in getting under the bows with liquor by night. Indeed, the whole power of martial law is enlisted in this matter, and every one of the numerous officers of the ship, besides his general zeal in enforcing the regulations, adds to that a personal feeling, since the sobriety of the men abridges his own cares and anxieties. How then, it will be asked, in the face of an argus-eyed police, and in defiance even of bayonets and bullets, do men of war's men contrive to smuggle their spirits? Not to enlarge upon minor stratagems, every few days detected and rendered not, such as rolling up in a handkerchief a long, slender skin of grog, like a sausage, and in that manner ascending to the deck out of a boat just from shore, or openly bringing on board coconuts and melons procured from a knavish bum boat filled with spirits instead of milk or water. We will only mention here two or three other modes coming under my own observation. While in Rio, a foretop man belonging to the second cutter paid down the money and made an arrangement with a person encountered at the palace landing ashore, to the following effect. Of a certain moonless night, it was to bring off three gallons of spirits in skins and moor them to the frigate's anchor buoy, some distance from the vessel, attaching something heavy to sink them out of sight. In the middle watch of the night, the foretop man slips out of his hammock and by creeping along in the shadows, eludes the vigilance of the master-at-arms and his mates, gains a porthole, and softly lowers himself into the water, almost without creating a ripple. The sentries marching to and fro on their overhanging platform above him. He is an expert swimmer and paddles along under the surface, every now and then rising a little and lying motionless on his back to breathe, little but his nose is exposed. The buoy gained, he cuts the skins adrift, ties them round his body, and in the same adroit manner makes good his return. This feat is very seldom attempted, for it needs the utmost caution, address, and dexterity, and no one but a super-expert burglar and faultless Leander of a swimmer could achieve it. From the greater privileges which they enjoy, the forward officers, that is, the gunner, boatswain, etc., have much greater opportunities for successful smuggling than the common seamen. Coming alongside one night in a cutter, Yarn, our boatswain, in some inexplicable way, contrived to slip several skins of brandy through the airport of his own state room. The feat, however, must have been perceived by one of the boat's crew, who immediately, on gaining the deck, sprung down the ladders and stole into the boatswain's room and made away with the prize, not three minutes before the rightful owner entered to claim it. Though, from certain circumstances, the thief was known to the aggrieved party, yet the latter could say nothing, since he himself had infringed the law. But the next day, in the capacity of captain of the ship's executioners, Yarn had the satisfaction, it was so to him, of standing over the robber at the gangway, for being found intoxicated with the very liquor the boatswain himself had smuggled, the man had been condemned to a flogging. This recalls another instance, still more illustrative, of the knotted, trebly intertwisted villainy accumulating at a sort of compound interest in a man of war. 
The coxswain of the Commodore's barge takes his crew apart, one by one, and cautiously sounds them as to their fidelity. Not to the United States of America, but to himself. Three individuals whom he seems doubtful, that is, faithful to the United States of America, he procures to be discharged from the barge, and men of his own selection are substituted. For he is always an influential character, this coxswain of the Commodore's barge. Previous to this, however, he has seen to it well that no temperance men, that is, sailors who do not draw their government ration of grog, but take the money for it, he has seen to it, that none of these balkers are numbered among his crew. Having now proved his men, he divulges his plan to the assembled body. A solemn oath of secrecy is obtained, and he waits the first fit opportunity to carry into execution his nefarious designs. At last it comes, one afternoon the barge carries the Commodore across the bay to a fine waterside settlement of noblemen's seats, called Praia Granda. The Commodore is visiting a Portuguese marquee, and the pair linger over their dinner in an arbor in the garden. Meanwhile, the coxswain has liberty to roam about where he pleases. He searches out a place where some choice red-eye brandy is to be had, purchases six large bottles, and conceals them among the trees. Under the pretense of filling the boat keg with water, which is always kept in the barge to refresh the crew, he now carries it off into the grove, knocks out the head, puts the bottles inside, reheads the keg, fills it with water, carries it down to the boat, and audaciously restores it to its conspicuous position in the middle, with its bung hole up. Then the Commodore comes down to the beach, and they pull off for the ship. The coxswain in a loud voice commands the nearest man to take that bung out of the keg. That precious water will spoil. Arrived alongside the frigate, the boat's crew are overhauled, as usual at the gangway, and nothing being found on them are passed. The master-at-arms, now descending into the barge, finding nothing suspicious, reports it clean, having put his finger into the open bung of the keg and tasted the water was pure. The barge is ordered out of the booms, and deep night is waited for, ere the coxswain essays to snatch the bottles from the keg. But, unfortunately, for the success of this masterly smuggler, one of his crew is a weak-pated fellow, who, having drank somewhat freely ashore, goes about the gun deck throwing out profound tipsy hints concerning some unutterable proceeding on the ship's anvil. A knowing old sheet-anchor man, an unprincipled fellow, putting this, that, and the other together, ferrets out the mystery, and straightway resolves to reap the goodly harvest when the coxswain has sowed. He seeks him out, takes him to one side, and addresses him thus, Coxswain, you have been smuggling off some red-eye, which at this moment is in your barge at the booms. Now, Coxswain, I have stationed two of my messmates at the portholes on that side of the ship, and if they report to me that you or any of your bargemen offer to enter that barge before morning, I will immediately report you as a smuggler to the officer of the deck. The Coxswain is astounded, for to be reported to the deck officer as a smuggler would inevitably procure him a sound flogging, and be the disgraceful breaking of him as a petty officer, receiving four dollars a month beyond his pay as an able seaman. He attempts to bribe the other to secrecy by promising half the profits of the enterprise, but the sheet-anchored man's integrity is like a rock. He is no mercenary to be bought up for a song. The Coxswain therefore is forced to swear that neither himself nor any of his crew shall enter the barge before morning. This done, the sheet anchor man goes to his confidence and arranges his plans. In a word, he succeeds in introducing the six brandy bottles into the ship, five of which he sells at eight dollars a bottle, and then, with the sixth, between two guns, he secretly regales himself in confederates, while the helpless coxswain, stifling his rage, bitterly eyes them from afar. Thus, though they say there is no honor among thieves, there is little among man-of-war smugglers. Chapter 44. A Knave in Office and a Man of War The last smuggling story now about to be related also occurred while we lay in Rio. It is the more particularly presented since it furnishes the most curious evidence of the almost incredible corruption pervading nearly all ranks in some men of war. For some days the number of intoxicated sailors collared and brought up to the mast by the master of arms to be reported to the deck officers previous to a flogging at the gangway, had in the last degree excited the surprise and vexation of the captain and senior officers. So strict were the captain's regulations concerning the suppression of grog smuggling, and so particular had he been in charging the matter upon all the lieutenants and every understrapper official in the frigate, that he was wholly at a loss how so large a quantity of spirits could have spirited into the ship, 
in the face of all these checks, guards, and precautions. Still, additional steps were adopted to detect the smugglers, and Bland, the master at arms, together with his corporals, were publicly harangued at the mast by the captain in person, and charged to exert their best powers in suppressing the traffic. Crowds were presented at the time and saw the master at arms touch his cap in obsequious homage, as he solemnly assured the captain that he would still continue to do his best, as indeed he said he had always done. He concluded with a pious ejaculation expressive of his personal abhorrence of smuggling and drunkenness and his fixed resolution, so help him heaven, to spend his last wink in sitting up by night to spy out all deeds of darkness. I do not doubt you, master of arms, returned the captain. Now go to your duty. This master at arms was a favorite of the captain's. The next morning before breakfast, when the market boat came off, that is, one of the ship's boats regularly deputed to bring off the daily fresh provisions for the officers, when this boat came off, the master at arms, as usual, after carefully examining both her and her crew, reported them to the deck officer to be free from suspicion. The provisions were then hoisted out, and among them came a good-sized wooden box addressed to Mr. Purser of the United States ship Never Sink. Of course, any private matter of this sort, destined for a gentleman of the wardroom, was sacred from examination, and the master-at-arms commanded one of his corporals to carry it down into the purser's state room. But recent occurrences had sharpened the vigilance of the deck officer to an unwanted degree, and seeing the box going down the hatchway, he demanded what that was and whom it was for. "'All right, sir,' said the master-at-arms, touching his cap. "'Stores for the purser, sir.' "'Let it remain on deck,' said the lieutenant." Mr. Montgomery, calling a midshipman, ask the purser whether there is any box coming off for him this morning. Aye, aye, sir, said the middy, touching his cap. Presently he returned, saying that the purser was ashore. Very good, then, Mr. Montgomery. Have that box put into the brig, with strict orders to the sentry not to suffer anyone to touch it. Had I not better take it down into my mess, sir, until the purser comes off, said the master-at-arms deferentially. I have given my orders, sir, said the lieutenant, turning away. When the purser came on board, it turned out that he knew nothing at all about the box. He had never so much as heard of it in his life. So it was again brought up before the deck officer, who immediately summoned the master-at-arms. Break open that box. Certainly, sir, said the master-at-arms, and wrenching off the cover, twenty-five brown jugs, just like a litter of twenty-five brown pigs, were found snugly nested in a bed of straw. The smugglers are at work, sir, said the master-at-arms, looking up. Uncork and taste it, said the officer. The master at arms did so, and smacking his lips after a puzzled fashion, was a little doubtful whether it was American whiskey or Holland gin, but he said he was not used to liquor. Brandy. I know it by the smell, said the officer. Return the box to the brig. Aye, aye, sir, said the master at arms, redoubling his activity. The affair was at once reported to the captain, who, incensed at the audacity of the thing, adopted every plan to detect the guilty parties. Inquiries were made ashore, but by whom the box had been brought down to the market boat, there was no finding out. Here the matter rested for a time. Some days after, one of the boys of the mizzen top was flogged for drunkenness, and while suspended in agony at the gratings, was made to reveal from whom he had procured his spirits. The man was called and turned out to be an old superannuated marine, one Scriggs, who did the cooking for the marine sergeants and master at arms mess. This marine was one of the most villainous-looking fellows in the ship, with a squinting, picklock, gray eye, and hangdog gallows gait. How such a most unmartial vagabond had insinuated himself into the Honorable Marine Corps was a perfect mystery. He had always been noted for his personal uncleanliness, and among all hands fore and aft had the reputation of being a notorious old miser, who denied himself the few comforts and many of the common necessaries of a man of war life. Seeing no escape, Scriggs fell on his knees before the captain and confessed the charge of the boy. Observing the fellow to be in an agony of fear at the sight of the boatswain's mates and their lashes, and all the striking parade of public punishment, the captain must have thought this a good opportunity for completely pumping him of all his secrets. This terrified marine was at length forced to reveal his having been for some time an accomplice in a complicated system of underhanded villainy, the head of which was no less a personage than the indefatigable chief of police the master-at-arms himself. It appeared that this official had his confidential agents ashore, who supplied him with spirits, and in various boxes, packages, and bundles, addressed to the pursers and others, brought them down to the frigate's boats at the landing. 
Ordinarily, the appearance of these things for the purser and other wardroom gentlemen occasion no surprise, for almost every day some bundle or other is coming off for them, especially for the purser. And, as the master of arms was always present on these occasions, it was an easy matter for him to hurry the smuggled liquor out of sight, and under pretense of carrying the box or bundle down to the purser's room, hide it away upon his own premises. The miserly marine Scriggs with the lockpick eye was the man who clandestinely sold the spirits to the sailors, thus completely keeping the master-at-arms in the background. The liquor sold at the most exorbitant prices, at one time reaching $12 the bottle in cash and $30 a bottle in orders upon the purser, to be honored upon the frigid's arrival home. It may seem incredible that such prices should have been given by the sailors, but when some man-of-war's men crave liquor, and it is hard to procure, they would almost barter ten years of their lifetime for but one solitary tot if they could. The sailors who became intoxicated with the liquor thus smuggled on board by the master of arms were in almost numberless instances officially seized by that functionary and scourged at the gangway. In a previous place it had been shown how conspicuous a part the master at arms enacts at the scene. The ample profits of this iniquitous business were divided between all the parties concerned in it, Scriggs, the marine, coming in for one-third, his cook's mess chest being brought on deck. Four canvas bags of silver were found in it, amounting to a sum something short of as many hundred dollars. The guilty parties were scourged, double-ironed, and for several weeks were confined in the brig under a sentry, all but the master at arms, who was merely cashiered and imprisoned for a time with bracelets upon his wrists. Upon being liberated, he was turned adrift among the ship's company, and by way of disgracing him still more, was thrust into the waist, the most inglorious division of the ship. Upon going to dinner one day, I found him soberly seated at my own mess, and at first I could not but feel some very serious scruples about dining with him. Nevertheless, he was a man to study and digest, so, upon a little reflection, I was not displeased at his presence. It amazed me, however, that he had wormed himself into the mess, since so many of the other messes had declined the honor, until at last I ascertained that he had induced a messmate of ours, a distant relation of his, to prevail upon the cook to admit him. Now, it would not have answered for hardly any other mess in the ship to have received this man among them, for it would have torn a huge rent in their reputation. But our mess, a number one, the 42-pounder club, was composed of so fine a set of fellows, so many captains of tops and quartermasters, men of undeniable mark on board ship, of long-established standing and consideration on the gun deck, that with impunity we could do so many equivocal things, utterly inadmissible for messes of inferior pretension. Besides, though we all abhorred the monster of sin itself, yet from our social superiority, highly rarefied education in our lofty top, and large and liberal sweep of the aggregate of things, we were in a good degree free from those useless personal prejudices and galling hatreds against conspicuous sinners, not sin, which so widely prevail among men of warped understandings and unchristian and uncharitable hearts. No, the superstitions and dogmas concerning sin had not laid their withering maxims upon our hearts. We perceived how that evil was but good disguised, and a knave a saint in his way. How that in other planets perhaps what we deem wrong May there be deemed right, even as some substances, without undergoing any mutations in themselves, utterly change their color, according to the light thrown upon them. We perceive that the anticipated millennium must have begun upon the morning the first words were created, and that taken all in all our man of war itself was as eligible a round stern craft as any to be found in the Milky Way. And we fancied that though some of us on the gun deck were at times condemned to sufferings and blights, and of all manner of tribulation and anguish, yet no doubt it was only our misapprehension of these things that made us take them, for woeful pains instead of the most agreeable pleasures. I have dreamed of a sphere, says Pincella, where to break a man on the wheel is held the most exquisite of delights you can confer upon him, where for one gentleman in any way to vanquish another is accounted an everlasting dishonor where to tumble one into a pit after death and then throw cold clods upon his upturned face is a species of contumely only inflicted upon the most notorious criminals. But whatever we messmates thought, in whatever circumstances we found ourselves, we never forgot that our frigid, had as it was, was homeward bound. Such at least were our reveries at times, though sorely jarred now and then by events that took our philosophy aback. 
For after all, philosophy, that is, the best wisdom that has ever in any way been revealed to our man-of-war world, is but a sloth and a mire, with a few tufts of good footing here and there. But there was one man in the mess who would have naught to do with our philosophy, a churlish, ill-tempered, unphilosophical, superstitious old bear of a quarter-gunner, a believer in Tophet, for which he was accordingly preparing himself. Priming was his name, but methinks I have spoken of him before. Besides, this bland, the master-at-arms, was no vulgar, dirty knave. In him, to modify Burke's phrase, vice seemed, but only seemed, to lose half its seeming evil. By losing all its apparent grossness, he was a neat and gentlemanly villain, and broke his biscuit with a dainty hand. There was a fine polish about his whole person, and a pliant, insinuating style in his conversation, that was socially quite irresistible. Save my noble captain, Jack Chase, he proved himself the most entertaining, I had almost said the most companionable man in the mess. Nothing but his mouth, that was somewhat small, moorish arched, and wickedly delicate, and his snaky black eye that it sometimes shone like a dark lantern in a jeweler's shop at midnight, betokened the accomplished scoundrel within. But in his conversation there was no trace of evil, nothing equivocal. He studiously shunned an indelicacy, never swore, and chiefly abounded in passing puns and witticisms, varied with humorous contrasts between ship and shore life, and many agreeable and racy anecdotes, very tastefully narrated. In short, in a merely psychological point of view at least, he was a charming blackleg. Ashore, such a man might have been an irreproachable mercantile swindler, circulating in polite society. But he was still more than this. Indeed, I claim for this master-at-arms a lofty and honorable niche in the Newgate calendar of history. His intrepidity, coolness, and wonderful self-possession in calmly resigning himself to a fate that thrusted him from an office in which he had tyrannized over five hundred mortals, many of whom hated and loathed him, past all belief. His intrepidity, I say, and now fearlessly gliding among them, like a disarmed swordfish among ferocious white sharks, this surely bespoke no ordinary man while in office even his life had been often secretly attempted by the seamen whom he had brought to the gangway. Of dark nights they had dropped down the hatchways, destined to damage his pepper box, as they phrased it. They had made ropes with the hangman's noose at the end and tried to lasso him in dark corners, and now he was adrift among them, under notorious circumstances of superlative villainy, at last dragged to light, and yet he blandly smiled, politely offered his cigar holder to a perfect stranger, and laughed and chatted to right and left, as if springy, buoyant, and elastic, with an angelic conscience, and sure of kind friends wherever he went, both in this life and the life to come. While he was lying ironed in the brig, gangs of the men were sometimes overheard whispering about the terrible reception they would give him when he should be set at large, Nevertheless, when liberated, they seemed confounded by his erect and cordial assurance, his gentlemanly sociability, and fearless companionableness. From being an implacable policeman, vigilant, cruel, and remorseless in his office, however polished in his phrases, he has now become a disinterested, sauntering man of leisure, winking at all improprieties, and ready to laugh and make merry with anyone. Still, at first, the men gave him a wide berth and returned scowls for his smiles, But who can forever resist the very devil himself, when he comes in the guise of a gentleman, free, fine, and frank? Though Gota's pious Margaret hates the devil in his horns and harpooner's tail, yet she smiles and nods to the engaging fiend in the very persuasive, winning, oily, wholly harmless Mephistopheles. But however it was, I for one regarded this master-at-arms with mixed feelings of detestation, pity, admiration, and something opposed to enmity. I could not but abominate him when I thought of his conduct. I but pitied the continual gnawing which, under his deftly donned disguises, I saw lying at the bottom of his soul. I admired his heroism in sustaining himself so well under such reverses, and when I thought how arbitrary the articles of war are in defining a man-of-war villain, how much undetected guilt might be sheltered by the aristocratic awning of our quarter-deck, how many florid pursuers, ornaments of the wardroom, had been legally protected and defrauding the people, I could not but say to myself, well, after all, though this man is a most wicked one indeed, yet is he even more luckless than depraved. Besides, a studied observation of Bland convinced me that he was an organic and irreclaimable scoundrel, who did wicked deeds as the cattle browsed the herbage, because wicked deeds seemed the legitimate operation of his whole infernal organization. Phrenologically, he was without a soul, 
Is it to be wondered at that the devils are irreligious? What then, thought I, who is to blame in this matter? For one, I will not take the day of judgment upon me by authoritatively pronouncing upon the essential criminality of any man of war's men. And Christianity has taught me that at the last day, man of war's men will not be judged by the articles of war, nor by the United States statutes at large, but by immutable laws, ineffably beyond the comprehension of the Honorable Board of Commodores and Navy Commissioners. But though I will stand by even a man of war thief and defend him from being seized up at the gangway, if I can, remembering that my Savior once hung between two thieves, promising one life eternal, yet I would not. After the plain conviction of a felon, again let him entirely loose to prey upon honest seamen, fore and aft all three decks. But this did Captain Claret, and though the thing may not perhaps be credited, nevertheless here it shall be recorded. After the man-at-arms had been adrift among the ship's company for several weeks, and we were within a few days' sail of home, he was summoned to the mast and publicly reinstated in his office as the ship's chief of police, Perhaps Captain Claret had read the memoirs of Vidoc and believed in the old saying, set a rogue to catch a rogue. Or perhaps he was a man of very tender feelings, highly susceptible to the soft emotions of gratitude, and could not bear to leave and disgrace a person who, out of the generosity of his heart, had about a year previous presented him with a rare snuff-box, fabricated from a sperm's whale-tooth, with a curious silver hinge and cunningly wrought in the shape of a whale. Also a splendid gold mountain cane of a costly Brazilian wood with a gold plate bearing the captain's name and rank in the service. The place and time of his birth and with a vacancy underneath, no doubt providentially left for his heirs to record his decease. Certain it was that some months previous to the master at arms disgrace he had presented these articles to the captain with his best love and compliments. And the captain had received them and seldom went ashore without the cane and never took snuff but out of that box. With some captains, a sense of propriety might have induced them to return these presents when the generous donor had proved himself unworthy of having them retained. But it was not Captain Claret who would inflict such a cutting wound upon any officer's sensibilities, though long-established naval customs had habituated him to scourging the people upon an emergency. Now, had Captain Claret deemed himself constitutionally bound to decline all presents from his subordinates, the sense of gratitude would not have operated to the prejudice of justice. And as some of the subordinates of a man-of-war captain are apt to invoke his good wishes and mollify his conscience by making him friendly gifts, it would perhaps have been an excellent thing for him to adopt the plan pursued by the President of the United States when he received the present of lions and Arabian chargers from the Sultan of Muscat. Being forbidden by his sovereign lords and masters, the imperial people, to accept any gifts from foreign powers, the President sent them to an auctioneer, and the proceeds were deposited in the treasury. In the same manner, when Captain Claret received his snuff-box and cane, he might have accepted them very kindly, and then sold them off to the highest bidder, perhaps to the donor himself, who in that case would never have tempted him again. Upon his return home, Bland was paid off for his full term, not deducting the period of his suspension. He again entered the service in his old capacity. As no further allusion will be made to this affair, it may as well be stated now that for the very brief period elapsing between his restoration and being paid off in port by the purser, the master-at-arms conducted himself with infinite discretion, artfully steering between any relaxation of discipline, which would have awakened the displeasure of the officers, and any unwise severity, which would have revived in tenfold force all the grudges of the seamen under his command. Never did he show so much talent and tact as when vibrating in that his most delicate predicament, and plenty of cause there was for the exercise of his cunningest abilities. For upon the discharge of our men of war's men at home, should he then be held by them as an enemy, as free and independent citizens, they would waylay him in the public streets and take purple vengeance for all his iniquities, past, present, and possible in the future. More than once a master-at-arms ashore has been seized by night by an exasperated crew and served as Origen served himself, or as his enemies served Abelard. But though under extreme provocation the people of a man-of-war have been guilty of the maddest vengeance, yet at other times they are very placeable and milky-hearted, even to those who may have outrageously abused them. Many things in point might be related, but I forbear. This account of the master at arms cannot be better concluded than by denominating him, in the vivid language of the captain of the foretop, as the two ends and middle of the thrice laid strand of a bloody rascal, which was intended for a terse, well-knit, and all-comprehensive assertion, without omission or reservation. 
It was also asserted that Tophet itself been raked with a fine tooth comb. Such another ineffable villain could not by any possibility have been caught. Chapter 45 Publishing Poetry in a Man of War A day or two after our arrival in Rio, a rather amusing incident occurred to a particular acquaintance of mine, young Lemsford, the gun deck bard. The great guns of an armed ship have blocks of wood called tompions, painted black, inserted in their muzzles to keep out the spray of the sea. These tompions slip in and out very handily, like covers to butter firkins. By advice of a friend, Limsford, alarmed for the fate of his box of poetry, had latterly made use of a particular gun on the main deck, in the tube of which he thrust his manuscripts. By simply crawling partly out of the porthole, removing the tompion, inserting his papers tightly rolled, and making all snug again. Breakfast over, he and I were reclining in the main top, where by permission of my noble master Jack Chase I had invited him, when, of a sudden, we heard a cannonading. It was our own ship. Ah, said a top man, returning the shore salute they gave us yesterday. Oh, Lord, cried Limsford, my song of the sirens, and he ran down the rigging to the batteries, but just as he touched the gun deck, gun number 20, his literary strongbox went off with a terrific report. Well, after my guard, Virgil, said Jack Chase to him as he slowly returned up the rigging, did you get it? You need not answer, I see you were too late. But never mind, my boy, no printer could do the business for you better. That's the way to publish, White Jacket, turning to me. Fire it right into them. Every canto, a 24-pound shot. Hull the blockheads, whether they will or no. And mind you, Limsford, when your shot does the most execution, you hear the least from the foe. A killed man cannot even lisp. Glorious Jack, cried Limsford, running up and snatching him by the hand. Say that again, Jack. Look me in the eyes. By all the homers, Jack, you have made my soul mount like a balloon. Jack, I'm a poor devil of a poet. Not two months before I shipped aboard here, I published a volume of poems. Very aggressive on the world, Jack. Heaven knows what it cost me. I published it, Jack, and the cursed publisher sued me for damages. My friends looked sheepish. One or two who liked it were noncommittal. And as for the adult-pated mob and rabble, they thought they had found out a fool. Blast them, Jack, and what they call the public is a monster. Like the idol we saw in Owai, with the head of the jackass, the body of a baboon, and the tail of a scorpion. I don't like that, said Jack. When I'm ashore, I myself am part of the public. Your pardon, Jack, you are not. You are then a part of the people, just as you were aboard the frigate here. The public is one thing, Jack, and the people another. You are right, said Jack. Right as this leg. Virgil, you are a trump. You are a jewel, my boy. The public and the people. Aye, aye, my lads. Let us hate the one and cleave to the other. Chapter 46 the Commodore on the Poop, and one of the people under the hands of the surgeon. A day or two after the publication of Limsford's Songs of the Sirens, a sad accident befell a messmate of mine, one of the captains of the mizzen top. He was a fine little Scot, who from the premature loss of hair on top of his head always went by the name of Baldy. This baldness was no doubt in great part attributable to the same cause that early thins the locks of most man-of-war's men, namely the hard, unyielding, and ponderous man-of-war and Navy regulation tarpaulin hat, which, when new, is stiff enough to sit upon, and indeed, in lieu of his thumb, sometimes serves the common sailor for a bench. Now there is nothing upon which the commodore of a squadron more prides himself than upon the celerity with which his men can handle the sails, and go through with all the evolutions pertaining thereto. This is especially manifested in harbor when other vessels of a squadron are near and perhaps the armed ships of rival nations. Upon these occasions, surrounded by his post-captain's saw traps, each of whom in his own floating island is king, the commodore domineers over all, emperor of the whole oaken archipelago. Yeah, magisterial and magnificent as the sultans of the Isles of Sulu. But even as so potent an emperor and Caesar to boot as the great Don of Germany, Charles V, was used to divert himself in his dotage by watching the gyrations of the springs and cogs of a long row of clocks. Even so does an elderly commodore while away his leisure in harbor by what is called exercising guns, and also exercising yards and sails, causing the various spars of all the ships under his command to be braced, topped, and cockbilled in concert, while the commodore himself sits something like King Canute 
on an arm chest on the poop of his flagship. But far more regal than any descendant of Charlemagne, more haughty than any mogul of the East, and almost mysterious and voiceless in his authority as the great spirit of the five nations, the Commodore deigns not to verbalize his commands. They are imparted by signal. And as for old Charles V, again the gay pranked colored suit of cards were invented to while away his dotage. Even so, doubtless, must these pretty little signals of blue and red-spotted bunting have been devised to cheer the old age of all Commodores. By the Commodore's side stands the signal midshipman, with a sea-green bag swung on his shoulder as a sportsman bears his game bag, the signal book in one hand and the signal spyglass in the other. As his signal book contains the Masonic signs and tokens of the Navy, and would therefore be invaluable to an enemy, its binding is always bordered with lead, so as to ensure its sinking in case the ship should be captured. Not the only book this that might appropriately be bound in lead, though there be many where the author and not the bookbinder furnishes the metal. As White Jacket understands it, these signals consist of variously colored flags, each standing for a certain number. Say there are ten flags, representing the cardinal numbers, the red flag number one, the blue flag number two, the green flag number three, and so forth. Then by mounting the blue flag over the red, that would stand for number 21. If the green flag were set underneath it, it would stand for 213. How easy then, by endless transpositions, to multiply the various numbers that may be exhibited at the mizzen peak, even by only three or four of these flags. To each number, a particular meaning is applied. Number 100, for instance, may mean beat to quarters. Number 150, all hands to grog. Number 2000, strike top gallant yards. Number 2110, see anything to windward? Number 2800, no. And as every man of war is furnished with a signal book, where all things are set down in order, therefore, though two American frigates, almost perfect strangers to each other, came from the opposite poles, yet at a distance of more than a mile they carry on a very liberal conversation in the air. When several men of war of one nation lie at anchor in one port, forming a wide circle round their lord and master, the flagship, it is a very interesting sight to see them all obeying the Commodore's orders, who meanwhile never opens his lips. Thus was it with us in Rio, and hereby hangs the story of my poor messmate Bali. One morning, in obedience to a signal from our flagship, the various vessels belonging to the American squadron then in harbor simultaneously loosened their sails to dry. In the evening, the signal was set to furl upon them. Upon such occasions, great rivalry exists between the first lieutenants of the different ships. They vie with each other. Who shall first have his sails stowed on the yards? And this rivalry is shared between all the officers of each vessel, who are respectively placed over the different top men, so that the main mast is all eagerness to vanquish the foremast, and the mizzen mast to vanquish them both. Stimulated by the shouts of their officers, the sailors throughout the squadron exert themselves to the utmost. Aloft, top men, lay out, furl, cried the first lieutenant of the Never Sink. At the word, the men sprang into the rigging, and on all three masts were soon climbing out about the yards, in reckless haste to execute their orders. Now, in furling topsails or courses, the point of honor and the hardest work is in the blunt or middle of the yard. This post belongs to the first captain of the top. What are you, bout there, mizzen top men, roared the first lieutenant through his trumpet. Damn you, you are clumsy as Russian bears. Don't you see the main, top men, are nearly off the yard? Bear a hand, bear a hand, or I'll stop your grog all round. You, Baldy, are you going to sleep there in the bunt? While this was being said, poor Baldy, his hat off, his face streaming with perspiration, was frantically exerting himself, piling up the ponderous folds of canvas in the middle of the yard. Ever and anon glancing at victorious Jack Chase, hard at work at the main top sail yard before him. At last, the sail being well piled up, Baldy jumped with both feet into the bunt, holding on with one hand to the chain, tie, and in that manner was violently treading down the canvas to pack it close. Damn you, Baldy, why don't you move, you crawling caterpillar, roared the first lieutenant. Baldy brought his whole weight to bear on the rebellious sail, and in his frenzied heedlessness, let go his hold on the tie. You, Baldy, are you afraid of falling? cried the first lieutenant. At that moment, with all his force, Baldy jumped down upon the sail, 
the bunt gasket parted, and a dark form dropped through the air. Lighting upon the top rim, it rolled off, and the next instant, with a horrid crash of all his bones, Baldy came like a thunderbolt upon the deck. Aboard of most large men of war, there is a stout oaken platform, about four feet square on each side of the quarter deck. You ascend to it by three or four steps. On top, it is railed at the sides with horizontal brass bars. This is called the horse block, and there the officer of the deck usually stands in giving his orders at sea. It was one of these horse blocks, now unoccupied, that broke poor Baldy's fall. He fell lengthwise across the brass bars, bending them into elbows, and crushing the whole oaken platform, steps and all, right down to the deck in a thousand splinters. He was picked up for dead and carried below to the surgeon. His bones seemed like those of a man's broken on the wheel, and no one thought he would survive the night. But with the surgeon's skillful treatment, he soon promised recovery. Surgeon Cuticle devoted all his science to this case. A curious framework of wood was made for the main man, and placed in this, with all his limbs stretched out, Baldy lay flat on the floor of the sick bay for many weeks. Upon our arrival home, he was able to hobble ashore on crutches, but from a hale, hearty man with bronze cheeks, he was become a mere dislocated skeleton, white as foam. But ere this, perhaps his broken bones are healed and whole in the last repose of a man of war's man. Not many days after Baldy's accident and furling sails, in this same frenzied manner, under the stimulus of a shouting officer, a seaman fell from the main royal yard of an English line of battleship near us and buried his ankle bones in the deck, leaving two indentations there, as if scooped out by a carpenter's gouge. The royal yards form a cross with the mast, and falling from that lofty cross in a line of battleship is almost like falling from the cross of St. Paul's, almost like falling as Lucifer from the wellspring of morning down to the phlegathon of night. In some cases, a man, hurled thus from a yard, has fallen upon his own shipmates in the tops and dragged them down with him to the same destruction with himself. Hardly ever will you hear of a man of war returning home after a cruise without the loss of some of her crew from aloft, whereas similar accidents in the merchant service, considering the much greater number of men employed in it, are comparatively few. Why mince the matter? The death of most of these man of war's men lies at the doors of the souls of those officers, who, while safely standing on deck themselves, scruple not to sacrifice an immortal man or two in order to show off the excelling discipline of the ship. And thus do the people of the gun deck suffer, that the commodore on the poop may be glorified. Chapter 47 An Auction in a Man of War some allusion has been made to the weariness experienced by the man-of-war's men while lying at anchor, but there are scenes now and then that serve to relieve it. Chief among these are the purser's auctions, taking place while in harbor. Some weeks or perhaps months after a sailor dies in an armed vessel, his bag of clothes is in this manner sold, and the proceeds transferred to the account of his heirs or executors. One of these auctions came off in Rio shortly after the sad accident of Baldi. It was a dreamy, quiet afternoon, and the crew were listlessly lying around, when suddenly, the boatswain's whistle was heard, followed by the announcement, Do you hear there, fore and aft, purser's auction on the spar deck? At the sound, the sailors sprang to their feet and mustered round the mainmast. Presently, up came the purser's steward, marshalling before him three or four of his subordinates, carrying several clothes bags, which were deposited at the base of the mast. Our purser's steward was a rather gentlemanly man in his way. Like many young Americans of his class, he had at various times assumed the most opposite functions for a livelihood, turning from one to the other with all the facility of a light-hearted, clever adventurer. He had been a clerk in a steamer on the Mississippi River, an auctioneer in Ohio, a stock actor in the Olympic Theater in New York, and now he was purser's steward in the Navy. In the course of this diversified career, his natural wit and waggery had been highly spiced and every way improved and he had acquired the last and most difficult art of the Joker, the art of lengthening his own face while widening those of his hearers, preserving the utmost solemnity while setting them all in a roar. He was quite a favorite with the sailors, which in a good degree was owing to his humor, but likewise to his offhand, irresistible, romantic, theatrical manner of addressing them. With a dignified air, he now mounted the pedestal of the main top sail sheet bits, imposing silence by a theatrical wave of his hand. Meantime, his subordinates were rummaging the bags and assorting their contents before him. 
Now, my noble hearties, he began, we will open this auction by offering to your impartial competition a very superior pair of old boots. And so saying, he dangled aloft one clumsy cowhide cylinder, almost as large as a fire bucket, as a specimen of the complete pair. What shall I have now, my noble tars, for the superior pair of sea boots? Where's the other boot? cried a suspicious eyed waster. I remember them air boots. They were old Bob's, the quarter gunners. There was two on em, too. I want to see the other boot. My sweet and pleasant fellow, said the auctioneer with the blandest accents, the other boot is not just at hand, but I give you my word of honor that in all respects corresponds to the one you see here. It does, I assure you. And I solemnly guarantee, my noble seafaring fincibles, he added, turning round upon all, that the other boot is the exact counterpart of this. Now then, say the word, my fine fellows, what shall I have? Ten dollars, did you say? Politely bowing towards some indefinite person in the background. No, ten cents, responded a voice. Ten cents, ten cents, gallant sailors, for this noble pair of boots, exclaimed the auctioneer with affected horror. I must close the auction. My tars of Columbia, this will never do. But let's have another bid. Come, now, he added, coaxingly and soothingly. What is it, one dollar? One dollar, then, one dollar, going at one dollar, going, 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 just see how it vibrates, swinging the boot to and fro, the superior pair of sea boots vibrating at one dollar, wouldn't pay for the nails in their heels, going, going, gone, and down went the boots, ah, what a sacrifice, what a sacrifice, he sighed, tearfully eyeing the solitary fire bucket, and then glancing round the company for sympathy, a sacrifice indeed, exclaimed Jack Chase, who stood by, Purser Steward, you are Mark Antony over the body of Julius Caesar. So I am, so I am, said the executioner without moving a muscle. And look, he exclaimed, suddenly seizing the boot and exhibiting it on high. Look, my noble tars, if you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all do know this boot. I remember the first time ever old Bob put it on. T'was on a winter evening off Cape Horn between the starboard carronades. That day his precious grog was stopped. Look. In this place a mouse has nibbled through. See what a rent some envious rat has made. Through this another filed. And as he plucked his cursed rasp away, mark how the bootleg gaped. This was the unkindest cut of all. But whose are the boots? Suddenly assuming a businesslike air. Yours? 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 But not a friend of the lamented Bob stood by. Tars of Columbia, said the auctioneer imperatively. These boots must be sold, and if I can't sell them one way, I must sell them another. How much a pound now for the superior pair of old boots? Going by the pound now, remember, my gallant sailors, what shall I have? One cent, do I hear? Going now at one cent a pound, going, 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 gone. Whose are they? Yours, Captain of the Waste? Well, my sweet and pleasant friend, I will have them weighed out to you when the auction is over. In like manner, all the contents of the bag were disposed of, embracing old frocks, trousers, and jackets, the various sums for which they went being charged to the bidders on the books of the purser. Having been present at this auction, though not a purchaser, and seeing with what facility the most dismantled old garments went off, through the magic cleverness of the accomplished auctioneer, the thought occurred to me that if I ever calmly and positively decided to dispose of my famous white jacket, this would be the very way to do it. I turned the matter over in my mind a long time. The weather in Rio was genial and warm, and that I would ever again need such a thing as a heavy quilted jacket, and such a jacket as the white one too, seemed almost impossible. Yet I remembered the American coast, and that it would probably be autumn when we arrived there. Yes, I thought of all that, to be sure. Nevertheless, the ungovernable whim seized me to sacrifice my jacket and recklessly abide the consequences. Besides, was it not a horrible jacket? To how many annoyances had it subjected me? How many scrapes had it dragged me into? Nay, had it not once jeopardized my very existence? And I had a dreadful presentiment that if I persisted in retaining it, it would do so again. Enough, I will sell it, I muttered. And so muttering, I thrust my hands further down in my waistband and walked the main top in the stern concentration of an inflexible purpose. Next day, hearing that another auction was shortly to take place, I repaired to the office of the purser's steward with whom I was upon rather friendly terms. After vaguely and delicately hinting at the object of my visit, I came roundly to the point and asked him whether he could slip my jacket into one of the bags of clothes next to be sold, and so dispose of it by public auction. He kindly acquiesced, and the thing was done. In due time, all hands were again summoned round the main mast, 
The purser steward mounted his post, and the ceremony began. Meantime, I lingered out of sight, but still within hearing on the gun deck below, gazing up unperceived at the scene. As it is now so long ago, I will here frankly make confession that I had privately retained the services of a friend, Williams, the Yankee pedagogue and peddler, whose business it would be to linger near the scene of the auction, and if the bids on the jacket loitered, to start it roundly himself, and if the bidding then became brisk, he was continually to strike in with the most pertinacious and infatuated bids, and so exasperate competition into the maddest and most extravagant overtures. A variety of other articles having been put up, the white jacket was slowly produced and held high aloft between the auctioneer's thumb and forefinger, was submitted to the inspection of the discriminating public. Here it behooves me once again to describe my jacket, for as a portrait taken at one period of life will not answer for a later stage, much more this jacket of mine, undergoing so many changes, needs to be painted again and again in order to truly present its actual appearance at any given period. A premature old age had now settled in upon it. All over it bore melancholy sears of the masoned-up pockets that had once trenched it in various directions. Some parts of it were slightly mildewed from dampness, and on one side several of the buttons were gone, and others were broken or cracked, while, alas, my many mad endeavors to rub it black on the decks had now imparted to the whole garment an exceedingly untidy appearance. Such as it was, with all its faults, the actioneer displayed it. You, venerable sheet anchor men, and you, gallant foretop men, and you, my fine wasters, what do you say now for this superior old jacket? Buttons and sleeves, lining and skirts, it must this day be sold without reservation. How much for it, my gallant tars of Columbia? Say the word, and how much? My eyes, exclaimed a foretop man, don't that air bunch of old swabs belong to Jack Chase's pet? Aren't that the white jacket? The white jacket, cried fifty voices in response. The white jacket! The cry ran fore and aft the ship like a slogan, completely overwhelming the solitary voice of my private friend Williams. While all hands gazed at it with straining eyes, wondering how it came among the bags of deceased mariners. Aye, noble tars, said the auctioneer, you may well stare at it. You will not find another jacket like this on either side of Cape Horn, I assure you. Why, just look at it. How much now? Give me a bid, but don't be rash. Be prudent. Be prudent, men. Remember, your purser's accounts, and don't be betrayed into extravagant bids. Purser steward, cried Gummet, one of the quarter gunners, slowly shifting his quid from one cheek to the other like a ballast stone. I won't bid on that air bunch of swabs unless you put up ten pounds of soap with it. Don't mind that old fellow, said the auctioneer. How much for the jacket, my noble tars? Jacket, cried a dandy bone polisher of the gun room. The sailmaker was the tailor then. How many fathoms of canvas in it, purser steward? How much for this jacket, reiterated the auctioneer emphatically. Jacket, do you call it, cried a captain of the hold. Why not call it a whitewashed man of war schooner? Look at that porthole to let in air of cold nights. A regular heron net, chimed in Grummet. Gives me the fever now just looking at it, echoed a mizzen top man. Silence, cried the auctioneer. Start it now. Start it, boys. Anything you please, my fine fellows. It must be sold. Come, what ought I have on it now? Why, purser steward, cried a waster. You've ought to have new sleeves, a new lining, and a new body on it, afore you try to shove it off on a greenhorn. What are you bussing that air garment for, cried an old sheet anchor man. Don't you see it's a uniform muster and jacket? Three buttons on one side and none on the other? Silence, again cried the auctioneer. How much, my sea fencibles, for this superior old jacket? Well, said Grummet, I'll take it for cleaning rags at one cent. Oh, come give us a bid, say something, Columbians. Well then, said Grummet, all at once bursting into genuine indignation. If you want us to say something, then heave that bunch of old swabs overboard, say I, and show us something worth looking at. No one will give me a bid? Very good, here, shove it aside. Let's have something else there. While this scene was going forward and my white jacket was thus being abused, how my heart swelled within me. Thrice was I on the point of rushing out of my hiding place and bearing it off from derision. But I lingered, still flattering myself that all would be well and the jacket find a purchaser at last. But no, alas, there was no getting rid of it except by rolling a 42-pound shot in it and committing it to the deep. But though in my desperation I had once contemplated something of that sort, yet I had now become unaccountably averse to it from certain involuntary superstitious considerations. If I sink my jacket, thought I, it will be sure to spread itself into a bed at the bottom of the sea, upon which I shall sooner or later recline, a dead man. 
so unable to conjure it into the possession of another and withheld from burying it out of sight forever, my jacket stuck to me like the fatal shirt on Nessus. Chapter 48 Purser, Purser Stewards, and Postmaster in a Man of War As the Purser Steward so conspicuously figured at the unsuccessful auction of my jacket, it reminds me of how important a personage that official is on board of an all-men of war. He is the right-hand man and confidential deputy and clerk of the purser, who entrusts to him all his accounts with the crew, while in most cases he himself, snug and comfortable in his stateroom, glances over a file of newspapers instead of overhauling his ledgers. Of all the non-combatants of a man of war, the purser, perhaps, stands foremost in importance, though... He is but a member of the gunroom mess, yet usage seems to assign him a conventional station, somewhat above that of his equals in navy rank, the chaplain, surgeon, and professor. Moreover, he is frequently to be seen in close conversation with the commodore, who in the never sink was more than once known to be slightly jocular with our purser. Upon several occasions also he was called into the commodore's cabin and remained closeted there for several minutes together. Nor do I remember that there ever happened a cabinet meeting of the wardroom barons, the lieutenants, in the commodore's cabin, but the purser made one of the party. Doubtless the important fact of the purser having under his charge all the financial affairs of a man of war imparts to him the great importance he enjoys. Indeed, we find it in every government, monarchies and republics alike, that the personage at the head of the finances invariably occupies a commanding position. Thus, in point of station, the Secretary of the Treasury of the United States is deemed superior to the other heads of departments. Also, in England, the real office held by the greater Premier himself, as everyone knows, that of First Lord of the Treasury. Now, under this high functionary of states, the official known as the Purser Steward was head clerk of the Frigid's Fiscal Affairs. Upon the berth deck, he had a regular counting room, full of ledgers, journals, and daybooks. His desk was as much littered with papers as any Pearl Street merchant's, and much time was devoted to his accounts. For hours together you would see him, through the window of his subterranean office, writhing by the light of his perpetual lamp. Ex officio, the purser steward of most ships, is a sort of postmaster, and his office the post office. When the letter bags for the squadron, almost as large as those of the United States mail, arrive on board the Neversink, it was the purser's steward that sat at his little window on the berth deck and handed you your letter or paper, if any there were to your address. Some disappointed applicants among the sailors would offer to buy the epistles of their more fortunate shipmates, while yet the seal was unbroken, maintaining that the sole and confidential reading of a fond, long domestic letter from any man's home was far better than no letter at all. In the vicinity of the office of the purser's steward are the principal storerooms of the purser, where large quantities of goods of every description are to be found. On board of those ships were goods permitted to be served out to the crew for the purpose of selling them ashore to raise money. More business is transacted at the office of a purser steward in one Liberty Day morning than all the dry goods shops in a considerable village would transact in a week. Once a month, with undeviating regularity, this official has his hands more than usually full. For once a month, certain printed bills, called mess bills, are circulated among the crew, and whatever you may want from the purser, be it tobacco, soap, duck, dungaree, needles, thread, knives, belts, calico, ribbon, pipes, paper, pens, hats, ink, shoes, socks, or whatever it may be, down it goes on the mess bill, which, being the next day returned to the office of the steward, the slops, as they are called, are served out to the men and charged to their accounts. Lucky is it for man of war's men that the outrageous impositions to which, but a very few years ago, they were subjected from the abuses in this department of the service, and the unscrupulous cupidity of many of the pursers. Lucky is it for them that now these things are in the great degree done away. The pursers, instead of being at liberty to make almost what they pleased from their sale of the wares, are now paid by regular stipends laid down by law. Under the exploded system, the profits of some of these officers were almost incredible. In one cruise up the Mediterranean, the purser of an American line of battle ship was on a good authority, said to have cleared the sum of $50,000. Upon that, he quitted the service and retired into the country. Shortly after, his three daughters, not very lovely, married extremely well. The idea that sailors entertain of pursers is expressed in a rather inelegant but expressive saying of theirs. The purser is a conjurer. 
he can make a dead man chew tobacco. Insinuating that the accounts of dead men are sometimes subjected to post-mortem charges. Among sailors also, pursers commonly go by the name of nip cheeses. No wonder that on board of the old frigid Java, upon her return from a cruise extending over a period of more than four years, $1,000 paid off 80 of her crew. Though the aggregate wages of the 80 for the voyage must have amounted to about $60,000 even under the present system. The purser of a line of battleship, for instance, is far better paid than any other officer, short of captain or commodore. While the lieutenant commonly receives but $1,800, the surgeon of the fleet but $1,500, the chaplain $1,200, the purser of a line of battleship receives $3,500. In considering his salary, however, his responsibilities are not to be overlooked. They are by no means insignificant. There are pursers in the navy, whom the sailors exempt from the insinuations above mentioned, nor, as a class, are they so obnoxious to them now as formerly. For one, the florid old purser of the Never Sink, never coming into disciplinary contact with the seamen, and being withal a jovial and apparently good-hearted gentleman, was something of a favorite with many of the crew. Chapter 49 Rumors of a war and how they were received by the population of the Neversink. While lying in the harbor of Calau in Peru, certain rumors had come to us touching a war with England, growing out of the long-vexed northeastern boundary question. In Rio, these rumors were increased, and the probability of hostilities induced our Commodore to authorize proceedings that closely brought home to every man on board the Neversink his liability at any time to be killed at his gun. Among other things, a number of men were detailed to pass up the rusty cannonballs from the shot lockers in the hold and scrape them clean for service. The Commodore was a very neat gentleman and would not fire a dirty shot into his foe. It was an interesting occasion for a tranquil observer, nor was it altogether neglected, not to recite the precise remarks made by the seamen while pitching the shot up the hatchway from hand to hand like schoolboys playing ball ashore. It will be enough to say that from the general drift of their discourse, jocular as it was, it was manifest that almost to a man they abhorred the idea of going into action. And why should they desire a war? Would their wages be raised? Not a cent. The prize money, though, ought to have been an inducement. But of all the rewards of virtue, prize money is the most uncertain. And this the man of war's man knows. What, then, has he to expect from war? What but harder work and harder usage than in peace? a wooden leg or arm, mortal wounds and death? Enough, however, that by far the majority of the common sailors of the Never Sink were plainly concerned at the prospect of war and were plainly averse to it. But with the officers of the quarter-deck, it was just the reverse. None of them, to be sure, in my hearing at least, verbally expressed their gratification, but it was unavoidably betrayed by the increased cheerfulness in their demeanor towards each other, their frequent fraternal conferences, and their unwanted animation for several clays in issuing their orders. The voice of Mad Jack, always a belfry to hear, now resounded like that famous bell of England, Great Tom of Oxford. As for Selvagy, he wore his sword with a jaunty air, and his servant daily polished the blade. But why this contrast between the forecastle and the quarter-deck, between the man-of-war's man and his officer? Because though war would equally jeopardize the lives of both, yet, while it held out to the sailor no promise of promotion and what is called glory, these things fired the breasts of the officers. It is no pleasing task, nor a thankful one, to dive into the souls of some men, but there are occasions when to bring up the mud from the bottom reveals to us on what soundings we are and what coast we adjoin. How were these officers to gain glory? How but by a distinguished slaughtering of their fellow men? How were they promoted? How but over the buried heads of killed comrades and messmates? This hostile contrast between the feelings with which the common seamen and the officers of the Never Sink looked forward to this more than possible war is one of the many instances that might be quoted to show the antagonism of their interests, the incurable antagonism in which they dwell. But can men whose interests are diverse ever hope to live together in a harmony uncoerced? Can the brotherhood of the race, of mankind, ever hope to prevail in a man of war, where one man's bane is another man's blessing. By abolishing the scourge shall we do away with tyranny? That tyranny which must ever prevail, whereof two essentially antagonistic classes in perpetual contact, one is immeasurably the stronger. Surely it seems all but impossible, and as the very object of a man of war, as its name implies, is to fight the very battles so naturally averse to the seamen, 
So long as a man of war exists, it must ever remain a picture of much that is tyrannical and repelling in human nature. Being an establishment much more extensive than the American Navy, the English Armed Marine furnishes a yet more striking example of this thing, especially as the existence of war produces so vast an augmentation of her naval force compared with what it is in time of peace. It is well known what joy the news of Bonaparte's sudden return from Elba created among crowds of British naval officers who had previously been expecting to be sent ashore on half pay. Thus, when all the world wailed, these officers found occasion for thanksgiving. I urge it not against them as men. Their feelings belong to their profession. Had they not been naval officers, they had not been rejoicers in the midst of despair. When shall the time come? How much longer will God postpone it, when the clouds which at times gather over the horizons of nations shall not be hailed by any class of humanity and invoked to burst as a bomb? Standing navies as well as standing armies serve to keep alive the spirit of war even in the meek heart of peace. In its very embers and smolderings they nourish that fatal fire, and half pay officers as the priests of Mars, yet guard the temples, though no god be there. Chapter 50 The Bay of All Beauties I have said that I must pass over Rio without a description, but just now such a flood of scented reminiscences steals over me that I must needs yield and recant as I inhale that musky air. More than 150 miles circuit of living green hills and bosoms, a translucent expanse, so gemmed in by sierras of grass that among the Indian tribes the place was known as the Hidden Water. On all sides in the distance rise high conical peaks, which at sunrise and sunset burn like vast tapers, and down from the interior, through vineyards and forests, flow radiating streams, all emptying into the harbor. Talk not of Bahia de Toros o Santos, the Bay of All Saints, for though that be a glorious haven, yet Rio is the Bay of All Rivers, the Bay of All Delights, the Bay of All Beauties. From circumjacent hillsides, untiring summer hangs perpetually in terraces of vivid verdure, and embossed with old mosses, convent, and castle nestle in valley and glen. All round, deep inlets run into the green mountain land, and overhung with wild highlands more resemble Loch Katrina's than Lake Lemons, and though Loch Katrina has been sung by the bonneted Scot and Lake Leman by the coroneted Byron, yet here in Rio both the loch and the lake are but two wildflowers in a prospect that is almost unlimited. For behold, far away and away stretches the broad blue of the water, to yonder soft swelling hills of light green backed by the purple pinnacles and pipes of the Grand Organ Mountains, fitly so called. For in thunder time they roll cannonades down the bay, drowning the blended bass of all the cathedrals in Rio. Shout amain, exalt your voices, stamp your feet, jubilate, Oregon mountains, and roll your te deums round the world. What though for more than 5,500 years this grand harbor of Rio lay hid in the hills, unknown by the Catholic Portuguese? Centuries ere Hayden performed before emperors and kings, these Oregon mountains played his oratorio of the creation before the Creator Himself. But nervous Hayden could not have endured that cannonading choir, since this composer of thunderbolts himself died at last through the crashing commotion of Napoleon's bombardment of Vienna. But all mountains are organ mountains, the Alps and the Himalayas, the Appalachian Chain, the Ural, the Andes, the Green Hills and the White. All of them play anthems forever, the Messiah and Samson and Israel and Egypt, and Saul and Judas Maccabeus and Solomon. Archipelago Rio, ere Noah and old Ararat anchored his ark. There lay anchored in you all these green, rocky isles I now see. But God did not build on you, isles, those long lines of batteries, nor did our blessed Savior stand godfather at the christening of yon frowning fortress of Santa Cruz, though named in honor of himself, the divine prince of peace. Amphitheatrical Rio, in your broad expanse might be held the resurrection and judgment day of the whole world's men of war, represented by the flagships of fleets, the flagships of the Phoenician armed galleys of Tyre and Sidon, of King Solomon's annual squadrons that sailed to Ophir, whence in after times, perhaps, sailed the Acapulco fleets of the Spaniards, with golden ingots for ballasting. The flagships of all the Greek and Persian craft that exchanged the war hug at Salamis, of all the Roman and Egyptian galleys that, eagle-like with blood-dripping prows, beaked each other at Actium, 
of all the Danish keels of the Vikings, of all the mosquito craft of Abathul, king of Pelaz, when he went to vanquish Artensal, of all the Venetian, Gonis, and Papal fleets that came to the shock at Lepanto, of both horns of the crescent of the Spanish Armada, of the Portuguese squadron that, under the gallant Gama, chastised the Moors and discovered the Moluccas, of all the Dutch navies read by Van Tromp and sunk by Admiral Hawke, of the 47 French and Spanish sail of the line that for three months essayed to batter down Gibraltar, of all Nelson's 74s that thunderbolted off St. Vincent's at the Nile, Copenhagen, and Trafalgar, and of all the frigid merchantmen of the East India Company, of Perry's war brigs, sloops, and schooners that scattered the British armament on Lake Erie, of all the Barbary corsairs captured by Bainbridge, of the war canoes of the Polynesian kings, Tamahamaha and Pomerae, one and all, with Commodore Noah for their Lord High Admiral, and this abounding bay of Rio, these flagships might all come to anchor and swing round in concert to the first of the flood. Rio is a small Mediterranean, and what was fabled of the entrance to that sea? In Rio is partly made true. For here at the mouth stands one of Hercules's pillars, the Sugarloaf Mountain, 1,000 feet high, inclining over a little like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. At its base crouch like mastiffs the batteries of Jose and Teriosa, while opposite you are menaced by a rock-founded fort. The channel between, the sole inlet to the bay, seems but a biscuit's toss over. You see naught of the landlocked sea within till fairly in the strait. But then what a sight is beheld, diversified as the harbor of Constantinople, but a thousandfold grander. When the Neversink swept in, word was passed, aloft top men in furl the gallant sails and royals. At the sound I sprang into the rigging and was soon at my perch. How I hung over that main royal yard in a rapture high in air, poised over that magnificent bay a new world to my ravished eyes. I felt like the foremost of a flight of angels, new lighted upon earth from some star in the Milky Way. Chapter 51 One of the people has an audience with the Commodore and the captain on the quarter deck. We had not lain in Rio long, when in the innermost recesses of the mighty soul of my noble captain of the top, incomparable Jack Chase, the deliberate opinion was formed and rock-founded that our ship's company must have at least one day's liberty to go ashore ere we weighed anchor for home. Here it must be mentioned that concerning anything of this kind, no sailor in a man of war ever presumes to be an agitator, unless he is of a rank superior to a mere able seaman, and no one short of a petty officer, that is, a captain of the top, a quarter gunner, or boatswain's mate, ever dreams of being a spokesman to the supreme authority of the vessel in soliciting any kind of favor for himself and shipmates. After canvassing the matter thoroughly with several old quartermasters and other dignified sea fencibles, Jack, hat in hand, made his appearance one fine evening at the mast, and waiting till Captain Claret drew nigh, bowed and addressed him in his own offhand polished and political style. In his intercourse with the quarter-deck he always presumed upon his being such a universal favorite. Sir, this Rio is a charming harbor, and we poor mariners, your trusty sea warriors, valiant captain, who with you at their head would board the rock of Gibraltar itself and carry it by storm. We poor fellows, valiant captain, have gazed round upon this ravishing landscape till we can gaze no more. Will Captain Claret vouchsafe one day's liberty, and so assure himself of eternal felicity? since in our flowing cups he will be ever after freshly remembered? As Jack thus rounded off with a snatch from Shakespeare, he saluted the captain with a gallant flourish of his tarpaulin, and then bringing the rim to his mouth with his head bowed and his body thrown into a fine negligent attitude, stood a picture of eloquent but passive appeal. He seemed to say, Magnanimous Captain Claret, we fine fellows in hearts of oak, throw ourselves upon your unparalleled goodness. And what do you want to go ashore for? asked the captain evasively, trying to conceal his admiration of Jack by affecting some haughtiness. Ah, sir, sighed Jack, why do the thirsty camels of the desert desire to lap the waters of the fountain and roll in the green grass of the oasis? Are we not but just from the ocean Sahara? And is not this Rio a verdant spot, noble captain? Surely you will not keep us always tethered at anchor, when a little more cable would admit of our cropping the herbage. 
And it is a weary thing, Captain Claret, to be in prison month after month on the gun deck without so much as smelling a citron. Ah, Captain Claret, what sings, sweet Waller? But who can always on the billows lie? The watery wilderness yields no supply. Compared with such a prisoner, noble captain, happy, thrice happy, who in battle slain, pressed in a treatise, caused the Trojan pain. Pope's version, sir, not the original Greek. And so saying, Jack once more brought his hat rim to his mouth, and slightly bending forward, stood mute. At this juncture, the most serene Commodore himself managed to emerge from the after gangway, his gilded buttons, epaulets, and the gold lace on his chapeau glittering in the flooding sunset, attracted by the scene between Captain Claret and so well-known and admired a commoner as Jack Chase he approached, and assuming for the moment an air of pleasant condescension, never shown to his noble barons, the officers of the wardroom, he said with a smile, Well, Jack, you and your shipmates are after some favor, I suppose. A day's liberty, is it not? Whether it was the horizontal setting sun streaming along the deck that blinded Jack, or whether it was in sun-worshipping homage of the mighty Commodore, there was no telling. But just at this juncture, noble Jack was standing reverentially holding his hat to his brow, like a man with weak eyes. Valiant Commodore, said he at last, this audience is indeed an honor undeserved. I almost sink beneath it. Yes, valiant Commodore, your sagacious mind has truly divined our object. Liberty, sir, liberty is indeed our humble prayer. I trust your honorable wound, received in glorious battle, valiant Commodore, pains you less today than common? Ah, cunning Jack, cried the Commodore, by no means blind to the bold sortie of his flattery, but not at all displeased with it. In more respects than one, our Commodore's wound was his weak side. I think we must give them liberty, he added, turning to Captain Claret, who thereupon, waving Jack further off, fell into confidential discourse with the superior. Well, Jack, we will see about it, at last cried the Commodore, advancing. I think we must let you go. To your duty, Captain of the Main Top, said the Captain, rather stiffly. He wished to neutralize somewhat the effect of the Commodore's condescension. Besides, he had much rather the Commodore had been in his cabin. His presence for the time affected his own supremacy in his ship. But Jack was no wise cast down by the Captain's coldness. He felt safe enough, so he proceeded to offer his acknowledgments. Kind gentlemen, he sighed. Your pains are registered where every day I turn the leaf to read. Macbeth, valiant Commodore and Captain, what the Thane says to the noble lords, Ross and Angus. And long and lingering, bowing to the two noble officers, Jack backed away from their presence, still shading his eyes with the broad rim of his hat. Jack Chase forever, cried his shipmates, as he carried the grateful news of liberty to them on the forecastle. Who can talk to Commodores like our matchless Jack? Chapter 52. Something Concerning Midshipmen It was the next morning after Matchless Jack's interview with the Commodore and Captain that a little incident occurred, soon forgotten by the crew at large but long remembered by the few seamen who were in the habit of closely scrutinizing everyday proceedings. Upon the face of it, it was but a common event, at least in a man of war, the flogging of a man at the gangway. But the undercurrent of circumstances in the case were of a nature that magnified this particular flogging into a matter of no small importance. The story itself cannot here be related. It would not well bear recital. Enough that the person flogged was a middle-aged man of the waist, a forlorn, broken-down, miserable object, truly. One of those wretched landsmen sometimes driven into the navy by their unfitness for all things else, even as others are driven into the workhouse. He was flogged at the complaint of a midshipman, and hereby hangs the drift of the thing. For though this waster was so ennoble a mortal, yet this being scourged on this one occasion indirectly proceeded from the mere wanton spite and unscrupulousness of the midshipman in question, a youth who was apt to indulge at times in undignified familiarities with some of the men, who, sooner or later, almost always suffered from his capricious preferences. But the leading principle that was involved in this affair is far too mischievous to be lightly dismissed. In most cases, it would seem to be a cardinal principle with the Navy captain that his subordinates are disintegrated parts of himself, detached from the main body on special service, and that the order of the minutest midshipmen must be as deferentially obeyed by the seamen as a proceeding from the Commodore on the poop. This principle was once emphasized in a remarkable manner by the valiant and handsome Sir Peter Parker, 
upon whose death on a national arson expedition on the shores of Chesapeake Bay in 1812 or 1813, Lord Byron wrote his well-known stanzas. By the god of war, said Sir Peter to his sailors, I'll make you touch your hat to a midshipman's coat if it's only hung on a broomstick to dry. That the king in the eye of the law can do no wrong is the well-known fiction of despotic states, but it has remained for the navies of constitutional monarchies and republics to magnify this fiction by indirectly extending it to all the quarter-deck subordinates of an armed ship's chief magistrate. And though judicially unrecognized and unacknowledged by the officers themselves, yet this is the principle that pervades the fleet. This is the principle that is every hour acted upon, and to sustain which thousands of seamen have been flogged at the gangway. However childish, ignorant, stupid, or idiotic a midshipman, if he but orders a sailor to perform even the most absurd action, that man is not only bound to render instant and unanswering obedience, but he would refuse at his peril. And if having obeyed, he should then complain to the captain, and the captain in his own mind should be thoroughly convinced of the impropriety, perhaps of the illegality of the order, yet in nine cases out of ten, he would not publicly reprimand the midshipman, nor by the slightest token admit before the complainant that, in this particular thing, the midshipman had done otherwise than perfectly right. Upon a midshipman's complaining of a seaman to Lord Collingwood, when captain of the line of battle ship, he ordered the man for punishment, and in the interval, calling the midshipman aside, said to him, In all probability, now the fault is yours. You know, therefore, when the man is brought to the mast, you had better ask for his pardon. Accordingly, upon the lad's public intercession, Collingwood, turning to the culprit, said, This young gentleman has pleaded so humanely for you, that, in hope you feel a due gratitude to him for his benevolence, I will for this time overlook your offense. This story is related by the editor of the Admiral's Correspondence to show the Admiral's kind-heartedness. Now, Collingwood was, in reality, one of the most just, humane, and benevolent admirals that ever hoisted a flag. For a sea officer, Collingwood was a man in a million. But if a man like him, swayed by old usages, could thus violate the commonest principle of justice, with however good motives at bottom, what must be expected from other captains not so eminently gifted with noble traits as Collingwood? And if the core of American midshipmen is mostly replenished from the nursery, the counter, and the lap of unrestrained indulgence at home, and if most of them at least, by their impotency as officers, and all important functions at sea, by their boyish and overweening conceit of their gold lace, by their overbearing manner toward the seamen, and by their peculiar aptitude to construe the merest trivialities of manner into set affronts against their dignity, if by all this they sometimes contract the ill will of the seamen, and if in a thousand ways the seamen cannot but betray it, how easy for any of these midshipmen, who may happen to be unrestrained by moral principle, to resort to spiteful practices and procuring vengeance upon the offenders, in many instances to the extremity of the lash. Since, as we have seen it, the tacit principle of the navy seems to be that, in this ordinary intercourse with the sailors, a midshipman can do nothing obnoxious to the public censure of his superiors. You fellow, I'll get you licked before long, is often heard from a midshipman to a sailor who in some way not open to the judicial action of the captain has chanced to offend him. At times, you will see one of these lads, not five feet high, gazing up with inflamed eye at some venerable six-footer of a forecastle man, cursing and insulting him by every epithet deemed most scandalous and unendurable among men. Yet that man's indignant tongue is treble knotted by the law, that suspends death itself over his head, should his passion discharge the slightest blow at the boy worm that spits at his feet. But since what human nature is, and what it must forever continue to be, is well enough understood for most practical purposes, it needs no special example to prove that, where the merest boys indiscriminately snatched from the human family are given such authority over mature men. The results must be proportionable in monstrousness to the custom that authorizes the worse than cruel absurdity. Nor is it unworthy of remark that while the noblest-minded and most heroic sea officers, men of the topmost stature, including Lord Nelson himself, have regarded flogging in the navy with the deepest concern, and not without weighty scruples touching its general necessity, still, one who has seen much of midshipmen can truly say that he has seen but few midshipmen who were not enthusiastic advocates and admirers of scourging. It would almost seem that they themselves, having so recently escaped the posterior discipline of the nursery and the infant school, are impatient to recover from those smarting reminiscences by mincing the backs of full-grown American freemen. 
It should not be omitted here that the midshipmen in the English Navy are not permitted to be quite so imperious as in the American ships. They are divided into three, I think, probationary classes of volunteers, instead of being at once advanced to a warrant. Nor will you fail to remark when you see an English cutter officered by one of those volunteers that the boy does not so strut and slap his dirk hilt with a bobadil air, and anticipatingly feel of the place where his warlike whiskers are going to be, and sputter out oaths so at the men, as is too often the case with the little boys wearing best bower anchors on their lapels in the American Navy. Yet it must be confessed that at times you see midshipmen who are noble little fellows and not at all disliked by the crew. Besides three gallant youths, one black-eyed little lad in particular, in the Neversink, was such a one. From his diminutiveness, he went by the name of Boat Plug among the seamen. Without being exactly familiar with them, he had yet become a general favorite by reason of his kindness of manner and never cursing them. It was amusing to hear some of the older tritons invoke blessings upon the youngster when his kind tones fell on their weather-beaten ears. Ah, good luck to you, sir, touching their hats to the little man. You have a soul to be saved, sir. There was a wonderful deal of meaning involved in the latter sentence. You have a soul to be saved, is the phrase which a man of war's man peculiarly applies to a humane and kind-hearted officer. It also implies that the majority of quarterdeck officers are regarded by them in such a light that they deny to them the possession of souls. Ah, but these plebeians sometimes have a sublime vengeance upon patricians. Imagine an outcast old sailor seriously cherishing the peculiar speculative conceit that some bullies and epaulots who order him to and fro like a slave is of an organization immeasurably inferior to himself, must at last perish with the brutes while he goes on to immortality in heaven. But from what has been said in this chapter, it must not be inferred that a midshipman leads a lord's life in a man of war. Far from it. He lords it over those below him, while lorded over himself by his superiors. It is as if with one hand a schoolboy snapped his fingers at a dog, and at the same time received upon the other the discipline of the usher's funeral. And though by the American Articles of War a Navy captain cannot, of his own authority, legally punish a midshipman otherwise than by suspension from duty, the same is with respect to the wardroom officers, yet this is one of those sea statutes which the captain, to a certain extent, observes or disregards at his pleasure. Many instances might be related of the petty mortifications and official insults inflicted by some captains upon their midshipmen, far more severe in one sense than the old-fashioned punishment of sending them to the masthead, though not so arbitrary as sending them before the mast to do duty with the common sailors, a custom in former times pursued by captains in the English Navy. Captain Claret himself had no special fondness for midshipmen, a tall, overgrown young midshipman, about sixteen years old, having fallen under his displeasure. He interrupted the humble apologies he was making by saying, Not a word, sir. I'll hear not a word. Mount the netting, sir, and stand there till you're ordered to come down. The midshipman obeyed, and in full sight of the entire ship's company, Captain Claret promenaded to and fro below his lofty perch, reading him a most aggravating lecture upon his alleged misconduct. To a lad of sensibility, such treatment must have been almost as stinging as the lash itself would have been. It is to be remembered that wherever these chapters treat of midshipmen, the officers known as past midshipmen are not at all referred to. In the American Navy, these officers form a class of young men who, having seen sufficient service at sea as midshipmen to pass an examination before a board of commodores, are promoted to the rank of past midshipmen, introductory to that of lieutenant. They are supposed to be qualified to do duty as lieutenants, and in some cases temporarily serve as such. The difference between a past midshipman and a midshipman may also be inferred from their respective rates of pay. The former, upon sea service, received $750 a year, the latter $400. There were no past midshipmen in the Neversink. Chapter 53. Seafaring persons peculiarly subject to being under the weather. The effects of this upon a man-of-war captain. It has been said that some midshipmen, in certain cases, are guilty of spiteful practices against the man-of-war's men. But as these midshipmen are presumed to have received the liberal and lofty breeding of gentlemen, it would seem all but incredible that any of their corps could descend to the paltriness of cherishing personal malice against so conventionally degraded a being as a sailor. So indeed it would seem, but when all the circumstances are considered, it will not appear extraordinary that some of them should thus cast discredit upon the warrants they wear. 
Title and rank and wealth and education cannot unmake human nature. The same in cabin boy and commodore. Its only differences lie in the different modes of development. At sea, a frigid houses and homes, 500 mortals in a space so contracted that they can hardly so much as move but they touch. Cut off from all those outward passing things which ashore employ the eyes, tongues, and thoughts of landsmen, the inmates of a frigid are thrown upon themselves and each other, and all their ponderings are introspective. A morbidness of mind is often the consequence, especially upon long voyages, accompanied by foul weather, calms, or headwinds. Nor does this exempt from its evil influence any rank on board. Indeed, high station only ministers to it the more, since the higher the rank in a man of war, the less companionship. It is an odious, unthankful, repugnant thing to dwell upon a subject like this. Nevertheless, be it said that through these jaundiced influences, even the captain of a frigate is in some cases indirectly induced to the infliction of corporal punishment upon a seaman. Never sail under a navy captain, whom you suspect of being dyspeptic or constitutionally prone to hypochondria. The manifestation of these things is sometimes remarkable. In the earlier part of the cruise, while making a long, tedious run from Mazatlan to Kalau on the main, baffled by light headwinds and frequent intermitting calms when all hands were heartily wearied by the torrid, monotonous sea, a good-natured foretop man by the name of Candy, quite a character in his way, standing in the waist among a crowd of seamen, touched me and said, Do you see the old man there, white jacket, walking the poop? Well, don't he look as if he wanted to flog someone? Look at him once. But to me, at least, no such indications were visible in the deportment of the captain, though his thrashing the arm chest with the slack of the spanker out hall looked a little suspicious, but anyone might have been doing that to pass away a calm. Depend on it, said the top man, he must somehow have thought I was making sport of him a while ago, when I was only taking off old priming, the gunner's mate. Just look at him once, white jacket, while I make believe coil this here rope. If there aren't a dozen in that air captain's top lights, my name is Horse Marine. If I could only touch my tile to him now and take my Bible oath on it that I was only taken off priming and not him, he wouldn't have had such hard thoughts of me. But that can't be done. He'd think I meant to insult him. Well, it can't be helped. I suppose I must look out for a baker's dozen afore long. I had an incredulous laugh at this, but two days after, when we were hoisting the main top mast sun sail, and the lieutenant of the watch was reprimanding the crowd of seamen at the halyards for their laziness, for the sail was but just crawling up to its place. Owing to the languor of the men induced by the heat, the captain, who had been impatiently walking the deck, suddenly stopped short, and darting his eyes among the seamen, suddenly fixed them, crying out, You, candy, and be damned to you. You don't pull an ounce, you blackguard. Stand up to that gun, sir. I'll teach you to be grinning over a rope that way, without lending your pound of beef to it. Boatswain's mate, where's your colt? Give that man a dozen. Removing his hat, the boatswain's mate looked into the crowd aghast. The coil rope, usually worn there, was not to be found, but the next instant it slid from the top of his head to the deck. Picking it up and straightening it out, he advanced toward the sailor. Sir, said Candy, touching and retouching his cap to the captain, I was pulling, sir, as much as the rest, sir. I was indeed, sir. Stand up to that gun, cried the captain. Boatswain's mate, do your duty. Three stripes were given. When the captain raised his finger, you! blank. Do you dare stand up to be flogged with your hat on? Take it off, sir, instantly. The phrase used here, where I've inserted a blank, I have neither seen nor written or printed, and should not like to be the first person to introduce it to the public. Candy dropped it on deck. Now go on, boatswain's man, and the sailor received his dozen. With his hand to his back, he came up to me, where I stood among the bystanders, saying, Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, that boatswain's mate, too, had a spite again me. He always thought it was me that set afloat that yarn about his wife in Norfolk. Oh, Lord, just run your hand under my shirt, will you, white jacket? There, didn't he have a spite again me, to raise such bars as them? And my shirt all cut to pieces, too, aren't it, white jacket? Damn me, but these coltings puts the tin in the purse's pocket. Oh, Lord, my back feels as if there was a red-hot gridiron lashed to it. But I told you so, a widow's curse on him, say I. He thought I meant him and not priming. Chapter 54. The People Are Given Liberty Whenever in intervals of mild benevolence or yielding to mere politic dictates, kings and commodores relax the yoke of servitude, they should see to it well that the concession seem not too sudden or unqualified, 
for in the commoner's estimation that might argue feebleness or fear. Hence it was, perhaps, that though Noble Jack had carried the day captive and his audience at the mast, yet more than sixty hours elapsed ere anything official was heard of the liberty his shipmates so earnestly coveted. Some of the people began to growl and grumble. "'It's turned out all gammon, Jack,' said one. "'Blast the Commodore,' cried another. "'He bamboozled you, Jack.' "'Lay on your oars a while,' answered Jack, "'and we shall see. We've struck for liberty, and liberty will have. I'm your tribune, boys. I'm your Rienzi. The Commodore must keep his word.' Next day, about breakfast time, a mighty whistling and piping was heard at the main hatchway, and presently the boatswain's voice was heard. Do you hear there, fore and aft, all you starboard quarter watch, get ready to go ashore on liberty. In a paroxysm of delight, a young mizzen top man, standing by at the time, whipped the tarpaulin from his head and smashed it like a pancake on the deck. Liberty! he shouted, leaping down into the berth deck after his bag. At the appointed hour, the quarter watch mustered round the capstan and with which stood our first Lord of the Treasury and Paymaster General, the Purser, with several goodly buckskin bags of dollars piled up on the capstan. He helped us all round to half a handful or so, and then the boats were manned, and like so many Esterhazes, we were pulled ashore by our shipmates. All their lives, lords may live in listless state, but give the commoners a holiday, and they outlord the Commodore himself. The ship's company were divided into four sections, or quarter watches and only one of which were on shore at a time, the rest remaining to garrison the frigate, the term of liberty for each being twenty-four hours. With Jack Chase and a few other discreet and gentlemanly top men, I went ashore on the first day, with the first quarter watch. Our own little party had a charming time. We saw many fine sights, fell in, as all sailors must, with dashing adventures, but though not a few good chapters might be written on this head, I must again forbear. For in this book I have nothing to do with the shore further than to glance at it, now and then from the water. My man-of-war world alone must supply me with the staple of my matter. I have taken an oath to keep afloat to the last letter of my narrative. Had they all been as punctual as Jack Chase's party, the whole quarter-watch of Liberty Men had been safe on board the frigate at the expiration of the twenty-four hours, but this was not the case. And during the entire day succeeding, the midshipmen and others were engaged in ferreting them out of their hiding places on shore, and bringing them off in scattered detachments to the ship. They came in all imaginable stages of intoxication, some with blackened eyes and broken heads, some still more severely injured, having been stabbed in frays with the Portuguese soldiers. Others, unharmed, were immediately dropped on the gun deck, between the guns, where they lay snoring for the rest of the day. As a considerable degree of license is invariably permitted to a man of war's men just off liberty, and as men of war's men well know this to be the case, they occasionally avail themselves of the privilege to talk very frankly to the officers when they first cross the gangway, taking care, meanwhile, to reel about very industriously, so that there shall be no doubt about their being seriously intoxicated, and altogether non compos for the time. And though but few of them have cause to feign intoxication, yet some individuals may be suspected of enacting a studied part upon these occasions. Indeed, judging by certain symptoms, even when really inebriated, some of the sailors must have previously determined upon their conduct, just as some persons who, before taking the exhilarating gas, secretly make up their minds to perform mad feats while under its influence, which feats consequently come to pass precisely as if the actors were not accountable for them. For several days, while the other quarter watches were given liberty, the Neversink presented a sad scene. She was more like a madhouse than a frigate. The gun deck resounded with frantic fights, shouts, and songs. All visitors from shore were kept at a cable's length. These scenes, however, are nothing to those which have repeatedly been enacted in American man of war on other stations. But the custom of introducing women on board in harbor is now pretty much discontinued, both in the English and American Navy unless a ship, commanded by some dissolute captain, happens to lie in some faraway outlandish port in the Pacific or Indian Ocean. The British line of battleship, Royal George, which in 1782 sunk at her anchors at Spithead, carried down 300 English women, among the 1,000 souls that were drowned on that memorable morning. When at last, after all the mad tumult and contention of liberty, the reaction came, our frigate presented a very different scene. The men looked jaded and wan, lethargic and lazy, and many an old mariner with hand upon abdomen called upon the flagstaff to witness that there were more hot coppers in the Neversink than those in the ship's galley. Such are the lamentable effects of suddenly and completely releasing the people of a man of war from arbitrary discipline. 
it shows that to such liberty, at first, must be administered in small and moderate quantities, increasing with the patient's capacity to make good use of it. Of course, while we lay in Rio, our officers frequently went ashore for pleasure, and as a general thing conducted themselves with propriety. But it is a sad thing to say that as for Lieutenant Mad Jack, he enjoyed himself so delightfully for three consecutive days in the town that upon returning to the ship, he sent his card to the surgeon with his compliments, begging him to drop into his stateroom for the first time he happened to pass that way in the wardroom. But one of our surgeon's mates, a young medico of fine family but slender fortune, must have created by far the strongest impression among the Hidalgos of Rio. He had read Don Quixote, and instead of curing him of his Quixoteism, as it ought to have done, it only made him still more Quixotic. Indeed, there are some natures concerning whose moral maladies the grand maxim of Mr. Similia Similibus Curantar Hanuman does not hold true, since with them, like cures not alike, but only aggravates like. Though, on the other hand, so incurable are the moral maladies of such persons that the antagonist maxim, contraria contraris curantar, often proves equally false. Of a warm tropical day, the surgeon's mate must needs go ashore in his blue cloth boat cloak, wearing it with a gallant Spanish toss over his cavalier shoulder. By noon, he perspired very freely, but then his cloak attracted all eyes, and that was huge satisfaction. Nevertheless, his being knock-kneed and spavined of one leg sorely impaired the effect of his Hidalgo cloak, which, by the way, was somewhat rusty in front, where his chin rubbed against it and a good deal bedraggled all over from his having used it as a counterpane off Cape Horn. As for the midshipmen, there is no knowing what their mamas would have said to their conduct in Rio. Three of them drank a good deal too much, and when they came on board, the captain ordered them to be sewed up in their hammocks, to cut short their obstreperous capers till sober. This shows how unwise it is to allow children yet in their teens to wander so far from home. It more especially illustrates the folly of them giving long holidays in a foreign land, full of seductive dissipation. Port for men, claret for boys, cried Dr. Johnson. Even so, men only should drink the strong drink of travel. Boys should still be kept on milk and water at home. Middies, you may despise your mother's leading strings, but they are the man's ropes, my lads, by which many youngsters have steadied the giddiness of youth and saved themselves from lamentable falls. And middies know this, that as infants, being too early put on their feet, grow up bandy-legged and curtailed of their fair proportions, even so, my dear middies, does it morally prove with some of you who prematurely are sent off to sea. These admonitions are solely addressed to the more diminutive class of midshipmen, those under five feet high and under seven stone in weight. Truly, the records of the steerages of men of war are full of most melancholy examples of early dissipation, disease, disgrace, and death. Answer, ye shades of fine boys, who in the soils of all climes the round world over far away sleep from your homes. Mothers of men, if your hearts have been cast down when your boys have fallen in the way of temptations ashore, how much more bursting your grief! Did you know that those boys were far from your arms, cabin and cribbed in by all manner of iniquities? But this some of you cannot believe. It is perhaps well that it is so. But hold them fast, all those who have not weighed their anchors for the navy round and round, hitch over hitch, bind your leading strings on them, and clinching a ring bolt into your chimney jam. Moor your boys fast, to the best of harbors, the hearthstone. But if youth be giddy, old age is stayed, even as young saplings in the litheness of their limbs toss to their roots in the fresh morning air. But stiff and unyielding with age, mossy trunks never bend. With pride and pleasure be it said, that as for our old Commodore, though he might treat himself to as many liberty days as he pleased, yet throughout our stay in Rio he conducted himself with the utmost discretion. But he was an old, old man, physically, a very small man. His spine was his unloaded musket barrel, not only attenuated, but destitute of a solitary cartridge, and his ribs were as the ribs of a weasel. Besides, he was Commodore of the Fleet, Supreme Lord of the Commons in Blue. It beseemed him, therefore, to erect himself into an ensemble of virtue, and show the gun deck what virtue was. But alas, when virtue sits high aloft on a frigid's poop, when virtue is crowned in the cabin a commodore, when virtue rules by compulsion and domineers over vice as a slave, then virtue, though her mandates be outwardly observed, bears little interior sway. 
To be efficacious, virtue must come down from aloft, even as our blessed Redeemer came down to redeem our whole man-of-war world, to that end, mixing with its sailors and sinners as equals. Chapter 55 Midshipmen Entering the Navy Early The allusion in the preceding chapter to the early age at which some of the midshipmen enter the Navy suggests some thoughts relative to more important considerations. A very general, modern impression seems to be that in order to learn the profession of a sea officer, a boy can hardly be sent to sea too early. To a certain extent, this may be a mistake. Other professions, involving a knowledge of technicalities and things restricted to one particular field of action, are frequently mastered by men who begin after the age of 21, or even at a later period of life. It was only about the middle of the 17th century that the British military and naval services were kept distinct. Previous to that epoch, the king's officers commanded indifferently either by sea or by land. Robert Blake, perhaps one of the most accomplished and certainly one of the most successful admirals that ever hoisted a flag, was more than half a century old, 51 years, before he entered the naval service, or had aught to do professionally with a ship. He was of a studious turn, and after leaving Oxford resided quietly on his estate, a country gentleman, till his forty-second year, soon after which he became connected with the parliamentary army. The historian Clarendon says of him, he was the first man that made it manifest that the science, seamanship, might be attained in less time than was imagined, and doubtless it was to his sure sympathies that the well-known humanity and kindness which Blake evinced in his intercourse with the sailors is in a large degree to be imputed. Midshipmen sent into the navy at a very early age are exposed to the passive reception of all the prejudices of the quarter deck in favor of ancient usages, however useless or pernicious. Those prejudices grow up with them and solidify with their very bones. As they rise in rank, they naturally carry them up, whence the inveterate repugnance of many commodores and captains to the slightest innovations in the service, however salutary they may appear to landsmen. It is hardly to be doubted that, in matters connected with the general welfare of the Navy, government has paid rather too much deference to the opinions of the officers of the Navy, considering them as men almost born to the service, and therefore far better qualified to judge concerning any and all questions touching it than people on shore. But in a nation under a liberal constitution, it must ever be unwise to make too distinct and peculiar the profession of either branch of its military men. True, in a country like ours, nothing is at present to be apprehended of their gaining political rule, but not a little is to be apprehended concerning their perpetuating or creating abuses among their subordinates, unless civilians have full cognizance of their administrative affairs, and account themselves competent to the complete overlooking and ordering them. We do wrong when we in any way contribute to the prevailing mystification that has been thrown about the internal affairs of the National Sea Service. Hitherto, those affairs have been regarded even by some high state functionaries as things beyond their insight, altogether too technical and mysterious to be fully comprehended by landsmen. And this it is that has perpetuated in the Navy many evils that otherwise would have been abolished in the general amelioration of other things. The army is sometimes remodeled, but the navy goes down from generation to generation, almost untouched and unquestioned, as if its code were infallible, and itself a piece of perfection that no statesman could improve. When a secretary of the navy ventures to innovate upon its established customs, you hear some of the navy officers say, what does this landsman know about our affairs? Did he ever head a watch? Does he not know starboard from larboard, girt line from backstay? While we deferentially and cheerfully leave to Navy officers the sole conduct of making and shortening sail, tacking ship, and performing other nautical maneuvers, as may seem to them best, let us beware of abandoning to their discretion those general municipal regulations touching the well-being of the great body of men before the mast. Let us beware of being too much influenced by their opinions in matters where it is but natural to suppose that their long-established prejudices are enlisted. Chapter 56. A Shore Emperor on Board a Man of War While we lay in Rio, we sometimes had company from shore, but an unforeseen honor awaited us. One day the young emperor, Don Pedro II, and sweet, making a circuit of the harbor and visiting all the men of war in rotation, at last condescendingly visited the Neversink. 
He came in a splendid barge, rowed by thirty African slaves, who after the Brazilian manner, in concert, rose upright to their oars at every stroke, and then sank backward again to their seats with a simultaneous groan. He reclined under a canopy of yellow silk, looped with tassels of green, the national colors. At the stern waved the Brazilian flag, bearing a large diamond figure in the center, emblematical, perhaps, of the mines of precious stones in the interior. Or it may be a magnified portrait of the famous Portuguese diamond itself, which was found in Brazil in the district of Tejuco, on the banks of the Rio Belmonte. We gave them a grand salute, which almost made the ship's live oak trees knock together with the tremendous concussions. We manned the yards and went through a long ceremonial of paying the emperor homage. Republicans are often more courteous to royalty than royalists themselves, but doubtless this springs from a noble magnanimity. At the gangway, the emperor was received by our commodore in person, arrayed in his most resplendent coat and finest French epaulets. His servant had devoted himself to polishing every button that morning with rotten, stone and rags. Your sea air is a sworn foe to metallic glosses, whence it comes that the swords of sea officers have, of late, so rusted in their scabbards that they are with difficulty drawn. It was a fine sight to see this emperor and commodore complimenting each other. Both were chapeaux de bras, and both continually waved them. By instinct, the emperor knew that the venerable personage before him was as much a monarch afloat as he himself was ashore. Did not our commodore carry the sword of state by his side? For though not born before him, it must have been a sword of state, since it looked far too lustrous to have been his fighting sword. That was not but a limber steel blade with a plain serviceable handle, like the handle of a slaughterhouse knife. Whoever saw a star when the noon sun was in sight, but you seldom see a king without satellites. In the suite of the youthful emperor came a princely train, so brilliant with gems, that they seemed just emerged from the mines of Rio Belmonte. You have seen cones of crystallized salt? Just so flashed these Portuguese barons, marquises, viscounts, and counts. Were it not for their titles and being seen in the train of their lords, you would have sworn they were the eldest sons of jewelers who had run away with their father's cases on their backs. Contrasted with these lamp lusters of barons in Brazil, how wanes the gold lace of our barons of the frigate, the officers of the gunroom, and compared with the long jewel-hilted rapiers of the marquises, the little dirks of our cadets of noble houses, the middies, looks like gilded tenpenny nails in their girdles. But there they stood, commodore and emperor, lieutenants and marquises, middies and pages. The brazen band on the poop struck up, the marine guard presented arms, and high aloft, looking down on this scene, all the people vigorously hurrahed. The top man next to me on the main royal yard removed his hat and diligently manipulated his head in honor of the event, but he was so far out of sight in the clouds that the ceremony went for nothing. A great pity it was that in addition to all these honors, the admirer of Portuguese literature, Viscount Strangford of Great Britain, who I believe once went on embassy, extraordinary to the Brazils, it was a pity that he was not present on this occasion, to yield his tribute of a stanza to Braganza, for our royal visitor was an undoubted Braganza, allied to nearly all the great families of Europe. His grandfather, John VI, had been king of Portugal. His own sister Maria was now its queen. He was indeed a distinguished young gentleman, entitled to high consideration, and that consideration was most cheerfully accorded him. He wore a green dress coat with one regal morning star at the breast, and white pantaloons, and his chapeau was a single, bright, golden-hued feather of the imperial toucan fowl, a magnificent, omnivorous, broad-billed bandit bird of prey, a native of Brazil. Its perch is on the loftiest trees whence it looks down upon all humbler fowls, and hawk-like flies at their throats. The toucan once formed part of the savage regalia of the Indian caciques of the country and upon the establishment of the empire was symbolically retained by the Portuguese sovereigns. His imperial majesty was yet in his youth, rather corpulent, if anything, with a carefree, pleasant face and a polite, indifferent, and easy address. His manners, indeed, were entirely unexceptionable. Now here, thought I, is a very fine lad, with very fine prospects before him. He is supreme emperor of all these Brazils. He has no stormy night watches to stand. He can lay a bed of mornings just as long as he pleases, any gentleman in Rio would be so proud of his personal acquaintance, and the prettiest girl in all South America would deem herself honored with the least glance from the acutest angle of his eye. 
Yes, this young emperor will have a fine time of his life, even so long as he condescends to exist. Everyone jumps to obey him and see as I live. There is an old nobleman in his suit, the Marquis de Carty, as they call him, old enough to be his grandfather, who in the hot sun is standing bareheaded before him while the emperor carries his hat on his head. I suppose that old gentleman now, set a young New England tar beside me, would consider it a great honor to put on his royal majesty's boots. And yet, white jacket, if yonder emperor and I were to strip and jump overboard for a bath, it would be hard telling which one was of the royal blood when we once should be in the water. Look you, Don Pedro II, he added, how do you come to be emperor? Tell me that. You cannot pull as many pounds as I on the main topsail halyards. You are not as tall as I. Your nose is a pug, and mine is a cutwater. And how do you come to be a brigand with that thin pair of spars? A brigand indeed. Braganza, you mean, said I, willing to correct the reticate of so fierce a republican, and by doing so, chastise his censoriousness. Braganza, bragger it is, he replied, and a bragger indeed. See that feather in his cap. See how he struts in that coat. He may well wear a green one, top mates. He's a green-looking swab at the best. Hush, Jonathan, said I. There's the first duff looking up. Be still, the emperor will hear you. And I put my hand on his mouth. Take your hand away, white jacket, he cried. There's no law up aloft here. I say, you emperor, you green horn in the green coat there. Look you, you can't raise a pair of whiskers yet and see what a pair of homeward bounders I have on my jowls. Don Pedro, eh? What's that after all but plain Peter, reckoned a shabby name in my country? Damn me, white jacket, I wouldn't call my dog Peter. Clap a stopper on your jaw tackle, will you? cried Ringbolt, the sailor on the other side of him. You'll be getting us all into Darby's for this. I won't trice up my red rag for nobody, retorted Jonathan. So you'd better take a round turn with yours, Ringbolt, and let me alone, or I'll fetch you such a swat over your figurehead. You'll think a long wharf truck horse kicked you with the four shoes on one hoof. You emperor, you counter-jumping son of a gun, cock your weather eye up here aloft and see your betters. I say, top mates, he ain't any emperor at all. I'm the rightful emperor. Yes, by the Commodore's boots. They stole me out of my cradle here in the Palace of Rio and put that greenhorn in my place. Aye, you timberhead, you. I'm Don Pedro II, and by good rights, you ought to be a main top man here with your fist in a tar bucket. Look you, I say, that crown of yours ought to be on my head. Or if you don't believe that, just heave it into the ring once and see who's the best man. What's this hurrah's nest here aloft, cried Jack Chase, coming up the gallant rigging from the topsail yard. Can't you behave yourself, royal yard men, when an emperor's on board? It's this here Jonathan, answered Ringbolt. He's been blackguarding the young knob in the green coat there. He says Don Pedro stole his hat. How? Crown, he means, noble Jack, said a topman. Jonathan don't call himself an emperor, does he? asked Jack. Yes, cried Jonathan, that greenhorn, standing there by the commodore, is sailing under false colors. He's an imposter, I say. He wears my crown. Ha 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 ha, laughed Jack, now seeing into the joke and willing to humor it. Though I'm born a Briton, boys, yet by the mast. These Don Pedros are all Perkin Warbecks. But I say, Jonathan, my lad, don't pipe your eye now about the loss of your crown. For look you, we all wear crowns, from our cradles to our graves. And though in double darbies in the brig, the commodore himself can't unking us. A riddle, noble Jack. Not a bit, but every man who has a soul to his foot has a crown to his head. Here's mine. And so saying, Jack, removing his tarpaulin, exhibited a bald spot, just about the bigness of a crown piece on the summit of his curly and classical head. Chapter 57 The Emperor Reviews the People at Quarters I beg your royal highness's pardons all round, but I had almost forgotten to chronicle the fact that with the emperor came several other royal princes, kings for aught we knew, since it was just after the celebration of the nuptials of a younger sister of the Brazilian monarch to some European royalty. Indeed, the emperor and his suite formed a sort of bridal party, only the bride herself was absent. The first reception over, the smoke of the cannonading salute having cleared away, and the martial outburst of the brass band having also rolled off to leeward, the people were called down from the yards, and the drum beat to quarters. To quarters we went, and there we stood up by our iron bulldogs, while our royal and noble visitors promenaded along the batteries, breaking out into frequent exclamations at our warlike array, the extreme neatness of our garments, and, above all, the extraordinary polish of the bright work about the great guns, and the marvelous whiteness of the decks. Que gosto, cried a marquis, 
with several dry goods samples of ribbon, tallied with bright buttons hanging from his breast. Que Gloria! cried a crooked, coffee-colored Viscount, spreading both palms. Que Alegria! cried a little Count, mincingly circumnavigating a shop box. Que Contentamento! Heo Moe! cried the Emperor himself, complacently folding his royal arms and serenely gazing along our ranks. Pleasure, glory, and joy. This was the burden of the three noble quarters, and very pleasing indeed was the simple rendering of Don Pedro's imperial remark. Aye, aye, growled a grim rammer and sponger behind me. It's all devilish fine for you knobs to look at, but what would you say if you had to holy stone your decks yourselves and wear out your eyebrows in polishing this cursed old iron, besides getting a dozen at the gangway if you dropped a grease spot on deck in your mess? Aye, aye, devilish fine for you, but devilish dull for us. In due time, the drums beat the retreat and the ship's company scattered over the decks. Some of the officers now assumed the part of Cicerones to show the distinguished strangers the bowels of the frigate, concerning which several of them showed a good deal of intelligent curiosity. A guard of honor detached from the Marine Corps accompanied them and they made the circuit of the berth deck, where, at a judicious distance, the emperor peeped down into the cable tier, a very subterranean vault. The captain of the main hold, who there presided, made a polite bow in the twilight and respectfully expressed a desire for his royal majesty to step down and honor him with a call. But with his handkerchief to his imperial nose, his majesty declined. The party then commenced the ascent to the spar deck, which, from so great a depth in the frigid, is something like getting up to the top of Bunker Hill Monument from the basement. While a crowd of people was gathered about the forward part of the booms, a sudden cry was heard from below. A lieutenant came running forward to learn the cause, when an old sheet anchorman standing by after touching his hat hitched up his waistbands and replied, I don't know, sir, but I'm thinking has how one of them air kings has been tumbling down the hatchway. And something like this it turned out. In ascending one of the narrow ladders leading from the berth deck to the gun deck, the most noble Marquis of Silva, in the act of elevating the imperial coattails so as to protect them from rubbing against the newly painted combings of the hatchway, this noble Marquis's sword, being an uncommonly long one, had caught between his legs and tripped him head over heels down into the fore passage. On the Edes? Where are you going? said his royal master, tranquilly peeping down toward the falling Marquis. And what did you let go of my coattails for? he suddenly added, in a passion, glancing round at the same time, to see if they had suffered from the unfaithfulness of his train bearer. Oh, Lord, sighed the captain of the foretop, who would be a Marquis of Silva? Upon being assisted to the spar deck, the unfortunate Marquis was found to have escaped without serious harm, but from the marked coolness of his royal master, when the Marquis drew near to apologize for his awkwardness, it was plain that he was condemned to languish for a time under the royal displeasure. Shortly after, the imperial party withdrew upon another grand national salute. Chapter 58 A Quarter Deck Officer Before the Mast as we were somewhat short-handed while we lay in Rio, we received a small draft of men from a United States sloop of war, whose three years term of service would expire about the time of our arrival in America. Under guard of an armed lieutenant and four midshipmen, they came on board in the afternoon. They were immediately mustered in the starboard gangway, that Mr. Bridal, our first lieutenant, might take down their names and assign their stations. They stood in a mute and solemn row. The officer advanced with his memorandum book and pencil. My casual friend, Shakings, the holder, happened to be by at the time. Touching my arm, he said, White Jacket, this here reminds me of Sing Sing, when a draft of fellows in Darby's came on from the state prison at Auburn for a change of scene like, you know? After taking down four or five names, Mr. Bridewell accosted the man, a rather good-looking person, but from his haggard cheek and sunken eye, he seemed to have been in the sad habit all his life of sitting up rather late at night. And though all sailors do certainly keep late hours enough, standing watches at midnight, yet there is no small difference between keeping late hours at sea and keeping late hours ashore. What's your name? asked the officer of this rather rakish-looking recruit. Mandeville, sir, said the man, courteously touching his cap. You must remember me, sir, he added in a low, confidential tone, strangely dashed with servility. We sailed together once in the old Macedonian, sir. I wore an epaulot then. We had the same stateroom, you know, sir. I'm your old chum, Mandeville, sir. And he again touched his cap. I remember an officer by that name, said the first lieutenant emphatically. 
And I know you, fellow, but I know you henceforth for a common sailor. I can show no favoritism here. If you ever violate the ship's rules, you will be flogged like any other seaman. I place you, therefore, in the foretop. Go forward to your duty. It seems this Mandeville had entered the navy when very young, and had risen to a lieutenant, as he said, but Brandy had been his bane. One night, when he had the deck of a line of battleship in the Mediterranean, he was seized with a fit of mania a potu, and being out of his senses for the time, went below and turned into his berth, leaving the deck without a commanding officer. For this unpardonable offense he was broken. Having no fortune and no other profession than the sea, upon his disgrace he entered the merchant service as a chief mate, but his love of strong drink still pursuing him, he was again cashiered at sea, and degraded before the mast by the captain. After this, in a state of intoxication, he re-entered the navy at Pensacola as a common sailor. But all these lessons, so biting bitter to learn, could not cure him of his sin. He had hardly been a week on board the Neversink when he was found intoxicated with smuggled spirits. They lashed him to the gratings and ignominiously scourged him under the eye of his old friend and comrade, the first lieutenant. This took place while we lay in port, which reminds me of the circumstance, that when punishment is about to be inflicted in harbor, all strangers are ordered ashore, and the sentries at the side have it in strict charge to wave off all boats drawing near. Chapter 59. A man-of-war button divides two brothers. The conduct of Mandeville in claiming the acquaintance of the first lieutenant under such disreputable circumstances was strongly contrasted by the behavior of another person on board, placed for a time in a somewhat similar situation. Among the genteel youths of the afterguard was a lad of about sixteen, a very handsome young fellow, with starry eyes, curly hair of a golden color, and a bright sunshiny complexion. He must have been the son of some goldsmith. He was one of the few sailors, not in the main top, whom I used to single out for occasional conversation. After several friendly interviews, he became quite frank and communicated certain portions of his history. There is some charm in the sea, which induces most persons to be very communicative concerning themselves. We had lain in Rio but a day, when I observed that this lad, whom I shall here call Frank, wore an unwanted expression of sadness mixed with apprehension. I questioned him as to the cause, but he chose to conceal it. Not three days after, he abruptly accosted me on the gun deck, where I happened to be taking a promenade. I can't keep it to myself any more, he said. I must have a confidant or I shall go mad. What is the matter? said I in alarm. Matter enough, look at this. And he handed me a torn half sheet of an old New York Herald, putting his finger upon a particular word in a particular paragraph. It was the announcement of the sailing from the Brooklyn Navy Yard of the United States store ship with provisions for the squadron in Rio. It was upon a particular name in the list of officers and midshipmen that Frank's finger was placed. That is my own brother, said he. He must have got a reefer's warrant since I left home. Now, White Jacket, what's to be done? I have calculated that the store ship may be expected here every day. My brother will then see me. He, an officer, and I, a miserable sailor, that any moment may be flogged at the gangway before his very eyes. Heavens, White Jacket, what shall I do? Would you run? Do you think there is any chance to desert? I won't see him by heaven with this sailor's frock on, and he with the anchor button. Why, Frank, said I, I do not really see sufficient cause for this fit you're in. Your brother is an of officer. Very good, and you are nothing but a sailor, but that is no disgrace. If he comes on board here, go up to him and take him by the hand. Believe me, he will be glad enough to see you. Frank started from his desponding attitude, and fixing his eyes full upon mine with clasped hands, exclaimed, White Jacket, I have been from home nearly three years. In that time, I have never heard one word from my family, and though God knows how I love them, yet I swear to you that though my brother can tell me whether my sisters are still alive, yet rather than accost him in this lined frock, I would go ten centuries without hearing one syllable from home. Amazed at his earnestness and hardly able to account for it altogether, I stood silent a moment, then said, Why, Frank, this midshipman is your own brother, you say. Now, do you really think that your own flesh and blood is going to give himself airs over you simply because he sports large brass buttons on his coat? Never believe it. If he does, he can be no brother and ought to be hanged. That's all. Don't say that again, said Frank resentfully. My brother is a noble-hearted fellow. I love him as I do myself. You don't understand me, White Jacket. Don't you see that when my brother arrives, he must consort more or less with our chuckle-headed reefers on board there? There's that namby-pamby Miss Nancy of a white-faced Stribbles who, the other day, when Mad Jack's back was turned, ordered me to hand him the spyglass as if he were a commodore. 
Do you suppose now I want my brother to see me a lackey abroad here? By heaven, it is enough to drive one distracted. What's to be done? He cried fiercely. Much more passed between us, but all my philosophy was in vain, and at last Frank departed, his head hanging down in despondency. For several days after, whenever the quartermaster reported a sail entering the harbor, Frank was foremost in the rigging to observe it. At length, one afternoon, a vessel drawing near was reported to be the long-expected store ship. I looked round for Frank on the spar deck, but he was nowhere to be seen. He must have been below, gazing out of a porthole. The vessel was hailed from our poop and came to anchor within a biscuit's toss of our batteries. That evening, I heard that Frank had ineffectually endeavored to get removed from his place as an oarsman in the first cutter, a boat which from its size is generally employed with the launch and carrying ship stores. When I thought that, the very next day, perhaps this boat would be plying between the store ship and our frigid, I was at no loss to account for Frank's attempts to get rid of his oar, and felt heartily grieved at their failure. Next morning, the bugler called away the first cutter's crew, and Frank entered the boat with his hat slouched over his eyes. Upon his return, I was all eagerness to learn what had happened, and as the communication of his feelings was a grateful relief, he poured his whole story into my ear. It seemed that with his comrades he mounted the store ship's side and hurried forward to the forecastle. Then, turning anxiously toward the quarterdeck, he spied two midshipmen leaning against the bulwarks, conversing. One was the officer of his boat. Was the other his brother? No, he was too tall, too large. Thank heaven it was not him. And perhaps his brother had not sailed from home after all. There might have been some mistake. But suddenly the strange midshipman laughed aloud, and that laugh Frank had heard a thousand times before. It was a free, hearty laugh, a brother's laugh, but it carried a pang to the heart of poor Frank. He was now ordered down to the main deck to assist in removing the stores. The boat being loaded, he was ordered into her. When looking toward the gangway, he perceived the two midshipmen lounging upon each side of it, so that no one could pass them without brushing their persons. But again, pulling his hat over his eyes, Frank, darting between them, gained his oar. How my heart thumped, he said, when I actually felt him so near me, but I wouldn't look at him, no, I'd have died first. To Frank's great relief, the store ship at last moved further up the bay, and it fortunately happened that he saw no more of his brother while in Rio, and while there, he never in any way made himself known to him. Chapter 60 A Man of War's Man Shot At There was a seaman belonging to the foretop, a messmate, though not a top mate of mine and no favorite of the captain's, who for certain venial transgressions had been prohibited from going ashore on liberty when the ship's company went. Enraged at the deprivation, for he had not touched earth in upward of a year, he, some nights after, lowered himself overboard with the view of gaining a canoe, attached by a robe to a Dutch galliot some cable's length distant. And this canoe he proposed paddling himself ashore, not being a very expert swimmer, the commotion he made in the water attracted the ear of the sentry on that side of the ship, who turning about in his walk perceived the faint white spot where the fugitive was swimming in the frigid shadow. He hailed it, but no reply. Give the word, or I fire. Not a word was heard. The next instant there was a red flash, and before it had completely ceased illuminating the night, the white spot was changed into crimson. Some of the officers returning from a party at the beach of the Flamingos happened to be drawing near the ship in one of her cutters. They saw the flash and the bounding body revealed. In a moment, the top man was dragged into the boat, a handkerchief was used for a tourniquet, and the wounded fugitive was soon on board the frigate. When the surgeon being called, the necessary attentions were rendered. Now it appeared that at the moment the sentry fired, the top man, in order to elude discovery by manifesting the completest quietude, was floating on the water straight and horizontal, as if reposing on a bed. And as he was not far from the ship at the time, and the sentry was considerately elevated above him, facing his platform on a level with the upper part of the hammock nettings, the ball struck with great force with a downward obliquity. Entering the right thigh just above the knee and penetrating some inches, glancing upward along the bone, burying itself somewhere that it could not be felt by outward manipulation. There was no dusky discoloration to mark its internal track, and as the case, when a partly spent ball obliquely hitting, after entering the skin, courses on just beneath the surface without penetrating further. Nor was there any mark in the opposite part of the thigh to denote its place, as when a ball forces itself straight through a limb, and lodges, perhaps, close to the skin on the other side. Nothing was visible but a small, ragged puncture, bluish about the edges, 
as if the rough point of a tenpenny nail had been forced into the flesh and withdrawn. It seemed almost impossible that through so small an aperture a musket ball could have penetrated. The extreme misery and general prostration of the man caused by the great effusion of blood, though, strange to say, at first he said he felt no pain from the wound itself, induced the surgeon very reluctantly to forego an immediate search for the ball to extract it, as that would have involved the dilating of the wound by the knife, an operation which at that juncture would have been almost certainly attended with fatal results. A day or two, therefore, was permitted to pass while simple dressings were applied. The surgeon of the other American ships of war and harbor occasionally visited the Neversink to examine the patient and incidentally to listen to the expositions of our own surgeon, their senior in rank. But Codwallader, cuticle, who as yet has been but incidentally alluded to, now deserves a chapter by himself. Chapter 61 The Surgeon of the Fleet Codwallader Cuticle, M.D., an honorary member of the most distinguished colleges of surgeons both in Europe and America, was our surgeon of the fleet. Nor was he at all blind to the dignity of his position, to which indeed he was rendered peculiarly competent, if the reputation he enjoyed was deserved. He had the name of being the foremost surgeon in the Navy, a gentleman of remarkable science and a veteran practitioner. He was a small, withered man, nearly perhaps quite sixty years of age. His chest was shallow, his shoulders bent, his pantaloons hung round skeleton legs, and his face was singularly attenuated. In truth, the corporal vitality of this man seemed in a good degree to have died out of him. He walked abroad a curious patchwork of life and death, with a wig, one glass eye, and a set of false teeth, while his voice was husky and thick. But his mind seemed undebilitated as in youth. It shone out of his remaining eye with basilisk brilliancy. Like most old physicians and surgeons who have seen much service and have been promoted to high professional place for their scientific attainments, this cuticle was an enthusiast in his calling. In private, he had once been heard to say confidentially that he would rather cut off a man's arm than dismember the wing of the most delicate pheasant. In particular, the department of the morbid anatomy was his peculiar love and in his stateroom below he had a most unsightly collection of Parisian casts in plaster and wax, representing all imaginable malformations of the human members, both organic and induced by disease. Chief among these was a cast often to be met with in the anatomical museums of Europe, and no doubt an unexaggerated copy of a genuine original. It was the head of an elderly woman, with an aspect singularly gentle and meek, but at the same time wonderfully expressive of a gnawing sorrow never to be relieved. You would almost have thought it the face of some abbess, for some unspeakable crime voluntarily sequestered from human society, and leading a life of agonized penitence without hope. So marvelously sad and tearfully pitiable was this head. But when you first beheld it, no such emotions ever crossed your mind. All your eyes and all your horrified soul were fast fascinated and frozen, by the sight of a hideous crumpled horn, like that of a ram, downward growing out from the forehead, and partly shadowing the face. But as you gazed, the freezing fascination of its horribleness gradually waned, and then your whole heart burst with sorrow as you contemplated those aged features, ashy, pale, and wan. The horn seemed the mark of a curse for some mysterious sin, conceived and committed before the spirit had entered the flesh, Yet that sin seemed something imposed and not voluntarily sought, some sin growing out of the heartless necessities of the predestination of things, some sin under which the sinner sank in sinless woe. But no pang of pain, not the slightest touch of concern, ever crossed the bosom of Cuticle when he looked on this cast. It was immovably fixed to a bracket against the partition of his state room, so that it was the first object that greeted his eyes when he opened them from his nightly sleep. Nor was it to hide the face that upon retiring he always hung his navy cap upon the upward curling extremity of the horn, for that obscured it but little. The surgeon's cot boy, the lad who had made up his swinging bed and took care of his room, often told us of the horror he sometimes felt when he would find himself alone in his master's retreat. At times he was seized with the idea that Cuticle was a preternatural being. And once entering his room in the middle of the night, he started at finding it enveloped in a thick, bluish vapor and stifling with the odors of brimstone. Upon hearing a low groan from the smoke, with a wild cry he darted from the place, 
and rousing the occupants of the neighboring staterooms, it was found that the vapor proceeded from smoldering bunches of lucifer matches, which had become united through the carelessness of the surgeon. Cuticle, almost dead, was dragged from the suffocating atmosphere, and it was several days ere he completely recovered from its effects. This accident took place immediately over the powder magazine. But as Cuticle, during his sickness, paid dearly enough for transgressing the laws prohibiting combustibles in the gun room, the captain contented himself with privately remonstrating him. Well knowing the enthusiasm of the surgeon for all specimens of morbid anatomy, some of the wardroom officers used to play upon his credulity, though in every case Cuticle was not long in discovering their deceptions. Once, when they had some sago pudding for dinner, and Cuticle chanced to be ashore, they made up a neat parcel of this bluish-white, firm, jelly-like preparation, and placing it in a tin box carefully sealed with wax, they deposited it on the gun-room table with a note, purporting to come from an eminent physician in Rio, connected with the Grand National Museum on the Praca de Aclamacao, begging leave to present the scientific Signor Cuticle with a donor's compliments, an uncommonly fine specimen of a cancer. Descending to the wardroom, Cuticle spied the note, and no sooner read it than clutching the case he opened it and examined. Beautiful, splendid! I have never seen a finer specimen of this most interesting disease. And what have you there, Surgeon Cuticle? said a lieutenant, advancing. Why, sir, look at it. Did you ever see anything more exquisite? Very exquisite indeed. Let me have a bit of it, will you, Cuticle? Let you have a bit of it, shrieked the surgeon, starting back. Let you have one of my limbs. I wouldn't mar so large a specimen for a hundred dollars, but what can you want of it? You're not making collections. I'm fond of the article, said the lieutenant. It's a fine cold relish to bacon or ham. You know, I was in New Zealand last cruise, cuticle, and got into sad dissipation there among the cannibals. Come, let's have a bit, if it's only a mouthful. Why, you infernal Fiji, shouted Cuticle, eyeing the other with a confound expression. You don't really mean to eat a piece of this cancer. Hand it to me and see whether I will not, was the reply. In God's name, take it, cried the surgeon, putting the case into his hands and then standing with his own uplifted. Steward, cried the lieutenant, the caster, quick. I always use plenty of pepper with this dish. Surgeon, it's oystery. Ah, this is really delicious, he added, smacking his lips over a mouthful. Try it now, surgeon and you'll never keep such a fine dish as this lying uneaten on your hands as a mere scientific curiosity. Cuticle's whole countenance changed, and slowly walking up to the table, he put his nose close to the tin case, then touched its contents with its finger and tasted it. Enough. Buttoning up his coat in all the tremblings of an old man's rage, he burst from the wardroom, and calling for a boat was not seen again for twenty-four hours. But though, like all mortals, Cuticle was subject at time to these fits of passion, at least under outrageous provocation. Nothing could exceed his coolness when actually employed in his imminent vocation. Surrounded by moans and shrieks, by features distorted with anguish inflicted by himself, he yet maintained a countenance almost supernaturally calm. And unless the intense interest of the operation flushed his wan face with a momentary tinge of professional enthusiasm, he toiled away, untouched by the keenest misery coming under a fleet surgeon's eye. Indeed, long habituation to the dissecting room and the amputation table had made him seemingly impervious to the ordinary emotions of humanity. Yet you could not say that Cuticle was essentially a cruel-hearted man. His apparent heartlessness must have been a purely scientific origin. It is not to be imagined that Cuticle would have harmed a fly unless he could procure a microscope powerful enough to assist him in experimenting on the minute vitals of the creature. But notwithstanding his marvelous indifference to the sufferings of his patients, and spite even of his enthusiasm in his vocation, not cooled by frosting old age itself, Cuticle on some occasions would affect a certain disrelish of his profession, and declaim against the necessity that forced a man of his humanity to perform a surgical operation. Especially was it apt to be thus with him, when the case was of more than ordinary interest, in discussing it previous to setting about it, he would veil his eagerness under an aspect of great circumspection, curiously marred, however, by continual sallies of unsuppressible impatience. But the knife once in his hand, the compassionless surgeon himself, undisguised, stood before you. Such was Codwallader Cuticle, our surgeon of the fleet. Chapter 62 A Consultation of Man of War's Surgeons it seems customary for the surgeon of the fleet when any important operation in his department is on the anvil, and there is nothing to absorb professional attention from it, to invite his brother surgeons, 
if at hand at the time, to a ceremonious consultation upon it, and this in courtesy his brother surgeons expect. In pursuance of this custom, then, the surgeon of the neighboring American ships of war were requested to visit the Never Sink in a body, to advise concerning the case of the top men, whose situation had now become critical. They assembled on the half-deck and were soon joined by their respective senior, Cuticle. In a body, they bowed as he approached and accosted him with deferential regard. Gentlemen, said Cuticle, unostentatiously seating himself on a camp stool handed him by his cot boy. We have here an extremely interesting case. You have all seen the patient, I believe. At first I had hopes that I had been able to cut down to the ball and remove it, but the state of the patient forbade. Since then the inflammation and sloughing of the part has been attended with a copious separation, great loss of substance, extreme debility, and emaciation. From this I am convinced that the ball has shattered and deadened the bone, and now lies impacted in the medullary canal. In fact, there can be no doubt that the wound is incurable, and that amputation is the only resource. But gentlemen, I find myself placed in a very delicate predicament. I assure you I feel no professional anxiety to perform the operation. I desire your advice, and if you will now again visit the patient with me, we can return here and decide what is best to be done. Once more, let me say that I feel no personal anxiety whatsoever to use the knife. The assembled surgeons listened to this address with the most serious attention, and in accordance with their superior's desire, now descended to the sick bay where the patient was languishing. The examination concluded, they returned to the half-deck, and the consultation was renewed. Gentlemen, began Cuticle, again seating himself, you have now just inspected the limb. You have seen that there is no resource but amputation. And now, gentlemen, what do you say? Surgeon Bandage, of the Mohawk, will you express your opinion? The wound is a very serious one, said Bandage, a corpulent man with a high German forehead, shaking his head solemnly. Can anything save him but amputation? demanded Cuticle. His constitutional debility is extreme, observed Bandage, but I have seen more dangerous cases. Surgeon Wedge of the Malay, said Cuticle in a pet, be pleased to give your opinion, and let it be definitive, I entreat. This was said with a severe glance toward Bandage. If I thought, began Wedge, a very spare, tall man, elevating himself still higher on his toes, that the ball had shattered and divided the whole femur, including the greater and lesser trochanter, the linear aspera, the digital fossa, and the intertrochanteric, I should certainly be in favor of amputation, but that, sir, permit me to observe, is not my opinion. Surgeon Sawyer of the Buccaneer, said Cuticle, drawing in his thin lower lip with vexation, and turning to a round-faced, florid, frank, sensible-looking man, whose uniform coat very handsomely fitted him, and was adorned with an unusual quantity of gold lace. Surgeon Sawyer of the Buccaneer, let us now hear your opinion, if you please. Is not the amputation the only resource, sir? Excuse me, said Sawyer, I am decidedly opposed to it, for if hitherto the patient has not been strong enough to undergo the extraction of the ball, I do not see how he can be expected to endure a far more severe operation, as there is no immediate danger of mortification, and you say the ball cannot be reached without making large incisions. I should support him, I think, for the present, with tonics and gentle antiphlogistics locally applied. On no account would I proceed to amputation until further symptoms are exhibited. Surgeon Patella of the Algerine, said Cuticle, in an ill-suppressed passion, abruptly turning round on the person addressed, will you have the kindness to say whether you do not think that amputation is the only resource? Now, Patella was the youngest of the company, a modest man, filled with a profound reverence for the science of Cuticle, and desirous of gaining his good opinion, yet not wishing to commit himself altogether by a decided reply, though, like Surgeon Sawyer, in his own mind he might have been clearly against the operation. What you have remarked, Mr. Surgeon of the Fleet, said Patella, respectfully hemming, concerning the dangerous condition of the limb, seems obvious enough. Amputation would certainly be a cure to the wound, but then, as notwithstanding his present debility, the patient seems to have a strong constitution. He might rally as it is, and by your scientific treatment, Mr. Surgeon of the Fleet, bowing, be entirely made whole without risking an amputation. Still, it is a very critical case, and amputation may be indispensable, and if it is to be performed, there ought to be no delay whatever. That is my view of the case, Mr. Surgeon of the Fleet." Surgeon Patella, then, gentlemen, said Cuticle, turning round triumphantly, is clearly of opinion that amputation should be immediately performed. For my own part, individually, I mean, and without respect to the patient, I am sorry to have it so decided. But this settles the question, gentlemen, in my own mind, however. It was settled before. At ten o'clock tomorrow morning, the operation will be performed. 
I am happy to see you all on the occasion, and also your juniors, alluding to the absent assistant surgeons. Good morning, gentlemen, at ten o'clock, remember. And Cuticle retreated to the wardroom. Chapter 63, The Operation Next morning at the appointed hour, the surgeons arrive in a body. They were accompanied by their juniors, young men ranging in age from 19 years to 30. Like the senior surgeons, these young gentlemen were arrayed in their blue navy uniforms, displaying a profusion of bright buttons and several broad bars of gold lace about the wristbands. As in honor of the occasion, they had put on their best coats. They looked exceedingly brilliant. The whole party immediately descended to the half-deck, where preparations had been made for the operation. A large garrison ensign was stretched across the ship by the main mast, so as completely to screen the space behind. This space included the whole extent aft to the bulkhead of the Commodore's cabin, at the door of which the Marine orderly placed in plain sight cutlass in hand. Upon two gun carriages dragged amidships, the death board, used for burials at sea, was horizontally placed, covered with an old royal stun sail. Upon this occasion, to do duty as an amputation table, it was widened by an additional plank. Two match tubs nearby placed one upon the other, at either end supported another plank, distinct from the table, whereon was exhibited an array of saws and knives, of various and peculiar shapes and sizes. Also a sort of steel, something like a dinner table implement, together with long needles crooked at the end for taking up the arteries, and large darning needles, threads, and beeswax for sewing up the wound. At the end nearest the larger table was a tin basin of water, surrounded by small sponges, placed at mathematical intervals. From the long horizontal pole of the great gun rammer, fixed in its usual place overhead, hung a number of towels with U.S. marked in the corners. All these arrangements had been made by the surgeon's steward, a person whose important functions in a man of war will in a future chapter be enlarged upon. Upon the present occasion, he was bustling about, adjusting and readjusting the knives, needles, and carver like an over-conscientious butler fidgeting over a dinner table just before the convivialists enter. But by far the most striking object to be seen behind the ensign was a human skeleton, whose every joint articulated with wires. By a rivet at the apex of the skull, it hung dangling from a hammock hook fixed in a beam above. Why this object was here will presently be seen, but why it was placed immediately at the foot of the amputation table only Surgeon Cuticle can tell. While the final preparations were being made, Cuticle stood conversing with the assembled surgeons and assistant surgeons, his invited guests. Gentlemen, said he, taking up one of the glittering knives and artistically drawing the steel across it. Gentlemen, though these scenes are very unpleasant, and in some moods I may say repulsive to me, yet how much better for our patient to have the contusions and lacerations of his present wound, with all its dangerous symptoms, converted into a clean incision, free from these objections, and occasioning so much less subsequent anxiety to himself and the surgeon. Yes, he added, tenderly feeling the edge of his knife, amputation is our only resource. Is it not so, Surgeon Patella? Turning toward that gentleman as if relying upon some sort of an ascent, however clogged with conditions. Certainly, said Patella, amputation is your only resource, Mr. Surgeon of the Fleet. That is, I mean, if you are fully persuaded of its necessity. The other surgeons said nothing, maintaining a somewhat reserved air, as if conscious that they had no positive authority in the case, whatever might their own opinions be. But they seemed willing to behold and if called upon to assist at the operation, since it could not now be averted. The young men, their assistants, looked very eager and cast frequent glances of awe upon so distinguished a practitioner as the venerable cuticle. They say he can drop a leg in one minute and ten seconds from the moment the knife touches it, whispered one of them to another. So we shall see, was the reply, and the speaker clapped his hand to his fob to see if his watch would be forthcoming when wanted. Are you all ready here, demanded Cuticle, now advancing to his steward. Have not those fellows got through yet? Pointing to three men of the carpenter's gang who were placing bits of wood under the gun carriages supporting the central table. They are just through, sir, respectfully answered the steward, touching his hand to his forehead as if there were a cap front there. Bring up the patient then, said Cuticle. Young gentlemen, he said, turning to the row of assistant surgeons, seeing you here reminds me of the classes of students once under my instruction at the Philadelphia College of Physicians and Surgeons. Ah, those were happy days, he sighed, applying the extreme corner of his handkerchief to his glass eye. Excuse an old man's emotions, young gentlemen, but when I think of the numerous rare cases that then came under my treatment, I cannot but give way to my feelings. 
The town, the city, the metropolis, young gentlemen, is the place for you students, at least in these dull times of peace, when the army and navy furnish no inducements for a youth ambitious of rising in our honorable profession. Take an old man's advice, and if the war now threatening between the states and Mexico should break out, exchange your navy commissions for commissions in the army. From having no military marine herself, Mexico has always been backward in furnishing subjects for the amputation tables of foreign navies. The cause of science has languished in her hands. The army, young gentlemen, is your best school. Depend upon it. You will hardly believe it, Surgeon Bandage, turning to that gentleman, but this is my first important case of surgery in a nearly three years' cruise. I have been almost wholly confined in this ship to doctor's practice prescribing for fevers and fluxes. True, the other day a man fell from the mizzen top sail yard, but that was merely an aggravated case of dislocations and bones splintered and broken. No one, sir, could have made an amputation of it without severely contusing his conscience. And mine, I may say it, gentlemen, without ostentation, is peculiarly susceptible. And so saying, the knife and carver touchingly dropped to his sides, and he stood for a moment fixed in a tender reverie. But a commotion being heard beyond the curtain, he started, and briskly crossing and recrossing the knife and carver, exclaimed, Ali, here comes our patient. Surgeons, this side of the table, if you please. Young gentlemen, a little further off, I beg. Steward, take my coat. So, my neckerchief now. I must be perfectly unencumbered, Surgeon Patella, or I can do nothing whatever. These articles being removed, he snatched off his wig, placing it on the gun deck capstan, then took out his set of false teeth and placed it by the side of the wig, and lastly, putting his forefinger to the inner angle of his blind eye, speared it out the glass optic with professional dexterity, and deposited it so, next to the wig and false teeth. Thus divested of nearly all inorganic appurtenances, what was left of the surgeon slightly shook itself to see whether anything more could be spared to advantage. Carpenter's mates, he now cried, will you never get through with that job? Almost through, sir, just through, they replied, staring round in search of the strange, unearthly voice that addressed them, for the absence of his teeth had not at all improved the conversational tones of the surgeon of the fleet. With natural curiosity, these men had purposely been lingering to see all they could, but now, having no further excuse, they snatched up their hammers and chisels, and like the stage builders decamping from a public meeting at the eleventh hour, after just completing the rostrum in time for the first speaker, the carpenter's gang withdrew. The broad ensign now lifted, revealing a glimpse of the crowd of man of war's men outside, and the patient, born in the arms of two of his messmates, entered the place. He was much emaciated, weak as an infant, and every limb visibly trembled, or rather jarred, like the head of a man with the palsy as if an organic and involuntary apprehension of death had seized the wounded leg. Its nervous motions were so violent that one of the messmates was obliged to keep his hand upon it. The top man was immediately stretched upon the table, the attendant steadying his limbs, when slowly, opening his eyes, he glanced about at the glittering knives and saws, the towels and sponges, the armed sentry at the commodore's cabin door, the row of eager-eyed students, the meager death's hand of a cuticle, now with his shirt sleeves rolled up upon his withered arms and knife in hand, and finally, his eyes settled in horror upon the skeleton, slowly vibrating and jingling before him, with the slow, slight roll of the frigate in the water. I would advise perfect repose of your every limb, my man, said Cuticle, addressing him. The precision of an operation is often impaired by the inconsiderate restlessness of the patient. But if you consider, my good fellow, he added, in a patronizing and almost sympathetic tone, and slightly pressing his hand on the limb. If you consider how much better it is to live with three limbs than to die with four, and especially if you but knew to what torments both sailors and soldiers were subjected before the time of Celsus, owing to the lamentable ignorance of surgery then prevailing, you would certainly thank God from the bottom of your heart that your operation has been postponed to the period of this enlightened age, blessed with a bell, Brody, and a lally. My man, before Celsus's time, such was the general ignorance of our noble science that in order to prevent the excessive effusion of blood, it was deemed indispensable to operate with a red-hot knife, making a professional movement toward the thigh, and pour scalding oil upon the parts. Elevating his elbow, as if with a teapot in his hand, still further to sear them after amputation had been performed. He is fainting, said one of his messmates. Quick, some water! The steward immediately hurried to the top man with a basin. Cuticle took the top man by the wrist and feeling it a while observed, don't be alarmed men, adjusting the two messmates, he'll recover presently, this fainting very generally takes place, and he stood for a moment tranquilly eyeing the patient, 
Now the surgeon of the fleet and the top man presented a spectacle which, to a reflecting mind, was better than a churchyard sermon on the mortality of man. Here was a sailor who four days previous had stood erect, a pillar of life, with an arm like a royal mast and a thigh like a windlass. But the slightest conceivable finger touch of a bit of crooked trigger had eventuated in stretching him out, more helpless than an hour-old babe with a blasted thigh, utterly drained of its brawn. And who was it that now stood over him like a superior being, and as if clothed himself with the attributes of immortality, indifferently discoursed of carving up his broken flesh and thus piercing out his abbreviated days? Who was it that in capacity of surgeon seemed enacting the part of a regenerator of life, the withered, shrunken, one-eyed, toothless, hairless cuticle, with a trunk half-dead, a memento mori to behold? And while in those soul-sinking and panic-striking premonitions of speedy death, which almost invariably accompany a severe gunshot wound, even with the most intrepid spirits, while thus drooping and dying, this once robust top man's eye was now waning in his head, like a Lapland moon being eclipsed in clouds. Cuticle, who for years had still lived in his withered tabernacle of a body, Cuticle, no doubt sharing in the common self-delusion of old age, Cuticle must have felt his hold of life as secure as the grim hug of a grizzly bear. Verily, life is more awful than death, and let no man, though his live heart beat in him like a cannon, let him not hug his life to himself. For in the predestinated necessity of things, that bounding life of his is not a whit more secure than the life of a man on his deathbed. Today we inhale the air with expanding lungs, and life runs through us like a thousand niles, but tomorrow we may collapse in death, and all our veins be dry as the brook Kedron in a drought. And now, young gentlemen, said Cuticle, turning to the assistant surgeons, while the patient is coming too, permit me to describe to you the highly interesting operation I am about to perform. Mr. Surgeon of the Fleet, said Surgeon Bandage, if you are about to lecture, permit me to present you with your teeth. They will make your discourse more readily understood. And so saying, Bandage, with a bow, placed the two semicircles of ivory into Cuticle's hands. Thank you, Surgeon Bandage, said Cuticle, and slipped the ivory into its place. In the first place, now, young gentlemen, let me direct your attention to the excellent preparation before you. I have had it unpacked from its case and set up here from my stateroom, where it occupies the spare berth. And all this for your express benefit, young gentlemen. This skeleton I procured in person from the Hunterian Department of the Royal College of Surgeons in London. It is a masterpiece of art, but we have no time to examine it now. Delicacy forbids that I should amplify at a juncture like this. Casting an almost benignant glance toward the patient now beginning to open his eyes, but let me point out to you upon this thigh bone, disengaging it from the skeleton, with a gentle twist, the precise place where I propose to perform the operation. Here, young gentlemen, here is the place, you perceive, it is very near the point of articulation with the trunk. Yes, interposed Surgeon Wedge, rising on his toes, yes, young gentlemen, the point of articulation, with the acetabulum of the os inanimatum. Where's your bell on bones, Dick? whispered one of the assistants to the student next to him. Wedge has been spending the whole morning over it, getting out the hard names. Sergeant Wedge, said Cuticle, looking round severely, we will dispense with your commentaries, if you please, at present. Now, young gentlemen, you cannot but perceive that the point of operation being so near the trunk and the vitals, it becomes an unusually beautiful one, demanding a steady hand and a true eye, and after all, the patient may die under my hands. Quick, steward, water, water, he's fainting again, cried the two messmates. Don't be alarmed for your comrade, said Cuticle, turning round. I tell you, it is not an uncommon thing for the patient to betray some emotion upon these occasions, most usually manifested by swooning. It is quite natural it should be so, but we must not delay the operation. Steward, that knife. No, the next one, there. That's it. He is coming too, I think, feeling the top man's wrist. Are you all ready, sir? This last observation was addressed to one of the Neversink's assistant surgeons, a tall, lank, cadaverous young man, arrayed in a sort of shroud of white canvas, pinned about his throat and completely enveloping his person. He was seated on a match tub, the skeleton swinging near his head. At the foot of the table, in readiness to grasp the limb as when a plank is being severed by a carpenter and his apprentice. The sponges, steward, said Cuticle, for the last time, taking out his teeth and drawing up his shirt sleeves still further. Then taking the patient by the wrist, stand by, now you messmates, keep hold of his arms, pin him down, steward, put your hand on the artery, I shall commence as soon as his pulse begins to. Now, now, 
letting fall the wrist, feeling the thigh carefully and bowing over it an instant, he drew the fatal knife unerringly across the flesh. As it first touched the part, the row of surgeons simultaneously dropped their eyes to their watches in their hands while the patient lay, with eyes horribly distended, in a kind of waking trance. Not a breath was heard, but as the quivering flesh parted in a long, lingering gash, a spring of blood welled up between the living walls of the wound, and two thick streams in opposite directions coursed down the thigh. The sponges were instantly dipped in the purple pool. Every face present was pinched to a point with suspense. The limb writhed, the man shrieked, his messmates pinioned him, while round and round the leg went unpitying cut. The saw said cuticle. Instantly it was in his hand. Full of the operation, he was about to apply it when looking up and turning to the assistant surgeons, he said, would any of you young gentlemen like to apply the saw? A splendid subject. Several volunteered. When selecting one, cuticle surrendered the instrument to him, saying, don't be hurried now, be steady. While the rest of the assistants looked upon their comrade with glances of envy, he went rather timidly to work, and Cuticle, who was earnestly regarding him, suddenly snatched the saw from his hand. Away, butcher! You disgrace the profession! Look at me! For a few moments, the thrilling, rasping sound was heard, and then the top man seemed parted in twain at the hip, as the leg slowly slid into the arms of the pale, gaunt man in the shroud, who at once made away with it and tucked it out of sight under one of the guns. Surgeon Sawyer! Now said Cuticle, courteously turning to the surgeon of the Mohawk, would you like to take up the arteries? They are quite at your service, sir. Do, Sawyer, be prevailed upon, said Surgeon Bandage. Sawyer complied, and while with modesty he was conducting the operation, Cuticle, turning to the row of assistants, said, Young gentlemen, we will now proceed with our illustration. Hand me that bone, steward. And taking the thigh bone in his still bloody hands and holding it conspicuously before his auditors, the surgeon of the fleet began, Now, young gentlemen, you will perceive that precisely at this spot, here, to which I previously directed your attention at the corresponding spot precisely, the operation has been performed. About here, young gentlemen, here, lifting his hand some inches above the bone. About here the great artery was, but you noticed that I did not use the tourniquet. I never do. The forefinger of my steward is far better than a tourniquet, being so much more manageable and leaving the smaller veins uncompressed. But I have been told, young gentlemen, that a certain Signor Signorioni, a surgeon of Seville, has recently invented an admirable substitute for the clumsy old-fashioned tourniquet. As I understand it, it is something like a pair of calipers, working with a small Archimedes screw, a very clever invention, according to all accounts. For the padded points at the end of the arcus, arching his finger and thumb, can be so worked as the approximate in such a way as to, uh, but you don't attend to me, young gentleman, he added, all at once starting. Being more interested in the active proceedings of Surgeon Sawyer, who was now threading a needle to sew up his overlapping stump, the young gentleman had not scrupled to turn away their attention altogether from the lecturer. A few moments more and the top man in a swoon was removed below into the sick bay, as the curtain settled again after the patient had disappeared. Cuticle, still holding the thigh bone of the skeleton in his ensanguined hands, proceeded with his remarks upon it, and having concluded them, added, Now, young gentlemen, not the least interesting consequence of this operation will be finding of the ball, which, in case of non-amputation, might long have eluded the most careful search. That ball, young gentlemen, must have taken a most circuitous route, nor, in case where the direction is oblique, is this at all unusual. Indeed, the learned Henner gives us a most remarkable, I had almost said an incredible, case of a soldier's neck, where the bullet, entering at the part called the Adam's apple. Yes, said Surgeon Wedge, elevating himself, the palmum atomy. Entering the point called Adam's apple, continued Cuticle, severely emphasizing the last two words, ran completely round the neck, and emerging at the same hole it had entered, shot the next man in the ranks. It was afterward extracted, says Renner, from the second man, and pieces of the other's skin were found adhering to it. But examples of foreign substances being received into the body with a ball, young gentlemen, are frequently observed. Being attached to a United States ship at the time, I happened to be near the spot of the Battle of Ayacuco in Peru. The day after the action, I saw in the barracks of the wounded a trooper, who having been severely injured in the brain, went crazy, and with his own holster pistol committed suicide in the hospital. The ball drove inward a portion of his woolen nightcap. In the form of a cul-de-sac, doubtless, said the undaunted Wedge. For once, Surgeon Wedge, you use the only term that can be employed. 
And let me avail myself of this opportunity to say to you, young gentleman, that a man of true science, expanding his shallow chest a little, uses but few hard words, and those only when none other will answer his purpose, whereas the smatterer in science, slightly glancing towards Wedge, thinks that by mouthing hard words he proves that he understands hard things. Let this sink deep in your minds, young gentlemen. And Surgeon Wedge, with a stiff bow, permit me to submit the reflection to yourself. Well, young gentlemen, the bullet was afterward extracted by pulling upon the external parts of the cul-de-sac, a simple but exceedingly beautiful operation. There's a fine example, somewhat similar, related in Guthrie. But of course, you must have met with it, in so well-known a work as this treatise upon gunshot wounds. When upward of twenty years ago I was with Lord Cochrane, the admiral of this fleet in this very country, pointing shoreward out of a porthole, a sailor of the vessel to which I was attached during the blockade of Bahia had his leg. But by this time the fidgets had completely taken possession of his auditors, especially of the senior surgeons, and turning upon them abruptly he added, But I will not detain you longer, gentlemen. Turning upon all the surgeons, your dinners must be waiting you on board your respective ships. But Surgeon Sawyer, perhaps you may desire to wash your hands before you go? There is the basin, sir. You will find a clean towel on the rammer. For myself I seldom use them, taking out his handkerchief. I must leave you now, gentlemen, bowing. Tomorrow at ten, the limb will be upon the table, and I shall be happy to see you all upon the occasion. Who's there? Turning to the curtain, which then rustled. Please, sir, said the steward, entering. The patient is dead. The body also, gentlemen, at ten precisely, said Cuticle, once more turning round upon his guests. I predicted that the operation might prove fatal. He was very much run down. Good morning, and Cuticle departed. He does not surely mean to touch the body, exclaimed Surgeon Sawyer with much excitement. Oh no, said Patello, that's only his way. He means, doubtless, that it may be inspected previous to being taken ashore for burial. The assemblage of gold-laced surgeons now ascended to the quarter deck. The second cutter was called away by the bugler, and one by one they were dropped aboard of their respective ships. The following evening the messmates of the top man rowed his remains ashore and buried them in the ever-vernal Protestant cemetery, hard by the beach of the flamingos, in plain sight from the bay. Chapter 64 Man of War Trophies When the second cutter pulled out among the ships, dropping the surgeons aboard the American men of war here and there, as a pilot boat distributes her pilots at the mouth of the harbor, she passed several foreign frigates, two of which, an Englishman and a Frenchman, had excited not a little remark on board the Neversink. These vessels often loosed their sails and exercised yards simultaneously with ourselves, as if desirous of comparing the respective efficiency of the crews. When we were nearly ready for sea, the English frigate, weighing her anchor, made all sail with the sea breeze, and began showing off her paces by gliding out among all men of war and harbor, and particularly by running down the never sink stern. Every time she grew near, we complimented her by lowering our ensign a little, and invariably she courteously returned the salute. She was inviting us to a sailing match, and it was rumored that when we should leave the bay, our captain would have no objections to gratify her. For be it known that Neversink was accounted the fleetest guild craft sailing under the American long pennant. Perhaps this was the reason why the stranger challenged us. It may have been that a portion of our crew were the more anxious to race with this frigate from a little circumstance which a few of them deemed rather galling. Not many cables length distant from our Commodore's cabin lay the frigid president, with the red cross of St. George flying from her peak. As its name imported, this fine craft was an American-born, but having been captured during the last war with Britain, she now sailed the salt seas as a trophy. Think of it, my gallant countrymen, one and all down the sea coast and along the endless banks of the Ohio and Columbia. Think of the twinges we sea patriots must have felt to behold the live oak of the Floridas and the pines of green Maine built into the oaken walls of old England. But to some of the sailors there was a counterbalancing thought, as grateful as the other was galling, and that was that somewhere, sailing under the stars and stripes, was the frigid Macedonian, a British-born craft which had once sported the battle banner of Britain. It has ever been the custom to spend almost any amount of money in repairing a captured vessel, in order that she may long survive to commemorate the heroism of the conqueror. Thus in the English navy there are many monsieurs of 74s won from the Gaul, but we Americans can show but few similar trophies, though no doubt we would much like to be able to do so. 
but I never have beheld any of the floating trophies without being reminded of a scene once witnessed in a pioneer village on the western bank of the Mississippi, not far from this village where the stumps of aboriginal trees yet stand in the marketplace. Some years ago lived a portion of the remnant tribes of the So Indians, who frequently visited the white settlements to purchase trinkets and cloths. One florid crimson evening in July when the red-hot sun was going down in a blaze and I was leaning against a corner in my huntsman's frock, Lo, there came stalking out of the crimson west, a gigantic red man, erect as a pine with his glittering tomahawk, big as a broad axe, folded in martial repose across his chest. Moodily wrapped in his blanket and striding like a king on the stage, he promenaded up and down the rustic streets, exhibiting on the back of his blanket a crowd of human hands, rudely delineated in red. One of them seemed recently drawn. Who is this warrior? asked I, and why marches he here? And for what are these bloody hands? That warrior is the Red Hawk Cole, said a pioneer in moccasins, by my side. He marches here to show off his last trophy. Every one of those hands attests a foe scalped by his tomahawk. And he has just emerged from Ben Browns, the painter, who has sketched the last red hand that you see. For last night, this Red Hawk Cole outburned the yellow torch, the chief of a band of foxes. Poor savage, thought I. And is this the cause of your lofty gait? Do you straighten yourself to think that you have committed a murder? when a chance falling stone is often done the same? Is it a proud thing to topple down six feet perpendicular of immortal manhood, though that lofty living tower needed perhaps thirty good growing summers to bring it to maturity? Poor savage, and you account it so glorious, do you, to mutilate and destroy what God himself was more than a quarter of a century in building? And yet, fellow Christians, what is the American frigate Macedonian, or the English frigate President, but as two bloody red hands painted on this poor savage's blankets? Are there no Moravians in the moon, that not a missionary has yet visited his poor pagan planet of ours to civilize civilization and Christianize Christendom? Chapter 65 A Man of War Race we lay in Rio so long, for what reason the Commodore only knows, that a saying went abroad among the impatient sailors that our frigate would at last ground on the beef bones daily thrown overboard by the cooks. But at last good tidings came, all hands up anchor ahoy, and bright and early in the morning up came our old iron as the sun rose in the east. The land breezes at Rio, by which alone vessels may emerge from the bay, is ever languid and faint. It comes from gardens of citrons and cloves, spiced with all the spices of the Tropic of Capricorn, and like that old exquisite Mohammed, who so much loved to snuff perfumes and essences, and used to lounge out of the conservatories of Khadija, his wife to give battle to the robust sons of Koryesh. Even so, this Rio land breeze comes jaded with sweet-smelling savors to wrestle with the wide tartar breezes of the sea. Slowly we dropped and dropped down the bay, glided like a stately swan through the outlet, and were gradually rolled by the smooth, sliding billows broad out upon the deep. Straight in our wake came the tall main mast of the English fighting frigate, terminating like a steepled cathedral in the bannered cross of the religion of peace. And straight after her came the rainbow banner of France, sporting God's token that no more would he make war on the earth. Both Englishmen and Frenchmen were resolved upon a race, and we Yankees swore by our topsails and royals to sink their blazing banners that night among the southern constellations we should daily be extinguishing behind us in our run to the north. Ay, said Mad Jack, St. George's banners shall be as the southern cross, out of sight, leagues down the horizon, while our gallant stars, my brave boys, shall burn all alone in the north, like the great bear at the pole. Come on, rainbow and cross." But the wind was long and languid and faint, not yet recovered from its night's dissipation ashore, and noon advanced with the sugarloaf pinnacle in sight. Now it is not with ships as with horses, for though if a horse walk well and fast, it generally furnishes good token that he is not bad at a gallop. Yet the ship that in a light breeze is outstripped may sweep the stakes, so soon as the gallant breeze enables her to strike into the canter. Thus fared it with us. First the Englishman glided ahead and bluffly passed on, then the Frenchman politely bade us adieu, while the old never-sink lingered behind, railing at the effeminate breeze. At one time all three frigates were irregularly abreast, forming a diagonal line, and so near were all three that the stately officers on the poops stiffly saluted by touching their caps, though refraining from any further civilities. 
At this juncture, it was a noble sight to behold those fine frigates, with dripping breast hooks, all rearing and nodding in concert, and to look through their tall spars and wilderness of rigging, that seemed like inextricably entangled, gigantic cobwebs against the sky. Towards sundown, the ocean pawed its white hoofs to the spur of its helter-skelter rider, a strong blast from the eastward, and giving three cheers from decks, yards, and tops, we crowded all sail on to St. George and St. Denis. But it is harder to overtake than outstrip. Night fell upon us, still in the rear, still where the little boat was, which at the eleventh hour, according to the rabbinical tradition, pushed after the ark of old Noah. It was a misty, cloudy night, and though at first our lookouts kept the chase in dim sight, yet at last so thick became the atmosphere that no sign of a strange spar was to be seen. But the worst of it was that, when last discerned, the Frenchman was broad on our weather bow, and the Englishman gallantly leading his van. The breeze blew faster and fresher, but, with even our main royal set, we dashed along through a cream-colored ocean of illuminated foam. White Jacket was then in the top, and it was glorious to look down and see our black hole budding the white sea with its broad bows like a ram. We must beat them with such a breeze, dear Jack, said I to our noble captain of the top. But the same breeze blows for John Bull, remember, replied Jack, who being a Briton perhaps favored the Englishman more than the Neversink. But how we boom through the billows, cried Jack, gazing over the topsail. Then, flinging forth his arms, recited, A slope and gliding on the leeward side, the bounding vessel cuts the roaring tide. Camons, white jacket Camons, did you ever read him? The Luciad, I mean. It's the man-of-war epic of the world, my lad. Give me a gamma for a commodore, say I, noble gamma. And Mickle, white jacket, did you ever read of him? William Julius Mickle, Camons translator? A disappointed man, though, White Jacket. Besides his version of the Luciad, he wrote many forgotten things. Did you ever see his ballad of Cumnor Hall? No? Why, it gave Sir Walter Scott the hint of Kenilworth. My father knew Mickle went out to sea on board the old Romney man of war. How many great men have been sailors, White Jacket? They say Homer himself was once a tar, even as his hero, Ulysses, was both a sailor and a shipwright. I'll swear Shakespeare was once a captain of the forecastle. Do you mind the first scene in The Tempest, White Jacket? And the world finder, Christopher Columbus, was a sailor. And so was Camens, who went to sea with Gamma, else we had never had the Luciad, White Jacket. Yes, I've sailed over the very track that Camens sailed, round the East Cape to the Indian Ocean. I've been in Don Jose's garden, too, in Macau, and bathed my feet in the blessed dew of the walks where Camens wandered before me. Yes, White Jacket, and I have seen and sat in the cave at the end of the flowery winding way, where Camens, according to tradition, composed certain parts of his Luciad. Aye, Camens was a sailor once. Then there's Falconer, whose shipwreck will never founder, though he himself, poor fellow, was lost at sea in the Aurora Frigate. Old Noah was the first sailor, and St. Paul, too, knew how to box the compass, my lad. Mind you, that chapter in Acts. I couldn't spin the yarn better myself. Were you ever in Malta? They called it Melita in the Apostles' Day. I have been in Paul's cave there, White Jacket. They say a piece of it is good for a charm against shipwreck, but I never tried it. There's Shelley, he was quite a sailor. Shelley, poor lad. A Percy, too, but they ought to have let him sleep in his sailor's grave. He was drowned in the Mediterranean, you know, near Leghorn, and not burn his body as they did as if they had been a bloody Turk. But many people thought him so, White Jacket, because he didn't go to Mass, and because he wrote Queen Mab. Trelawney was by at the burning, and he was an ocean rover too. I and Byron helped put a piece of a keel on the fire, for it was made of bits of a wreck, they say, one wreck burning another. And was not Byron a sailor, an amateur forecastle man, white jacket, so he was. Else how bid the ocean heave and fall in that grand majestic way? I say, white jacket, do you mind me? There was never a very great man who yet spent all his life inland. A snuff of the sea, my boy, is inspiration and having been once out of sight of land has been the making of many a true poet and the blasting of many pretenders. For, do you see, there is no gammon about the ocean. It knocks the false keel right off a pretender's bows. It tells him just what he is and makes him feel it too. A sailor's life, I say, is the thing to bring us mortals out. What does the blessed Bible say? Don't let it say that we main top men alone see the marvelous sights and wonders. Don't deny the blessed Bible now. Don't do it. How it rocks up here, my boy, holding on to a shroud. But it only proves what I've been saying. The sea is the place to cradle genius. Heave and fall, old sea. And you also, noble Jack, said I. What are you but a sailor?
You're merry, my boy, said Jack, looking up with a glance like that of a sentimental archangel doomed to drag out his eternity in disgrace. But mind you, White Jacket, there are many great men in the world besides commodores and captains. I've that here, White Jacket, touching his forehead, which under happier skies, perhaps in you solitary star there, peeping down from those clouds, might have made a homer of me. But fate is fate, White Jacket, and we homers, who happen to be captains of tops, must write our odes in our hearts and publish them in our heads. But look, the captain's on the poop. It was now midnight, but all the officers were on deck. Jib boom there, cried the lieutenant of the watch, going forward and hailing the headmost lookout. Do you see anything of those fellows now? See nothing, sir. See nothing, sir, said the lieutenant, approaching the captain and touching his cap. Call all hands, roared the captain. This keel shan't be beat while I stride it. All hands were called, and the hammocks stowed in the nettings for the rest of the night, so that no one could lie between blankets. Now in order to explain the means adopted by the captain to ensure us the race, it needs be said of the Neversink that for some years after being launched, she was accounted one of the slowest vessels in the American Navy. But it chanced upon a time that being on a cruise in the Mediterranean, she happened to sail out of Port Mahon, and what was then supposed to be very bad trim for the sea, her bows were rooting in the water and her stern kicking up its heel in the air. But wonderful to tell, it was soon discovered that in this comical posture, she sailed like a shooting star. She outstripped every vessel on the station. Thenceforward, all her captains, on all cruises, trimmed her by the head, and the Neversink gained the name of a clipper. To return, all hands being called, they were now made use of by Captain Claret to make weights, to trim the ship, scientifically, to her most approved bearings. Some were sent forward on the spar deck, with twenty-four pounds shot in their hands, and were judiciously scattered here and there, with strict orders not to budge an inch from their stations, for fear of marring the captain's plans. Others were distributed along the gun and berth decks with similar orders, and to crown all, several carronade guns were unshipped from their carriages and swung in their breechings from the beams of the main deck so as to impart a sort of vibratory briskness and oscillating buoyancy to the frigid. And thus we five hundred makeweights stood out that whole night, some of us exposed to a drenching rain, in order that the Neversink might not be beaten. But the comfort and consolation of all makeweights is as dust in the balance in the estimation of the rulers of our man-of-war world. The long, anxious night at last came to an end, and with the first peep of the day, the lookout on the jib boom was hailed, but nothing was in sight. At last it was broad day, yet still not a bow was to be seen in our rear, nor a stern in our van. "'Where are they?' cried the captain. "'Out of sight astern, to be sure, sir,' said the officer of the deck." Out of sight ahead, to be sure, sir, muttered Jack Chase in the top. Precisely thus stood the question, whether we beat them or whether they beat us. No mortal can tell to this hour, since we never saw them again, but for one, White Jacket will lay his two hands on the bow chasers of the Neversink and take his ship's oath that we Yankees carry the day. Chapter 66 Fun and a Man of War after the race, our man of war derby, we had many days fine weather, during which we continued running before the trades toward the north. Exhilarated by the thought of being homeward bound, many of the seamen became joyous, and the discipline of the ship, if anything, became a little relaxed. Many pastimes served to while away the dog watches in particular. These dog watches, embracing two hours in the early part of the evening, formed the only authorized playtime for the crews of most ships at sea. Among other diversions at present licensed by authority in the Never Sink were those of single stick, sparring, hammer and anvil, and head bumping. All these were under the direct patronage of the captain. Otherwise, seeing the consequences they sometimes led to, they would undoubtedly have been strictly prohibited. It is a curious coincidence that when a Navy captain does not happen to be an admirer of the Fistiana, his crew seldom amuse themselves in that way. Single stick, as everyone knows, is a delightful pastime, which consists in two men standing a few feet apart and wrapping each other over the head with long poles. There's a good deal of fun in it, so long as you're not hit, but a hit, in the judgment of discreet persons, spoils the sport completely. When this pastime is practiced by connoisseurs ashore, they wear heavy, wired helmets to break the force of the blows, but the only helmets of our tars were those which nature had furnished them. They played with great gun rammers. Sparring consists in playing single stick with bone poles instead of wooden ones. Two men stand apart and pommel each other with their fists. 
a hard bunch of knuckles permanently attached to the arms and made globular or extended into a palm at the pleasure of the proprietor, till one of them finding himself sufficiently thrashed cries enough. Hammer and anvil is thus practiced by amateurs. Patient number one gets on all fours and stays so, while patient number two is taken up by his arms and legs, and his base is swung against the base of patient number one, till patient number one, with the force of the final blow, is sent flying along the deck. Head bumping, as patronized by Captain Claret, consists in two negroes, whites will not answer, butting at each other like rams. This pastime was an especial favorite with the captain. In the dog watches, Rosewater and Mayday were repeatedly summoned into the lee waist to tilt at each other for the benefit of the captain's health. Mayday was a full-blooded bull negro, so the sailors called him, with a skull like an iron tea kettle. Wherefore, Mayday much fancied the sport, but Rosewater, he was a slender and rather handsome mulatto, and abhorred the pastime. Nevertheless, the captain must be obeyed. So at the word, poor Rosewater was fain to put himself in a posture of defense, else Mayday would incontinently have bumped him out of a porthole into the sea. I used to pity poor Rosewater from the bottom of my heart, but my pity was almost aroused into indignation at a sad sequel to one of these gladiatorial scenes. It seems that lifted up by the unaffected, though verbally unexpressed applause of the captain, Mayday had begun to despise Rosewater as a poltroon. A fellow, all brains and no skull, whereas he himself was a great warrior, all skull and no brains. Accordingly, after they had been bumping one evening to the captain's content, Mayday confidentially told Rosewater that he considered him a nigger, which among some blacks is held a great term of reproach. Fired at the insult, Rosewater gave Mayday to understand that he utterly erred, for his mother, a black slave, had been one of the mistresses of a Virginia planter belonging to one of the oldest families in that state. Another insulting remark followed this innocent disclosure. Retort followed retort. In a word, at last, they came together in mortal combat. The master at arms caught them in the act and brought them up the mast. The captain advanced. Please, sir, said poor Rosewater. It all came at that air bumpin' mayday ear. Aggravated me about it. Master at arms, said the captain. Did you see them fighting? Aye, sir, said the master at arms, touching his cap. Rig the gratings, said the captain. I'll teach you two men that, though I now and then permit you to play, I will have no fighting. Do your body, boatswain's mate, and the negroes were flogged. Justice commands that the fact of the captain's not showing any leniency to Mayday, a decided favorite of his, at least while in the ring, should not be passed over. He flogged both culprits in the most impartial manner. As in the matter of the scene at the gangway, shortly after the Cape Horn theatricals, when my attention had been directed to the fact that the officers had shipped their quarterdeck faces, Upon that occasion, I say, it was seen with what facility a sea officer assumes his wanted severity of demeanor after a casual relaxation of it. This was especially the case with Captain Claret upon the present occasion, for any landsman to have beheld him in the lee waist of a pleasant dog watch with a genial, good-humored countenance observing the gladiators in the ring, and now and then indulging in a playful remark, that landsman would have deemed Captain Claret the indulgent father of his crew, perhaps permitting the excess of his kind-heartedness to encroach upon the appropriate dignity of his station. He would have deemed Captain Claret a fine illustration of those two well-known poetical comparisons between a sea captain and a father, and between a sea captain and the master of apprentices, instituted by those eminent maritime jurists, the noble lords Tenterden and Stowell. But surely, if there is anything hateful, it is the shipping of the quarter-deck face after a merry and a good-natured one. How can they have the heart? Methinks it, but once I smiled upon a man, never mind how much beneath me, I could not bring myself to condemn him to the shocking misery of the lash. O oh, officers all round the world, if this quarter-deck face you wear at all, then never unship it for another, to be merely sported for a moment. Of all insults, the temporary condescension of a master to a slave is the most outrageous and galling. The potentate, who most condescends, mark him well, for that potentate, if occasion come, will prove your uttermost tyrant. Chapter 67 White Jacket Arraigned at the Mast When with five hundred others I made one of the compelled spectators at the scourging of poor Rosewater, I little thought what fate had ordained for myself the next day. Poor mulatto, thought I, one of an oppressed race, they degrade you like a hound, Thank God I am white, yet I had seen whites also scourged. For black or white, all my shipmates were liable to that. 
Still, there is something in us, somehow, that in the most degraded condition, we snatch at a chance to deceive ourselves into a fancied superiority to others, whom we supposed lower in the scale than ourselves. Poor Rosewater, thought I, poor mulatto, heaven send you a release from your humiliation. To make plain the thing about to be related, it needs to repeat what has somewhere been previously mentioned, that in tacking ship every seaman and a man of war has a particular station assigned him. What that station is should be made known to him by the first lieutenant, and when the word is passed to tack or wear, it is every seaman's duty to be found at his post. But among the various numbers and stations given to me by the senior lieutenant when I first came on board the frigate, he had altogether omitted informing me of my particular place at those times, and up to the precise period now written of, I had hardly known that I should have had any special place then at all. For the rest of the men, they seemed to me to catch hold of the first rope that offered, as in a merchant man upon similar occasions. Indeed, I subsequently discovered that such was the state of discipline, and this one particular at least, that very few of the seamen could tell where their proper stations were at tacking or wearing. All hands, tack ship, ahoy! Such was the announcement made by the boatswain's mates at the hatchways, the morning after the hard fate of Rosewater. It was just eight bells, noon, and springing from my white jacket, which I had spread between the guns for a bed on the main deck, I ran up the ladders and, as usual, seized hold of the main brace, which fifty hands were streaming along forward. When main top sail hall was given through the trumpet, I pulled at this brace with such hardiness and good will that I almost flattered myself that my instrumentality in getting the frigate round on the other tack deserved a public vote of thanks and a silver tankard from Congress. But something happened to be in the way aloft when the yard swung round. A little confusion ensued, and with anger on his brow, Captain Claret came forward to see what occasioned it. No one to let go the weather lift of the main yard. The rope was cast off, however, by a hand, and the yards unobstructed came round. When the last rope was coiled away, the captain desired to know of the first lieutenant who it might be that was stationed at the weather, then the starboard main lift. With a vexed expression of countenance, the first lieutenant sent a midshipman for the station bill, when upon glancing over it, my own name was found down at the post in question. At the time, I was on the gun deck below and did not know of these proceedings, but a moment after I heard the boatswain's mates bawling my name at all the hatchways and along all three decks. It was the first time I had ever heard it so sent through the furthest recesses of the ship, and well knowing that this generally betokened to other seamen, my heart jumped to my throat, and I hurriedly asked Flute, the boatswain's mate at the fore hatchway, what was wanted of me. Captain wants you at the mast, he replied. Gonna flog you, I guess. What for? My eyes, you've been chalking your face, hadn't you? What am I wanted for? I repeated. But at that instant my name was again thundered forth by the other boatswain's mate, and Flute hurried me away, hinting that I would soon find out what the captain desired of me. I swallowed down my heart in me as I touched the spar deck, for a single instant balanced myself on my best center, and then wholly ignorant of what was going to be alleged against me advanced to the dread tribunal of the frigate. As I passed through the gangway, I saw the quartermaster rigging the gratings, the boatswain with his green bag of scourges, the master at arms ready to help off someone's shirt. Again, I made a desperate swallow of my soul in me and found myself standing before Captain Claret. His flushed face obviously showed him an ill humor. Among the group of officers by his side was the first lieutenant, who as I came aft eyed me in such a manner that I plainly perceived him to be extremely vexed at me for having been the innocent means of reflecting upon the manner in which he kept up the discipline of the ship. Why were you not at your station, sir? asked the captain. What station do you mean, sir? said I. It is generally the custom with man of war's men to stand obsequiously touching their hat at every sentence they address to the captain, but as this was not obligatory upon me by the articles of war, I did not do so upon the present occasion, and previously I had never had the dangerous honor of a personal interview with Captain Claret. He quickly noticed my omission of the homage usually rendered him, and instinct told me that to a certain extent it set his heart against me. "'What station, sir, do you mean?' said I. "'You pretend ignorance,' he replied. "'It will not help you, sir.' Glancing at the captain, the first lieutenant now produced the station bill and read my name in connection with that of the starboard main lift. "'Captain Claret,' said I, "'it is the first time I ever heard of my being assigned to that post.' How is this, Mr. Bridewell, he said, turning to the first lieutenant with a fault-finding expression. It is impossible, sir, said the officer, striving to hide his vexation, but this man must have known his station. 
I've never known it before this moment, Captain McClara, said I. Do you contradict my officer? He returned. I shall flog you. I had now been on board the frigate upward of a year and remained unscourged. The ship was homeward bound, and in a few weeks at most I would be a free man. And now, after making a hermit of myself in some things in order to avoid the possibility of the scourge, here it was hanging over me, for a thing utterly unforeseen, for a crime of which I was utterly innocent. But all that was not. I saw that my case was hopeless, my solemn disclaimer was thrown in my teeth, and the boatswain's mate stood curling his fingers through the cat. There are times when wild thoughts enters a man's heart, when he seems almost irresponsible for his act and his deed. The captain stood on the weather side of the deck. Sideways, on an unobstructed line with him, was the opening of the lee gangway, where the side ladders are suspended in port. Nothing but a slight bit of senate stuff served to rail in this opening, which was cut right down to the level of the captain's feet, showing the far sea beyond. I stood a little windward of him, and though he was a large, powerful man, it was certain that a sudden rush against him along the slanting deck would infallibly pitch him head foremost into the ocean though he, who so rushed, must needs go over with him. My blood seemed clotting in my veins. I felt icy cold at the tips of my fingers, and a dimness was before my eyes. But through that dimness the boatswain's mate, scourge in hand, loomed like a giant, and Captain Claret in the blue sea, seen through the opening at the gangway, showed with an awful vividness. I cannot analyze my heart, though it then stood still within me, but the thing that swayed me to my purpose was not altogether the thought that Captain Claret was about to degrade me, and that I had taken an oath with my soul that he should not. No, I felt my man's manhood so bottomless within me that no word, no blow, no scourge of Captain Claret could cut me deep enough for that. I but swung to an instinct in me, the instinct diffused through all my animated nature, the same that prompts even a worm to turn under the heel. Locking souls with him, I meant to drag Captain Claret from this earthly tribunal of his to that of Jehovah and let him decide between us. No other way could I escape the scourge. Nature has not implanted any power in man that was not meant to be exercised at times. Though, too often our powers have been abused, the privilege, inborn and inalienable, that every man has of dying himself and inflicting death upon another, was not given to us without a purpose. These are the last resources of an insulted and unendurable existence. To the grating, sir, said Captain Claret, do you hear? My eye was measuring the distance between him and the sea. Captain Claret, said a voice advancing from the crowd, I turned to see who this might be that audaciously interposed at a juncture like this. It was the same remarkably handsome and gentlemanly corporal of Marines, Colebrook, who had been previously alluded to in the chapter describing killing time in a man of war. I know that man, said Colebrook, touching his cap and speaking in a mild, firm, but extremely deferential manner, and I know that he would not be found absent from his station if he knew where it was. This speech was almost unprecedented. Seldom or never before had a marine dared to speak to the captain of a frigate in behalf of a seaman at the mast, but there was something so unostentatiously commanding in the calm manner of the man that the captain, though astounded, did not in any way reprimand him. The very unusualness of his interference seemed Colbrook's protection. Taking heart, perhaps, from Colbrook's example, Jack Chase interposed, and in a manly but carefully respectful manner, in substance repeated the corporal's remark, adding that he never found me wanting in the top. The captain looked from Chase to Colbrook, and from Colbrook to Chase, one of the foremost men among the seamen, the other the foremost man among the soldiers. Then all round upon the packed and silent crew, and as if a slave to fate, though supreme captain of a frigate, he turned to the first lieutenant, made some indifferent remark, and saying to me, you may go, sauntered aft into his cabin. While I, who in the desperation of my soul, had but just escaped being a murderer and a suicide, almost burst into tears of thanksgiving where I stood. Chapter 68 a man of war fountain and other things. Let us forget the scourge and the gangway a while, and jot down in our memories a few little things pertaining to our man of war world. I let nothing slip, however small, and feel myself actuated by the same motive which has prompted many worthy old chroniclers to set down the merest trifles concerning things that are destined to pass away entirely from the earth, and which, if not preserved in the nick of time, must infallibly perish from the memories of men. Who knows that this humble narrative may not hereafter prove the history of an obsolete barbarism, 
Who knows that when men of war shall be of no more, White Jacket may not be quoted to show to the people in the millennium what a man of war was. God hasten the time, lo, ye years, escorted hither, and bless our eyes ere we die. There is no part of a frigate where you will see more going and coming of strangers, and over here more greetings and gossipings of acquaintances than in the immediate vicinity of the scuttlebutt, just forward of the main hatchway on the gun deck. The scuttlebutt is a goodly, round, painted cask, standing on end and with its upper head removed, showing a narrow, circular shelf within, where rest a number of ten cups for the accommodation of drinkers. Central, within the scuttlebutt itself, stands an iron pump, which connecting with the immense water tanks in the hold furnishes an unfailing supply of the much-admired pale ale, first brewed in the brooks of the Garden of Eden, and stamped with the brand of our old Father Adam, who never knew what wine was. We are indebted to the old vintner Noah for that. The scuttlebutt is the only fountain in the ship, and here alone can you drink, unless at your meals. Night and day, an armed sentry paces before it, bayonet in hand, to see that no water is taken away, except according to law. I wonder that they station no sentries at the portholes to see that no air is breathed except according to Navy regulations. As 500 men come to drink at this scuttlebutt, as it is often surrounded by officers, servants, drawing water for their masters to wash, by the cooks of the range who hither come to fill their coffee pots, and by the cooks of the ship's messes to procure water for their duffs, the scuttlebutt may be denominated the town pump of the ship and would that my fine countryman Hawthorne of Salem had but served on board a man of war in this time, he might give us the reading of a rill from the scuttlebutt. As in all extensive establishments, abbeys, arsenals, colleges, treasuries, metropolitan post offices, and monasteries, there are many snug little niches, wherein are ensconced certain superannuated old pensioner officials, and more officially, as in most ecclesiastical establishments, a few choice prebendary stalls are to be found, furnished with well-filled mangers and racks. So, in a man of war, there are a variety of similar snuggeries for the benefit of decrepit and rheumatic old tars. Chief among these is the office of mastman. There is a stout rail on deck at the base of each mast, where a number of braces, lifts, and bunt lines are belayed to the pens. It is the sole duty of the mastman to see that these ropes are always kept clear, to preserve his premises in a state of the greatest attainable neatness, and every Sunday morning to dispose his ropes in neat Flemish coils. The main mastman of the Neversink was a very aged seaman, who well deserved his comfortable berth. He had seen more than a half a century of the most active service, and through all had proved himself a good and faithful man. He furnished one of the very rare examples of a sailor in a green old age, for with most sailors, old age comes in youth, and hardship and vice carry them on, an early beer to the grave. As in the evening of life and at the close of the day, old Abraham sat at the door of his tent, bidding his time to die, so sits our old mastman on the coat of the mast, glancing round him with patriarchal benignity. And that mild expression of his sets off very strangely a face that has been burned almost black by the torrid suns that shone fifty years ago. A face that has seamed with three saber cuts. You would almost think this old masked man had been blown out of Vesuvius to look alone at his scarred, blackened forehead, chin, and cheeks, but gaze down into his eye, and though all the snows of time have drifted higher and higher upon his brow, yet deep down in that eye you behold an infantile, sinless look, the same that answered the glance of this old man's mother when she first cried for the babe to be laid by her side and that look is the fadeless, ever-infantile immortality within him. The Lord Nelsons of the sea, though but barons in the state, yet oftentimes prove more potent than their royal masters, and at such scenes as Trafalgar, dethroning this emperor and reinstating that, enact on the ocean the proud part of mighty Richard Neville, the king-making earl of the land. And as Richard Neville entrenched himself in his moated old man-of-war castle of Warwick, which underground was traversed with vaults, hewn out of the solid rock and intricate as the wards of the old keys of Calai surrendered to Edward III. Even so do these king commodores house themselves in their water-rimmed, cannon-centried frigates, oaken dug, deck under deck, as cell under cell. And as the old middle-age warders of Warwick, every night at curfew, patrolled the battlements and dove down into the vaults to see that all lights were extinguished, 
Even so do the master-at-arms and ship's corporals of a frigate perambulate all the decks of a man-of-war, blowing out all tapers but those burning in the legalized battle lanterns. Yeah, and these things, so potent is the authority of these sea wardens, that, though almost the lowest subalterns in the ship, yet should they find the senior lieutenant himself sitting up late in his state room, reading Bowditch's Navigator, or Danton on gunpowder and firearms. They would infallibly blow the light out under his very nose, nor durst that Grand Vizier resent the indignity. But unwittingly, I have ennobled by grand historical comparisons this prying, pettifogging Irish informer of a master-at-arms. You have seen some slim, slipshod housekeeper at midnight ferreting over a rambling old house in the country, startling at fancied witches and ghosts, yet intent on seeing every door bolted, every smoldering ember in the fireplaces smothered, every loitering domestic abed, and every light made dark. This is the master-at-arms taking his night rounds in a frigate. It may be thought that but little is seen of the Commodore in these chapters, and that since he so seldom appears on the stage he cannot be so august a personage after all. But the mightiest potentates keep the most behind the veil. You might tarry in Constantinople a month and never catch a glimpse of the Sultan. The Grand Lama of Tibet, according to some accounts, is never beheld by the people. But if anyone doubts the majesty of a Commodore, let him know that, according to Article 62 of the Articles of War. He is invested by the prerogative which, according to monarchical jurists, is inseparable from the throne, the plenary pardoning power. He may pardon all offenses committed in the squadron under his command. But this prerogative is only while at sea or on a foreign station, a circumstance peculiarly significant of the great difference between the stately absolutism of a commodore enthroned on his poop in a foreign harbor and an unlaced commodore negligently reclining in an easy chair in the bosom of his family at home. Chapter 69. Prayers at the Guns The training days or general quarters, now and then taking place in our frigate, have already been described. Also the Sunday devotions on the half-deck, but nothing has yet been said concerning the daily morning and evening quarters, when the men silently stand at their guns, and the chaplain simply offers up a prayer. Now let us enlarge upon this matter. We have plenty of time. The occasion invites. For behold, the homeward bound never sink bowls along over a jubilant sea. Shortly after breakfast, the drum beats to quarters, and among five hundred men scattered over all three decks, and engaged in all manner of ways, that sudden rolling march is magical, as the monitory sound to which every good Mussulman at sunset drops to the ground, whatsoever his hands might have found to do. And throughout all Turkey, the people in concert kneel toward their holy Mecca. The sailors run to and fro, some up the deck ladders, some down, to gain their respective stations in the shortest possible time. In three minutes all is composed, one by one the various officers stationed over the separate divisions of the ship then approach the first lieutenant on the quarterdeck, and report their respective men at their quarters. It is curious to watch their countenances at this time. A profound silence prevails, and emerging through the hatchway from one of the lower decks, a slender young officer appears, hugging his sword to his thigh, and advances through the long lanes of sailors at their guns, his serious eye all the time fixed upon the first lieutenant's, his polar star. Sometimes he essays a stately and graduated step, an erect and martial bearing, and seems full of the vast and national importance of what he is about to communicate. But when at last he gains his destination, you are amazed to perceive that all he has to say is imparted by a Freemason touch of his cap and a bow. He then turns and makes off to his division, perhaps passing several brother lieutenants, all bound on the same errand he himself has just achieved. For about five minutes, these officers are coming and going, bringing in thrilling intelligence from all quarters of the frigate, most stoically received, however, by the first lieutenant. With his legs apart so as to give a broad foundation for the superstructure of his dignity, this gentleman stands stiff as a pike staff on the quarterdeck. His one hand holds his saber, an appurtenance altogether unnecessary at the time, and which he accordingly tucks, point backward under his arm, like an umbrella on a sunshiny day. The other hand is continually bobbing up and down the leather front of his cap in response to the reports and salute of his subordinates to whom he never deigns to vouchsafe a syllable, merely going through the motions of accepting their news, without bestowing thanks for their pains. 
This continual touching of caps between officers on board of men of war is the reason why you invariably notice that the glazed fronts of their caps look jaded, lackluster, and worn, sometimes slightly oliginous, although in other respects the cap may appear glossy and fresh, but as for the first lieutenant, he ought to have extra pay allowed to him on account of his extraordinary outlays in cap fronts, for he it is to whom all day long reports of various kinds are incessantly being made by the junior lieutenants, and no report is made by them, however trivial, but caps are touched on the occasion. It is obvious that these individual salutes must be greatly multiplied and aggregated upon the senior lieutenant who must return them all. Indeed, when a subordinate officer is first promoted to that rank, he generally complains of the same exhaustion about the shoulder and elbow that Lafayette mourned over when visiting America. He did little else but shake the sturdy hands of patriotic farmers from sunrise to sunset. The various officers of divisions, having presented their respects and made good their returns to their stations, the first lieutenant turns round and, marching aft, endeavors to catch the eye of the captain in order to touch his own cap to that personage, and thereby, without adding a word of explanation, communicate the fact that all hands being at their guns. He is a sort of retort, or receiver general, to concentrate the whole sum of the information imparted to him, and discharge it upon his superior at one touch of his cap front. But sometimes the captain feels out of sorts, or in ill humor, or is pleased to be somewhat capricious, or has a fancy to show a touch of his omnipotent supremacy, or, peradventure, it has so happened that the first lieutenant has in some way piqued or offended him, and he is not unwilling to show a slight specimen of his dominion over him, even before the eyes of all hands. At all events, only by some one of these suppositions can the singular circumstance be accounted for, that frequently Captain Claret would pertinaciously promenade up and down the poop, purposely averting his eye from the first lieutenant, who would stand below in the most awkward suspense waiting the first wink from his superior's eye. Now I have him, he must have said to himself as the captain would turn toward him in his walk, now's my time, and up would go his hand to his cap. But alas, the captain was off again, and the men at the guns would cast sly winks at each other as the embarrassed lieutenant would bite his lips 